business intelligence or bi is a key technology in industries for making crucial decisions hello everyone welcome to this video tutorial on business intelligence full course by simply learn we have our experienced instructors shruti ajay and michelle with us and they are going to help you understand business intelligence in detail but before we begin make sure to subscribe to our youtube channel and hit the bell icon to never miss an update from simply learn First you're going to learn the basics of business intelligence and look at the top 5 BI tools. Then you learn Excel where you'll see how to use different functions to perform calculations, sort and filter data, apply conditional formatting and create pivot tables and charts. You'll also understand how to use Excel Power Query. Moving ahead, you will learn the basics of Power BI and use Power BI for creating reports. Finally, you will understand Tableau from scratch. You look at the different features of Tableau and how to create different charts and graphs to analyze and visualize data in Tableau. Over to Shruti now. Before I start off with our top 5 BI tools, I'd like to talk a bit about business intelligence. As you might be aware, there are zillions of companies across the world. These companies generate massive amounts of data on a daily basis. When I say data here, it simply refers to business information both internal and external, customer feedback, product innovations and profit loss reports to name a few. Companies use all of this information to make crucial decisions that can either hamper or boost their business. You might have heard of the term data is the new oil. Well, it definitely is. If organizations analyze all the available data very well, then this oil is definitely valuable. And to help organizations with this, we have business intelligence, which is more often termed as BI. We can define BI as a technology-driven process which works on analyzing unstructured data to derive meaningful information from it. Basically, it is a set of architecture and processes that convert raw data into useful information that helps in achieving profit for a business. So to achieve business intelligence goals, we use a set of tools. These tools are termed as BI tools. They help organizations acquire and analyze data efficiently. Some of the BI tools are seasonal, but some are evergreen. We have a plethora of these tools in the market, which makes it hard for businesses to select one single tool. Here, we have a recommendation list of the top five BI tools of 2020. After extensive research and an in-depth evaluation, we have come up with this list. In addition to the top five, we also have a few other tools which look promising for the year 2020. So let us have a look at the top five BI tools. At number five, we have ThoughtSpot. ThoughtSpot is a US-based company that provides its customers with business intelligence software. ThoughtSpot makes analysis of data easy and it does so in the matter of a few seconds. As you can see on your screens, this is how the interface looks like. Let's now have a look at the features of ThoughtSpot. ThoughtSpot is a search-driven solution, that is, the users can find insights through an interface known to everyone, that is, search. This makes the tool more accessible. The Spot IQ engine also uses artificial intelligence in the form of algorithms to identify and display insights like trends and causal relationships. Instead of going through a number of different procedures to create a chart, ThoughtSpot's instant chart creation ability lets users automatically view data graphically. With just a few mouse clicks, you can generate a visually appealing story. When a business grows, so will its data requirements. Hence, it is crucial that you have a tool that can be scaled up easily. ThoughtSpot has this feature and it also performs automatic load balancing across all its servers. ThoughtSpot is also now available for small and medium instance types on AWS, Microsoft Azure, and Google Cloud. ThoughtSpot has a user-friendly interface. Even users with absolutely no prior knowledge or training can operate ThoughtSpot easily. So those were the features of ThoughtSpot. Let us now have a look at the companies using ThoughtSpot. As you can see on your screens, we have the American multinational retail corporation Walmart, then we have the Royal Bank of Canada, RBC, followed by 7-Eleven and ExxonMobil. Let us now move on to our next tool. So at number four, we have SaaS BI. The SaaS business intelligence tool looks into the analysis, data mining and reporting with the help of powerful visualizations and interactive dashboards. 
In SAS, data is extracted and categorized, which helps in identifying and analyzing data patterns. As you can see on your screens, this is how the interface looks like. Moving on to the features of SAS BI, first and foremost, it is easy to use. Irrespective of your skill level, you will be able to easily explore, create, and share data. There is no need for the user to rely on the IT team. Better analysis of data is achieved by using automatic code generation and SAS SQL. The next feature of SAS is that it allows you to integrate with open source software such as R. R helps you to connect to many databases and data types. SAS provides the best practices and defines the guiding principles for a secure product development lifecycle. SAS BI ensures that the products meet the business and security needs of the customers. Let us now have a look at the companies using SAS BI. We have companies like Accenture, Genpact, IQVR, and IBM to name a few. That was all about SAS BI. Let us now move on to our next tool. So at number three, we have Click. The company was founded in Sweden back in the 90s. The company's first product was ClickView. It is a powerful tool which visualizes and analyzes the relationships between data. ClickSense is a self-service data discovery and analysis tool. It provides a modern user interface for data management. Click is named a leader in the 2020 Gartner Magic Quadrant for analytics and BI platforms. As you can see on your screens, this is how the interface looks like. Moving on to the features of Click. Click View can do everything that an OLAP based solution will do and much faster. You can take advantage of Click's powerful AI and machine learning to accelerate discoveries, boost data literacy, and derive insights. ClickSense works without data filters, but while working with Click View, data filters are required. Click allows flexible deployment capabilities for seamless end-user experiences and management capabilities across multi-cloud environments. Data storytelling is an important part of BI. ClickSense provides this feature, but it is not available with ClickView. With the Click Data Integration platform, you can do powerful data integration and perform modern analytics. As you can see on your screens, these are the companies using Click. We have Mercedes-Benz, Cognizant, Accenture, and Capgemini. So for all those who joined in now, let me just quickly repeat our list. At number five, we have ThoughtSpot. Then at number four, we have SAS BI. And at number three, we have Click. So far, do you all agree with this list? Let us know in the comment section below. Let us now move on to our next tool. At number two, we have Tableau. Tableau is one of the most popular and fastest growing business intelligence tools used in companies these days. Tableau is a data visualization tool that was founded in 2003. It manages the vast volumes of data and its flow and turns data into actionable information. It allows you to analyze and visualize data faster and efficiently. The Tableau product suite consists of Tableau Desktop, Tableau Public, Tableau Online, Tableau Server, and Tableau Reader. As you can see on your screens, this is how the interface looks like. Moving on to the features of Tableau. One of the most important features of Tableau is that it can connect to 40 different data sources and handle large amounts of data easily. Some of the data sources are local text files, Microsoft Excel, PDFs, JSON, or databases, and servers like MySQL Server, Microsoft SQL Server, etc. Tableau is an easy-to-use drag-and-drop tool which allows its users to create interactive visuals quickly. You can build different charts and graphs, dashboards, and storylines with just a few clicks. In Tableau, you can gain insights that you never thought was possible. You can play with interactive visualizations and explore various data that is available, and you don't need to have any specific knowledge of the insight you're looking for. Knowledge of coding is not required to work on Tableau, as Tableau provides inbuilt table calculations. So some of the companies that use Tableau are the American e-commerce giant Amazon, the Italian luxury sports car manufacturer Ferrari, then we have Walmart, followed by Capgemini and LinkedIn. Before we move on to the number one BI tool in our list, let's have a quick look at a few BI tools which didn't make it to our list but which seem to be very promising in the year 2020. 
So here we have Zoho Analytics, which is a cloud-based self-service BI and data analytics software that is used for data visualization and for creating dashboards. Up next, we have Oracle BI. It is an Oracle Corporation set of BI tools used for reporting and analyzing data built around tables, graphs, dashboards, etc. Then we have Pentaho, which is a BI software used for creating relational and analytical reporting. With the help of Pentaho, we can transform complex data into meaningful reports and draw valuable insights out of them. And finally, on the top of the hierarchy, we have Power BI. Power BI is a business intelligence tool that provides users with features to analyze, visualize, aggregate, and share insights from data to make business decisions. It is provided by Microsoft. Power BI has several components such as Power Query, Power Pivot, Power View, Power Map, Power BI Desktop, and Power QA. Each of these components has its own features and functionalities. As you can see on your screens, this is how the interface looks like. Moving on to the features of Power BI, firstly, it provides easy drag and drop functionality, which makes data visually appealing. It allows you to copy all formatting across similar visualizations. Power BI transforms your enterprise data into rich visuals and accurate reports for enhanced decision making. It can also be used with Azure. Using Power BI with Azure allows you to analyze and share large volumes of data. It integrates seamlessly with advanced cloud services like Azure and Cortana to provide results for the verbal data queries. With Power BI, you can fetch data from factory sensors and social media sources to get access to real-time analytics. It provides a unified user experience with customized dashboard and reports that meet your exact needs. Power BI ensures secure report publishing as it sets up automatic data refresh and rapidly publishes reports, allowing all the users to avail the latest information. The companies that use Power BI on a daily basis are Nestle, Capgemini, Accenture, and Entity Data. Hi, everyone. Welcome to this tutorial on Microsoft Excel. So we will learn about functions and formulas. We will learn about conditional formatting, data validation, pivot chart, and pivot table. Now, let's look at a scenario here. So one day in a startup, one professional speaks that their business is growing and they would need an efficient way to work with the data. They would have to find a way to work faster with storing and analyzing data. Now to that, another colleague responds, well, we can make use of Microsoft Excel to do this job. The question is, will Excel be able to cater to their business needs? Now, the colleague responds, well, we can make use of Excel in several ways, and it also is a cost-efficient option. Now, in that case, the colleague who posed the question says, let's go ahead with Excel and let's train our employees in Excel. And the suggestion is welcomed, which would make the job easier for them, and they would basically decide on using Excel. So they decide on taking a training right away and basically starting to learn Excel. Now, before we move to Excel, one of the question is why should we use Excel? So let's look at some of the points here. So Excel proves to be a great platform to perform various mathematical calculation on large data sets, which is one of the biggest requirements of various organizations these days. Various features in Excel like searching, sorting, filtering makes it easier for you to play with the data. And Excel also allows you to beautify your data and present it in the form of charts, tables, and data bars. Now, when it comes to reporting, reporting, accounting, and analysis can be performed with the help of Excel. It can help you with your task lists, your calendars and goal planning worksheets. Excel also provides good security for your data. Excel files have the feature of password protection. This way, your information can be safe. 
now when we talk about what is Excel and how it can be used so Excel or you might have heard as spreadsheet can be basically used for lot of different tasks than just storing the information in so-called tabular format now Microsoft Excel is an application that is used for recording analyzing and visualizing data it is in the form of a spreadsheet let's have a look at few of the functions and formulas used in Excel and before we do that we can also quickly take a small tour to understand how to work with Excel now to do that what we can do is we can type in in our search say for example Excel and just select your Excel app which is installed and here you see you have a lot of options which says take a tour, drop down list, get started with formulas, make your pivot table, going forward with pie charts and much more. So we can click on this one which says take a tour and that basically pops up a window which says welcome to Excel and if you have always wanted to be better at Excel you have this which can help you so let's click on create and that takes us to the store window now that says instructions for screen readers which basically talks about 10 different steps in which we can learn Excel and using the spreadsheet app so there are more than 11 sheets which we see here at the bottom end and each one gives us a simple example which we can work on so for example if I click on add now that takes me to this page which says how do we add numbers now you might be provided data which we can upload by loading a file from our machine or getting data from a web source or even connecting to a database so there are various options which we will see in some time so here we have an option which is called data you can click on this one and this basically has options where you can use existing connections if you have created some you can always click on from other sources and you can get your data from SQL server from analysis services from OData data feed you can get in from XML from data connection wizard or also from Microsoft query you can be running in different queries here which shows up in the option which says new query there are connections which you can use and that basically will display all the connections for this particular workbook which we do not have as of now but we can create them but let's look at simple examples now you can follow these instructions here which says basically adding up the numbers and that could be easily done by just placing your cursor here and what you could do is either you can type in the formula that is from which row to which row you would want to add the data so for example I could just do a sum here and that shows up all the different functions which are available then we can open up a parenthesis and we can say I would be interested in totaling the amount from column D and I would select for example D4 so I could be doing this and then I could say D4 onwards till D7 so that's the data which I'm interested in you can close your parenthesis and hit enter and that gives you the total there is also a shortcut for this which you can always do is we can first delete this and you can just place your cursor here and just use your alt and equals that automatically selects the numericals which we can anytime expand or basically collapse so I will basically select this which says this function needs two numbers which is number one and number two and then you can hit on enter and that gives you the total so similarly we can be getting in the data here by selecting all the fields so here it also says that you can use a shortcut now what we can also do is we can add numbers over 50 by selecting the yellow cell here and then giving a condition such as so I can basically use something like sum if and then open a parenthesis I can select 
I would be interested in this row and then I can even drag and drop till here so that tells me D11 to D15 you can then put in a comma here and you can give your condition say for example we would say I would be interested in numbers only above 50 and we can select this close your quotes and then just close your parenthesis and that's your formula so you can do this and that basically gives me the total is 100 now similarly we could do that for the amount here I could select this now there is also an option I can click on home and I can go for something like auto sum so that's one more way of doing it which anyway says sum is alt plus equals so it automatically adds up your values and I can try doing a auto sum that automatically selects my rows and then I can get my total now as per this activity here it says try adding another sum if formula here but add amounts that are less than 100 and the result should be 160 so what we can do is we can basically select all the numbers which are lesser than 100 so the way we did earlier here there can be always a shortcut so you can always for example if you would want to avoid typing in the formula you can always copy it from here and then just hit on enter so you are back into this cell and then I can basically go here and paste the number and then as per the requirement we are required to select anything which is lesser than 100 so what I could do is I could select here I could say let's say G and then I can change this value to G15 and that's one more way now we see our selected rows have been changed so I can hit on enter and I can check what is the result so we would be interested in looking for numbers which are lesser than 100 so I will have to also change this one to a lesser sign and that basically gives me the total which is 160 so that's how you can simply add numbers you can use auto sum you can type in the formula you can select the fields or you can just place your cursor where you would be looking for a sum and then you can just do a alt equals and that basically populates the sum now let's look at some easy options of filling your cells or automatically populating the values in your cells within your excel sheet now here we have an option which says 100 now we can click on this and that basically says it is making a sum of column c4 to d4 so if i click on this one i can check that this is row number four which shows up here and i also know this is column c I also have D so this equals is basically giving me a sum of C4 to D4 now what we can do is we can always place our cursor here at the right corner and then we can just drag and drop and this basically gives me a total of all the numbers for all different rows so this is one shortcut which we can do to get the total Excel will automatically give the totals which we call as filling down now what we can do is in the same way if we would want to get the totals here we can first check what is this 200 and this tells me it is C11 to C14 total so it is totaling the rows from C11 so column C and 11th row till 14th row and that's the sum now what I can also do is I can similarly like above we can do a filling right which basically means bringing your cursor here and then just dragging and dropping it all the way where you would need the totals and this basically gives me the total there is one more quick way to check if this is right so the easiest option would be to select this cell now what I can also do is I can just select all of these fields by just highlighting and selecting all the fields once it is selected press on Control R and that gives you the total now if we would be doing this top down then I could select all these rows 
for this particular column and then I could do a control D so that's your filling down and this one was filling right so this is an easier option of doing a fill when you would want to have the formula applied to every row as it occurs in the first row or the last row we could test this by for example selecting these fields I could delete them and I have here which says 130 I could just place my cursor here and I could drag it all the way up and that should also do the same magic which we were seeing from top down so this is a simple way wherein you can fill up your cells and you can also automatically propagate or move your computation to all the cells let's look at the split option which basically helps us in splitting the data when we have some kind of pattern or when we have some kind of delimiters in our data in say one particular column and we would want to derive the values out of it so we can always use the splitting option now the easiest option would be so for example we have our email column which has the email IDs and which we can clearly see has a first name dot last name now I see that there is a last name Smith filled up here first name is empty so what I can also do is I can just type in say Nancy here now that's the first name I can again start typing the second name and as soon as you do that you would see a faded list of numbers and that's your clue to hit enter and once you do that you would see all the first names have been filled in here if you would want to maintain the case sensitiveness you can just go ahead and delete these and let's type in as it occurs so let's say Nancy as the first name go down to the next cell and just type in Andy and there is your grade list so just hit on enter and that basically fills up your first name what we can also do is we can just select this particular field and either we can type in control E which basically fills up all the options now I can just do a undo by typing in or clicking control Z and that's basically gone what I can also do is I can select a particular field and then I can go into home option and under home you have an option here which says fill so you can select this and then you can do a flash fill which is what we are doing here so click on flash fill and that automatically fills up the values so in this way you can work within your spreadsheet and you can be filling up the values where a delimiter by default is understood and we can split the data now however sometimes you might have some data which has a different kind of delimiter and there is again a smarter way of splitting your data so you can always scroll down here and that says splitting a column based on delimiters so we have some values in the data column and these values in each row are separated by comma so select this your data is already selected text to columns delimited comma is selected and now click on next so it basically says what is the destination let's select this one and I can choose what would you want to have so that shows me this would be my data preview now I can basically select this one I can say finish and say ok and now if you see our data has been placed in in the columns appropriately so this is how you can split your data based on a delimiter and then organize your data in a better way now there are some advanced options which we can learn later but this basically tells about using a formula so this is something if say if we have some name in one cell and if you would want to split it into first name your helper column your middle name last name so that can also be done using formulas and this basically tells how would you extract characters from your left cell and how would you place them in your right cell so you can try this activity which is a little more of advanced option the benefit is that you can always use this wherein if you do some kind of transformation using your formulas 
if your original data gets updated then the split data will also get updated and that's the benefit of using formulas where you can place values from one cell into multiple cells based on execution of your details in the formulas. How about using the transpose option? Now you might have heard of situations where you would want to switch or turn your rows into columns and your columns into rows and that's where transposing comes into picture. It might be useful when you have your data uh, in your X and Y axis or as I would say in rows and columns and you would want to switch your rows to become the columns and columns to become your rows. So what we can do is the simplest way is you can select all your values. So here we basically have six columns and I would say two rows. Now I can select all of these and then I can select an empty field. For example, the one which is highlighted here. Well, you can always do a control alt V. That's a shortcut. What you can also do is once you have selected all your fields, you can just copy them. So just do a control C and then click on an empty cell and then what you can do is you can do a special paste or paste special so under your home you have the paste option and here you can go for paste special and once you do that you need to select the transpose option over here and click on ok and now you will see that the columns and the rows have been transposed so your row name was item and that has become the column heading you had row name as amount and that has become the column heading and all your values have been transposed in this particular format now there is another way of doing that and again that's using your formulas so what you can do is you can transpose with a formula also and that basically works when you have similar kind of data so this has six columns and basically two rows so you can basically do this so you can select this and earlier we were doing a copy but now what we would want to do is we would want to just look at the row numbers which tells me it is c33 c34 and it starts with c and ends in with your H column so what we can do is we know that we have six columns and two rows so transposing that would actually give me two columns and six rows so what we can do is we can select two columns and six rows in our Excel sheet I can then basically start typing in the message or I can just go to the address bar and here I can say transpose let's go for c33 h34 it basically selects my data and now i can just do a control shift and enter and now if you see all the values have been populated now you can just place your cursor in one of the cells but if you see the address bar the formula remains the same this is because this is an array formula so we can read more about an array formula here it's basically something which performs calculations on, on more than one cell in an array and in the example here the array is the original data that is c33 to h34 so your transpose is just changing the horizontal orientation to the vertical orientation so this is a very simple way in which you can basically use the Excel's capability to transpose your data and convert your rows into columns and columns into rows. Apart from working on additions, subtractions, filling up your data, sorting the data or basically splitting your data, transposing your data, one of the other requirements is sorting and filtering your data now that can be very handy when you're working on huge data and you would want to sort it in a particular order say ascending or descending or might be based on a particular field or if that field was or if the cell was highlighted with a particular color sorting the data so let's look at how excel can be used for sorting and filtering examples are pretty simple here so let's check that 
So if we're going to sort and filter and say this is the data I have, say for example, I would want to sort the values in the department column alphabetically. So what I can do is I can select department column and I'm already in the home tab. I can straight away go here with say sort and filter. I can then say sort A to Z and that's basically alphabetically sorting your department column. And once, once I do this, you would see the data has been sorted, but it's not just this data. We can just do a control Z and check what are the values we have. So here we have meat, which is beef and 90,000, 110,000, the values. Then you have bakery, which should ideally be the first row if we sort it in an alphabetical order which goes with bakery as desserts you have the values so we can check this again so select department and then just do a sort and filter and let's say sort a to z and if you see the data has changed but it's not just in changing your first column but then it has taken care of all the data However, the data has been sorted based on the department column. So you have bakery, which aligns with deserts, which has the values. And now we have all the data which has been filtered. Now, what we can also do is we can sort December's amounts from largest to smallest. So what we can do is we can basically click any cell in the December column, let's say 20,000. And then what I can do is I can go into sort filter and then I can say sort largest to smallest. So if you see bakery breads is the row which has the smallest data or might be you have deli sandwiches. So that one looks also smaller. So let's do a larger to smallest. And if I do this, you would see the values have been shifted now. So it is no more based on the department column because now the data is being sorted based on the values in the December column. And you see bakery, which was alphabetically the first one has become second last. So either you can sort the data based on a department column, which goes based on the values. These are all string values or words. So it sorts alphabetically. If you have numbers, might be you can give some values and you can sort the data. You could anytime do a custom sort and you could basically select if you would want to select the data. So I could do a custom sort and then I could choose which is the column which we would want to use for sorting. What is the sorting needs to be done? Is it cell values? Is it cell color, font color, conditional formatting? And then you can also choose the order. So that's one more way to do that. Now, if you scroll down, that also shows how you can sort by date or a color. So, for example, if you would want to sort based on the expense date, so there are different options. So what I can do is I can select this date field. I can just do a right click. I can go into sort and then I can choose. I would want to sort oldest to newest. So since I selected the date field, it basically has sorted all the data and it has taken the expense date into consideration. Now there are these filters which you see on the row headings. We could have also used those. So I could have selected this and that basically says or mentions which are the dates I would be interested in looking at. I also have sort by color here. I can do a sort oldest to newest or newest to oldest. So I could also use these filters which have been applied here. Now we have the data which is in color. So if I would want to basically select the color columns or color cells, I could select this. I can basically do a right click here. And when I go into sort, I could choose put selected color or cell color on the top. And that basically will make sure that my data is sorted and it has also sorted that in a descending order. So in this way you can sort or basically filter your data. What we can also do is we can add filters. So sometimes we can go for formulas which we would want to use. What we can also do is we can basically select the filter which has been applied here. Now, how does the filter come in there? So if I would select a particular row, 
I could select a particular row and then I could decide if I would want to just add a filter to this one and that's how the filter has come in so we have the filter what we can do is we can basically click on this drop down and then you have something like number filters so we can always go here we can basically choose one of these so we can basically choose above average so I could select this and then basically it shows me the values we could also delete the filter by clicking on this one and we could say well I'm not interested in this filter anymore so I could clear the filter and that shows me all the values or I could say that let's click on some other field for example food I can go in here I can go into number filters and then I could say well I'm interested in values which are below average above average might be greater than and then I can choose what is the value so for example if we say I'm interested in food which is greater than $25 I could give a value here I could say OK and now I have applied the filter similarly you can select this and then you can just clear your filter and your data is back so remember no data is lost it is just hidden or basically based on the filter not shown so that's good enough for us and in this way you can sort and filter the data so for more details obviously in all these sheets you have the links which point to more information on the web and you can always refer to these so this is simple way in which you can sort and filter any amount of data which has been stored within your excel within a particular sheet now that we have learned about add fill split transpose sorting and filtering it will also be good to learn how to work with tables or basically converting your data into a tabular format and then doing some easy computations so click on this tables option here now here we see there is some data which is in five columns and n number of rows so I can basically select this data and then what I can do is I can insert choose the table option and then it says my table has headers and we'll be okay with that I'll say okay and now if you see this is the table created it basically has different filters which we have learned earlier how to use and this is basically my table which is a collection of cells which has some special features so we can easily add rows to this table we can add columns to this table and we can even do some calculations so for example here I can click on this one I can basically enter some field and then I can hit on enter and we see that this row has been inserted wherein we can easily fill in values for example I would say chocolates I could give some value here so it's 25,000 might be 35,000 and then basically I can give in some values here now what you can also do is you can continue adding rows in this way and say for example you would want more columns so you can select this option here in the top bottom right corner you can just drag it towards the right and that basically has automatically created columns for my next months wherein I can feed in the data so this is a simpler way wherein you can keep adding more rows and columns to your data if that has been converted in a tabular format now let me just do a control Z that basically deletes the columns again control Z deletes the last row which we added and I can stop here or I can even remove my values by doing multiple control Z and removing my rows so this is how I converted my data into a table and then I can easily work on this what I can also do is I can do some calculations so what we can do we have a table here we have a total field and what we can do is we can just select one cell here now as we have learned earlier we can do a alt and then equals and that basically says what is this doing so it says it is calculating the sum of 
the last three months and if that's what you would want to do just hit on enter and it has automatically calculated the totals for all your rows for these three columns so the sum formula is getting filled up now I can select any particular cell and I can look in my address bar so it has already given me the formula where it has started calculating the sum from the October column till the December column and has given me the calculated values of the columns. What we can also do is we can get total rows in the table. Now that's a simpler option. So what we can do is we can select any cell in this particular table and then we see that there is a table tools design option showing up here. Now I can select this and then it says well, let's get a total row. So let's select this and it automatically populates the total here. And if you would want the average, then we could select this. And from the drop down, I can select what I'm interested in. So for example, I would want the average values and not the total. I could just select this and that gives me the average of these values. So we can always do simpler computations here by converting our data into table format. Let's learn about one more efficient way of working with the data and that's using your drop downs. So let's see how drop downs work here. Now say for example you have this data which has the values in the food column and department is empty and say for example you would want to enter the values in department however you would want to select the department should either have produce or meat and bakery and these are the only three options which should be available for any user to fill in the values how do we do that so we can basically create a table by pressing Control D. So what I can do is under my department here, I can select one of the cells and then I can do a Control T that basically converts this into a table. I can say OK and my table is created. Now what I can do is once this part is done, we can select all the blank fields here where we would want this drop down to be applicable. Now under your data tab, you can go in and select data validation and this has an option called data validation. Click on this, which basically says allow any value. So here I will select, I would want to give a list of values and then I can type in my values here, which I can say produce, say for example, meat and then say bakery. Now these are the values. So we can click on OK. And once we have done that, we basically have a drop down here next to apples, which will only show us the values which we can feed in under the department column. So I can go into every cell and then I can basically choose what is the department which handles this. And then basically I can select one of these from the drop down. So this is an easier option of creating your drop down and then feeding in the values from the set of values which you have defined here on the right. So this is a simple example of using your drop downs, working with your tables, working with your sort and filter, transpose, split, filling up your data, adding in some data here. And similarly, you can use Excel for more than one use case using its inbuilt features to easily work with your data. Let's see how we can import data or bring in data into our Excel from your local machine or from an external web source. So what we can do is we can open up a blank Excel sheet and say, for example, you have been provided a text file or a CSV file and you would want to import that data into your Excel sheet that can be easily done. So right now I've opened an Excel sheet. Now I can click on data and here I have an option which says existing connections from other data sources. So, or you can click on connections if you have already created some. So we can click on from other sources. 
So this is one option where you can connect to your different data sources and you can get the data from one of these. What we can also do is I can click on connections. Now it says there is none. I can click on add. It says, well, show the connections where connection files on network, connection files on this computer. So I can say, let's get some files from this computer. Now, if that does not show up something, so say browse for more and that basically shows you different options so let's basically select a folder where i have some data sets i'll click in here and this is basically a folder where i have some data sets now let me select this particular file and i know it is a csv file so let's click on open now if you would want to verify this you could have gone and looked into the properties of the file and it says it is a .csv file which is what we are interested in so i'll take this file i'll say open now this basically shows me the text import wizard option which says is the file delimited i'll say yes click on next so i will select comma as my delimiter i can say text qualifier is none now this is my data so my data preview is already showing me the data is what is the data in the csv file you can click on next and then you have an option which says data format is general you can go for date format you can go for advanced options so i'll just say finish and basically now this has been created here so we basically have this and now i can click on close now once you have done that you can click on existing connections it shows me the data which we have here the connection which we have created say open and then it says do you want to import this data or bring this data into existing worksheet you can also say add this to a data model if you are doing some data modeling so click on ok and now this data is automatically inserted in my excel file I can basically save it into this particular sheet. Now what we can also do is we can also start a new sheet and that does not have a data and we can get some other data from web. So what I can do is I can go into my GitHub and let's say I would be interested in this CSV file. So I can select this and this is my GitHub path, a path on web. So I can click on draw and that basically gives me the raw path where this particular file is now you can select this copy this particular path and here you can come back to your excel sheet we would be interested in getting the data from web might be from a text file where we will have to specify the delimiters or let's go to web and here I can give in the web path from where I would be interested in getting the file. Let's give the GitHub path, which is publicly available, and then click on import. Now, once you click on import, it tells me there are two fields, data and value. These are within double quotes, separated by comma. So first, let's click on import. Now, once we do this, it will basically get the data from web and put in here it says existing worksheet so we had already created a new worksheet so let's click on ok and now you have the data coming in but then this basically shows me in one particular field so what we can also do is we can just do a control a that selects all my columns here and that's my data so we can then basically filter this out so we can say text to columns it's a delimited file click on next we can select comma and let the text qualifier be quotes it shows me data preview click on next so you have the general format it shows the destination that's the column click on finish and now your data has been split and you have the data which you have imported from web so this is the data which is coming in from web this is the data which came in from my local machine and similarly we can even create connection with an existing database so i can basically click on connections if i would want to do that 
So I have an option called connection here and it says where the selected connections are used. I can basically click on add. I can basically choose if I would want to get the files from network or from computer like we did earlier. I can click on browse for more which should show me different other options to create connections say you would want to create a new SQL server connection you can connect to a new data source coming in from different place you could basically choose what kind of connection you would you want so these are all the different options which we can go for and we can basically connect to a database for example if I have some database and say for example access database I can see if there are some files with that particular database and I can import it. So similarly, we can also uh, click in here which says new query and that also gives you an option of getting the data from your files, from all these folders, from databases. So you can basically click here and then you can import data from a MySQL database provided that is set up on your local machine or on a particular server. You can go from cloud, you can get it from online services, you can get it from other sources which says from web, from your Hadoop file system, from Active Directory, from a blank query and you can even combine queries wherein you can run a Power Query editor you can get the data from different sources and then you can bring it into your Excel. So in this way, you can get your data from different sources into your Excel, into your spreadsheet, and then you can continue working on those data sets. We have uh, already learned some basic operations which you can do in Excel and let's implement our knowledge by working on this particular data which is coming in from housing data set. Now here if we see some fields we have agent, date listed, area, list price and this is basically the data which has been sorted in newest to oldest order of date listed. So how do we arrive at this? So what I can do is I can just click on data listed and then I can either go in here, I can select sort, I can get into custom sort and then I can choose the column based on which I would want to sort the data. So I would look for the newest data to the oldest data. That means that would be in a descending order of dates or you could say the oldest date or the earliest month will be towards the lower side of your sheet. So here we can select date listed. Now I can say let it sort based on cell values and the order what we have here. So we have newest to oldest. So let's select this. I can say OK. And now if you see the date has been sorted. So we have your 10-18-2007 on the top. So that seems to be the latest date. And as we go down we will see an earlier month hour and earlier month than that in this date listed. So we have sorted our data into newest to oldest order and that's based on your date column. So the result shows up here. Now what we can also do is we can have different questions which we would want to answer. So for example I would want to sort the data in ascending order of area and descending order of agent name. How do we do that? So let's look into this. So this is here. I already have the result here and how did I get this? So I'm looking for ascending order of area and descending order of agent name. So we can start with any particular column that does not matter. So for example if I look into this Excel sheet I have my agent name select this which we want in a descending order. So we could either do a sort and then go for descending sort Z to A. We could also use the filter option here on the top right and we could do it or I could just say sort Z to A and then it has arranged the data based on the agent column being in descending order. Now I can go into area 
and then I can again do a sort and I wanted my area column to be used for sorting the data in ascending to descending and that basically not only changes the order of this particular column but for my complete data so let's do that and now if you see we have the data which has been sorted so we can see how many values we have here and the area values which we see and this is how you get your result so i'll just do a control z and again and i'm back to my original data and this is the sorted result which we are seeing at similarly we can answer other questions for example sort the data according to the following order of area that is we are saying county central and then your county so we can basically choose in which particular way we would want to do it so it is county central and then again county so if i look into my sheet 3 so here i basically have my data which is having some south county then you have your central and then you have your north county so we would want to sort the data to solve our problem which is according to the following order so first we go for area then we go for south county central and north county so what we can do is we can basically have area field selected and i would want to sort this particular data so i have south county central and north county so i can basically go for custom sort and then i can choose which is the value or column which i'm interested in let's go for area we will go for something like cell values well you can also try to explore conditional formatting icon if this is what you would want to use or we can basically go for just cell values and here we can say if i would be interested in first getting my values for south county so for example i can say custom list and then i can basically give in the new list here so i can say s dot county and then i would want central and then i would want north county so let's select this as it exists we can basically say add and that's basically the order which we want say okay and then say okay here and now what we would want is we would want our data so we can compare that with the values which we see here it starts with kelly you have in the 12th row something like lang and that's what we are doing so we can basically arrange the data in a particular order by choosing a custom list and then sorting your data so that's one more simpler task where we, what we have done where we have sorted the data in the order where under our area column we first wanted south county then we wanted central data and then we wanted north county so this is how you can do it now let's look into one more problem so it says find all the houses in the central area and we would want to basically apply a regular filter let's let's see how do we do that so we can click on this and here we have the data so the problem statement is we would want to find all the houses in central area now how do we do that we can do a sorting but we would want to use the filter which you see here is implemented so how do you do it so you can select this area and say for example i would want to apply filter i can just go in here and i can say let's get a filter on my first row and now i have filters applied so we are interested in looking into the central area houses let's go in here it says all these fields are selected that means it shows everything wherein your area has all these values let's unselect this and then i will only be interested in the central so let's say okay and then say okay so now you see that the area filter has been applied and we are looking at the central column so 
what we have done is we have applied a simple filter and we are looking at our data at any point of time if you do not want the filter then what I can do is I can select this and I can say well I'm interested in all the data so I could do this or you can clear the filters from area and you get your data back so that's in one way you can filter out your data so let's look at an example of sort and filter where we might have to filter the data based on two columns or multiple columns with different kind of values where it could be and and or condition now say for example this is the data I have and this is the question which we need to answer such as find the list of all houses in the central region with pool and south county without pool now if it was a simple filter based on one cell I could have just selected my header row I could have then applied the filter and once I have the filter I can look in area where I have three regions so I'm only interested in central and south county so I can get rid of north county and that's fine but then we have two different conditions here so we need the data in central region to have the value for pool being true and for south county the value has to be without pool now how do we do that so what we can do is we can first create a copy of these headers here so let me do that now the area has to be south county so basically I can either just select this and I can choose this value and then I can select this and then I can choose central so that's the criteria which I have and the pool value has to be so central region should be with pool so then this one basically has to be true and this one has to be basically false so south county is without pool so let's select one of the values here and this is my criteria now to get my result uh, we can always place your cursor here and you can check this is M column and eighth row okay so we would want the result here so let's go ahead and now click on data and then in filter you have an option called advanced and here what I can do is I can say I would want to filter the list in the place but that's not what I would want to do so I'll say copy to another location and here if you see the list range will tell me that this is the data so a1 to j126 so a to j column selected and all the rows criteria range is basically based on what I've given here so that is m from 1 to v which is 3 so I'm selecting these columns and then I'm saying all the way whatever criteria I've given and copy to I'm saying m8 to v8 so that basically will give me my filtered result so you could basically just say okay and now I have my data which has been filtered and I have my area which is South County that is without pool central with pool again South County without pool and then if you look at your central value that's pool so this is an advanced filter which we have applied where simply we have filtered the data based on two columns and then we have our result so in this way you can have your customized filter applied on two different columns and get your data which can be either replacing the existing content or in the same sheet in different set of columns and rows you can have your result let's look at one more example of filtering where you are trying to filter the data based on an AND condition condition being met in two different columns and then you would want to filter out the data for only specific columns so the situation is the agents with a house in North County that should be county area having two and a single type family so we are talking about two bedrooms and we would 
basically have a single type family and here the criteria is that we would want to only populate these columns which is agent, area, bedroom and type. Now what you can do is as I explained earlier that you can get your result in the same sheet in a different location. So here I have created these headers which says agent, area, bedrooms and type. Now this is basically a copy of all the columns what we have here, agent, data listed, area, list price, bedrooms, bath, square feet and so on. So you can basically create a copy of the headers here and this is where we will give our advanced criteria to filter the data. So the conditions which need to be met is we need to look at North County. So for example here in area I can basically go ahead and select one of the values North County. Now the criteria is having two bedrooms only so let's say bedrooms and let's say the value should be two and then basically I am saying a single type family. So when you would want the single type family so here under type I can give the criteria single type. So this is my AND condition. So we are saying North County area having two bedrooms and the type is single family. Now this is the criteria which basically means if I select this, this one tells me that this is M1 row onwards till V2. So this is what we have and we would want to filter based on this. So let's go ahead and then go for data filter advanced. And here in advanced, it says filter the list in place. Now that's not what we would want to do. So I'll say copy to another location. This basically selects the list range. So which is telling me A1 to J126. So that's the columns and rows selected. Criteria range is based on M1, V2, which we have given here. And copy to, I would say, for example, from M7, to P7. Now this is the area where I would, this is the place where I want the result. Let's say OK. And now I get my data which is based on the question which has been asked that you would want the agents with a house in North County area having two bedrooms and single type family. So in this way you can basically do advanced filtering, get your data and get it stored in the sheet anywhere at a different location well I could have also done filtering in place and that would have replaced the data which we have but that's not what we want we would want the filtered result in a different place so this is how you can do some advanced filtering we can also use Excel to filter out the data in one particular column which might be conditional or say using some numerical filters. Now here say for example the problem statement is that you would want to display all the houses whose list price is between 45,000 to 600,000 or say for example we would want to filter out the data to something else. Say for example let's say I have I would want to filter out the data between 300,000 and 400,000. So we can basically update this. Say for example I am saying I am interested in 300,000 to 400,000 and that's the criteria to filter out the data. Now there are two different ways or there are two easier ways to do it. One is I would want to look at the list price so I can select this. I can go ahead and to a filter here and in the list price now this is where we would want to do the filtering so it's pretty easy you can click on this one and then you can go into number filters and you can choose between now that's one easier way of doing it so I could basically select this I could say I am looking for value which is greater than or equal to 300,000 and then is less than or equal to 400 thousand. So if I just do this I have applied my filter and I have my data which is filtered based on my criteria right. So that's one easier way of doing it. 
or let me do a control Z now let the filter be there which you can anyways use but what we can also do is as we have seen earlier methods so get a set or get your column headers here and then you are giving two columns here now the only difference between my this set of columns which i have one two three four and then you have seven and ten columns and if you see here we have four five six seven eight nine ten eleven right so whenever you want a and condition you will basically add the columns where i can give add condition if it is the same column if it was a different column then it would be same number of columns but and conditions will lie in the same line and or condition would lie in a different line now here i can give this value so i am looking for listed price being between 300000 so i am saying it should be greater than or equal to 300000 and then i can say less than or equal to 400000 now that's my criteria and then i need my result here which is in m7 so what i can do is once i have given my criteria which i'll be using to filter i can get into data i can get into advanced and then i can say copy to another location so it is selecting my a1 to j126 criteria range is based on m1 to w2 and then I would want my result from this particular column. So let's say OK. And now you have your data filtered out in a different location in the sheet, which has been filtered based on your AND condition. So you can filter out the data in this way, or you could just apply a filter on a column and give the conditions. Now let's solve one more interesting problem. And here we would want to use Excel where we would have an AND, AND, and OR condition. So say for example, this is the data given to you. And the question is that you would want to find all the houses in North County. Again, that's a spelling mistake, but then they are North County area with a list price greater than 300,000 and having three or four bedrooms. So the bedroom has conditional so it has or three and four and then basically you have list price which is greater than three hundred thousand now i could have obviously selected the columns and then basically gone for a filter so i can just do a filtering here and then i'm looking for list price being greater than three hundred thousand so which we can always give a number filter and i can say greater than and then I can say greater than or equal. So I can say greater than, and then I can give 3,000, 30, 300,000. And that's basically the filter which we would want. And here I would want to select the bedrooms which should be just either three or four. So if, for example, here I go in here and I unselect this, and then I say three and four, right? So I am getting my data which is greater than 300,000 and it should have the bedroom values which will be either 3 or 4 selected. Now that's one way of doing it. Let's do a control Z and get it back to as we were or you can even just say clear filter so you get your data back as it was. So what we can do is we can here give the criteria so for example i have my list price now this is what i would want as a condition so let's say greater than 300000 300000 and bedrooms should be 3 and then i can say greater than 300000 and then i can say 4 so this one basically gives me a situation where your list price has to be greater than 300,000 and bedroom should be either 3 or 4. So we have given our filtering criteria. Now to get the result, what we can do is we can go into data, we can go into advanced 
and we can say copy to another location so our list range is selected which is columns A to J row number 1 to 126 your criteria range is given in M1 to V3 where we have specified and we are saying the result would be in M7 to V7 so if I do this now I have got the same data which we were seeing earlier and here the bedroom values are 3 or 4 and basically the list price is greater than 300,000 so this is a simpler way in which you can create your filters and all this advanced filtering what we are seeing it will be saved with your sheet you can always go back and change this value or you could do filtering where one person has to look into the filter to see what values have been selected now that we have looked into some operations which we can perform in Excel using filter or sorting the data, creating your tables, let's also quickly look at functions and formulas which can be used for doing some easy calculations or computations. Now Excel can be used in different kind of data analysis. So for example, you have different inbuilt functions which can be used and we can always check for a particular function so for example if i had if i wanted to look at a particular function i could just type in here something for example is and then it shows me all the possible functions and you can always have a look at the detail of the function for example you have is even which will return true if the number is even if we would say is logical so I could search for is logical and that tells me whether a value is logical value true or false and returns your value true and false. Now we can obviously say subtotal so you can search for any of these useful functions and that tells me what this function can be used for so returns a subtotal in a list or a database. You have many other such functions such as integer, sum, average you may be interested in working on truncating some data getting the absolute value getting the square root basically getting a count or getting a max value you can look for any particular functions within your excel sheet now you also have other functions such as now or time for example let's look at now function so i can search for now and here it is so this is returns the current date and time formatted as a date and time so this is the function which we would want to use and if i just give the function it tells me what is the current time let's first look at the description of time here so say for example i would want time it says converts hours minutes and seconds given as numbers to an excel serial number formatted with a time format so for example if i would say two hours and then 30 minutes and 30 seconds and if i do this it has basically converted this into your time format so you can always use different inbuilt functions for your work now we will also look at some advanced functions like sum if or some ifs you have count if and count ifs and you can be working on various functionalities of excel to easily help you in doing some calculations computations working with your data working with your different cell values so let's look at some example of using functions like sum or sum if so for that let's go to this sheet and here we have some data now i have already applied a filter which can allow me to filter out the data so it says find the total units that were sold in the east region now we know that in region we have east and I have multiple regions I could basically be saying unselect all and select only east and say ok and that basically gives me the units which were sold and if I place my cursor here and then if I did a auto sum 
so it would basically give me the function which is being used so something like subtotal and it is basically working on your rows which is e2 to e44 and here we can just do this so that gives me the total but this is this is fine you could do that but it would be good if we know how do we use a function like sum if to do that so here i am seeing this is the subtotal where i am looking at the values and basically what i have done is i have filtered out the region and then basically i am getting a count but this does not give me clearly how a sum was calculated from all the values which were listed. What we can also do is let's do a control Z and let's get it back. So now we have our data and we would want to get the total units that were sold in the East region. So what I can do is I can start typing in my formula and for that I'll use an inbuilt function. So for example, I would be interested in going for sum if. Now it says sum if adds the cells specified by a given condition or criteria. When you talk about sum ifs, this is when you could give set of conditions or multiple criteria. So let's look at sum if. Let's do this. Now obviously this gives me an error because the formula is not right so we have to basically come in here and let's start with sum if now when i say sum if it shows me there is a function with sum if which we would want to use and here once i open up the bracket it tells me okay what is the range of data which you are interested in so i'm interested in all the units that were sold in the east region so we are interested in the region which is here so i can basically be selecting this and this tells me you are interested in the data here so let's not take the header value so let's say b2 and then we can go all the way to the end so we can basically select this way that's the data we have select this and hit enter so now here it has selected b2 to b4 but we need to basically now give the criteria so the criteria is either a value or you can point it to a cell which has that particular value so as per our problem statement we are looking for the units which are sold in east region so i can select the value east here and then my sum if needs the range on which you want to calculate a sum so let's select this and now we are interested in finding out the sum of units so that's basically this column e column so i can basically type in instead of selecting so i can say e and i'm interested in e2 2 e44 so that basically selects the area or all the values and now let's do this so that basically gives me the sum is 691 right now this is the criteria where i have pointed it to a cell and whatever value that cell has well i could have done something like this so i could have selected east giving the value and then doing it it still does the same thing and in this way you have more clarity that you are using sum if you are filtering the data so you have given the rows you are given the criteria and then you have given the range on which you would want to sum up the values now similarly if the question was what was the total revenue generated from binder now we would want to find out what is the total revenue generated from binder that means my filtering criteria will be binder and then i want to find out the total revenue generated so we have the revenue generated field also here and we have we don't have any region to be filtered we are just looking for binder so let's again start doing the same thing so we can go for some if we can open the bracket now it needs the range so we are interested in revenue generated now that's the summation we want 
and we would want to get the range of data so here we can basically select uh, d2 to d44 so that's the data selected now i would want to give the filtering criteria so let's say binder and then we need to give the range on which the sum needs to be calculated so that's my revenue column so that's g so i can say g2 to g44 and that basically selects the column and then you get your sum so it tells me what is the total revenue generated from binder now i could be doing this for other things also so say for example if you would want to filter out something else you could basically just drag and drop here and then i could come here and change this to say instead of binder i would be interested in say pencil if that's the criteria you are interested in remember to change this so that you take all the values and here we will change it to select the relevant rows and then this is the data i'm getting so i know that this is the revenue generated from pencil this is the revenue generated from binder now this is a simple use case where we are using some if what if we would want to use some ifs so some ifs let's have a look at how we get to some ifs so some if says where you would want to work on doing some calculation but then you would want multiple criteria to be met so let's see how we get this so here what i can do is let's work on this problem statement which says what is the total revenue generated from central region where the item is a pencil so that's something which i would want to check now when we are answering this question we can also look at the order in which things have been asked in the question so it says what is the total revenue generated from central region so we need the total revenue generated we know there is a revenue column we are interested in getting the total revenue generated we are saying the filtering criteria is central region and we say in that we would be interested only in the item if it is pencil how do i do it so i can use some ifs where you can pass in multiple criteria so let's start with some ifs and when i start with some ifs let's open up the bracket so it says some range it says criteria range then it gives one criteria and you can give in any number of criteria so for example we are interested in total revenue generated now that's my g column so let's follow in the same order so let's say g2 so that's my first value and then i know there are 44 rows here so i can say g44 and you can obviously check if that has selected all the rows now that's my total revenue generated so i would want the total revenue generated so i'm saying setting this some range then i need to give the criteria range so it says from central region so central region comes into column 2 that's b so let's say b2 to b44 so that's my criteria range then you have to give your criteria but we need to filter out the region being central so let's select this now either i could point to a value in the cell or i can just give the exact value here we can also give a wild card or matching pattern so that also works now this one is fine we are now also interested in finding the total revenue generated when the region is central and the item is pencil how do we do that so for item we know the columns the column is d2 so let's select d2 to d44 
So that basically selects all the rows in the D column and we need to give the filtering criteria. So let's do a comma and then just given our value. So let's say pencil and then let's close your bracket and that basically gives you the result. So we need to just follow the order of our question which says what is the total revenue generated? So we are looking at the revenue column. We are selecting all the rows. Then it says from the central region. So we need to select the region column and give the filtering criteria as central or point to a cell which contains that value. And then it says we would be interested only in item being pencil. So then you select the column which has all the items and provide your filtering criteria that is pencil. So that's your easy calculation of using sum if which we compare with sum if here. So sum if here was just having your criteria. So basically you are selecting your rows, giving your filtering criteria and then your sum range. In sum ifs, we are giving multiple conditions. Now same thing can be done here. It says how many units were sold by sales representative Johns or Jones where the cost of each item was greater than four. So how many units were sold by sales representative? So when we talk about how many units, that's your E column. So let's start with that. So let's say some ifs, I would be interested in E column. Then let's give the range. So it says some range. So those are the number of units on which we would want to find the sum. Then it says you need to give the criteria range. So we say sales representative where the name is Jones. So sales representative is in sales rep column C. So let's say C2 to C44. Now then we need to give our filtering criteria. So let's say Jones is the sales representative where we are interested uh, about whom we are interested in and then we s the question says where the cost of each item so cost of each item is what we are interested in you have unit cost so that's what we are interested in so that would be f and then say f2 to f44 and then you need to give your cost so it says where each item is greater than four. So let's select this and let's do this. So this tells me three zero one. Now, similarly, let's answer our third question, which says how many units did Jones sell excluding pencil item? So we would want to find out what was the total number of units units that were sold and that units or that should not include the pencil item. How do we start doing this? So let's start with some ifs. Now we know that you start with some ifs, you need to give the sum range. So we are interested in the number of units. So let's basically go in and select our number of units which were sold so that's your column e so i can say e2 to e44 that's where i would want to perform the sum now i'm saying how many units that were sold where we are talking about sales rep being jones so let's see let's select the columns c and then give the range after that, we need to give our giving filtering criteria, which is Jones, and then we are interested in the items, but excluding pencil. So items is in column D. So let's say D to D44, and then we have to give our criteria. So we can say, well, that should exclude pencil. So I can basically say, pencil and let's close this 
and let's check so that's my formula which says that these are the number of units which the sales representative whose name is Jones had sold and that does not include pencil as an item let's also look at an example of using count if or count ifs now both of these can be very useful when you would want to calculate certain values so for example if I would want to work on count if let's try solving this problem now remember you can answer these questions using filters and that can be an easier way but then sometimes you may want to get the formulas so that you can make your spreadsheet and your calculation more dynamic in nature and that will basically depend on the values in the columns or rows so for example if I have find the total number of times Gil has made a sale now if I look at my data here it tells me that for every sales representative there is some value in the sale and it says sales has greater than three so for example Jones you have sales greater than three or you have Jardine which is sales greater than three and so on so what we are interested in is doing a quick count and finding out the total number of times Gil has made a sale how do we do that so we can use this count if function and if I go into count if it says counts the number of cells within a range that meet the given condition now what's our condition our condition is Gil and we would want to find out how many times the name say Gil appears or Gil has made a sale now I could just say count if and then open up a bracket I need to give a range so let's say we are interested in looking at the range so let's say we will choose sales rep so I can say C and then I can say C2 to C44 now that's my range let's not give that in quotes so you have to give a range so let's do a count if that selects the data and then we need to give the condition so for example let's here give the name which is Gil and then close this so that basically tells me it is five times Gil appears here we can check this so I can go in here I can add a filter and then might be I would be inter interested in looking at only Gil and that basically gives me five right so we can always do that and we can be using formulas like this now what about this question so which basically says which sales representative made a sale more than three times now we it might be looking little confusing when I say for example let me clear out this filter now we have sales greater than three and we would want to find out which sales representative made a sale more than three times now I could basically check for every sales representative here if they have made a sale more than three times and what I can do is I can just say equals I can start with count if then I need my filtering criteria so that's your range so first thing is we will choose for example let's choose C2 to C44 and then we need to give and criteria what is the criteria we need basically a sales representative so I can choose the value here in C2 and then I can close this and then I can say the sale has to be greater than 3 and let's check so it tells me the boolean value that yes this guy has made sales more than 3 times and what we can do is we can just drag and drop which basically gives me the value for other sales rep you can always check the value is automatically changing to this value in cell and for example let's go in here so this is obviously 2 so it says me false right and you can basically get the values for all your values so that basically tells me which 
sales representative has made a sale more than three times. Now, like some ifs, we also have count ifs where you can give multiple criteria. So, for example, the question is how many orders were placed from the East region after this particular date? So, we have a date criteria. We also have the region criteria and we need to basically get the count of number of orders which were placed. Now, I can in this case use count ifs and this basically says that you can start with a criteria so it says how many orders were placed from east region after particular date so date is in my first column so for example i could say a start with 2 and say for example let's go a44 that should have selected all the rows and then I need to, once I've given the criteria range, I need to give the criteria. So we are saying the date has to be greater than 10th Feb. So let's give it 2, 10, 2019. And then you need to say how many orders were placed. So you need to give the criteria, second criteria range. So we are looking at the number of orders which were placed from the East region. So when I would want to look at the region, that's your column B. So I can basically say B2 to B44. And here I would basically give my criteria. So the criteria is East let's give that and once you have done this you would want to find out the total number of orders so let's select this and if i do this it tells me 13 now is that right so we are looking for your date your region being east and then getting the total number of orders so here i can just do a count if i'm saying a2 to A44 wherein I have given the date criteria that it should be greater than 10th Feb because I do not want to count 10th Feb it says after 10th February and then you are saying the region has to be East so we would want to find out the total number of orders so my region is East and that gives me the result now similarly you can also find out how many times Gil sold pencils so here we will have to give the range so let's start with count ifs now here i would want that item is pencils so we can as well select column d to d44 then you have to give your criteria so that's your pencil and then we are looking for sales rep which is gill so that is my column c so let's say c2 to c44 and the value should be just gill so it tells me it's twice where gill has sold pencils so we can obviously check this by going in here choosing my filter and then let's search for rep being just gill okay and now we are interested only in the item being pencil so i can say well let's get to pencil only and that tells me twice so you can obviously re-verify using filters but using functions or using formulas it is always good to calculate and that can be making your computation and calculation more dynamic let's look at one more interesting feature of excel and that's your conditional formatting now as you see on the screen 
conditional formatting has different rules which can be applied on your data and that allows you to basically differentiate or easily identify data values which are based on certain criteria or rules. So when you talk about conditional formatting, you have different options such as you can highlight cell rules, you can get top and bottom values, you can apply different rules, apply different color scales and you, you can easily manage these rules. So conditional formatting is very useful for people who would want to work on huge amount of data and easily perform some data analysis. It's easy to use as it is shown here and with your conditional formatting you can format cells based on a preset condition. You can perform conditional formatting to identify cells. You can highlight a few significant cells and you can easily perform conditional formatting as shown on the left side. Now how do we work with conditional formatting? Let's have a quick look. So say for example we have our excel sheet and if you see here I am highlighting the salesperson who have generated revenue greater than 10,000. So we can be looking at the values where the revenue generated by a particular salesperson is greater than 10,000. It has a particular color and how do we get here? So for example let's select this data and what I could do is I could go into conditional formatting now I could basically highlight cell rules and we could just say greater than that's an easier way I could also go ahead and create a new rule but then I can use one of this option I can say greater than and let's give some value might be we would be interested in looking at any value greater than 12,000. So let's choose 12,000. And here it says what color would you want to select. So for example, I would say something like yellow fill with dark yellow text. And let's say OK. So right now what I'm doing is I have all the values where the revenue generator was greater than 10,000 but then I have also selected all the sales people who have made or who have generated revenue greater than 12,000. So I can just do a control Z to see the previous result. Now here I had the values which were greater than 10,000 and the one which we did just now basically highlighted the values which are greater than 12,000. So this is one simple example. Now we can look at some other examples. Say for example you want to format cells using three color scale. So if you look at the values here I have a three color scale mainly in green, yellow and red and how do you do this? So for example I can go in here and I can go to conditional formatting. So I would want to go for color scales and here you can create different rules. So we can set up a two color scale. So we can say format only values that are above and below average. I can format only cells that contain something. I can get the top and bottom value. So these are different ways in which I can have a three color based scale. Now what I will do is I will select this. And let me show you the rule which I have. So for example, I can go into manage rules and if you see here there are certain rules which have been specified. Now what does that mean? So you would want to specify a three grade scale. So for example, if I would want to look at my first rule, it tells me that I'm choosing three color scale. I can choose lowest value, percentile and highest value and that basically will select the cells based on their values. So what we could have done is I can basically use one of these values. I can delete these rules which I have created. So for example I have all these rules but 
you should always carefully remember that the rules will be applied in the order shown so for example if I just delete these rules and then say apply and say okay my data is back now it does not have any highlighting now I can go in here I can say condition sorry conditional formatting I could go for color scales or I could basically go into new rule so I would want the cells to be using three color scale so let's choose three color scale now when you say three color scale it says what will be the color of lowest value and we could choose might be any one of this let's choose red I can say midpoint is percentile 50 and then the highest value is green and if that looks good let's say ok and now if you see the lowest values have been highlighted as red you have mid values and then you have the positive value so this is a three color scale and that easily helps me in identifying the data based on the cell values now in conditional formatting what you can also do is you can basically color the cells based on their values so what we are seeing here is if the revenue generated is greater than average then that shows in green and if the revenue generated is lesser than average that shows in orange now how do we do that so we can basically again manage some rules so I can basically create a new rule now here I can select one of the options which says format only values that are above or below average and that's the option I would want to select now I can select this and it says format values that are above average so in our case we had it in green so for example I'll say above average and then here I can go for a particular color so you can go for a particular size so let's go and look into the formatting so for example let's choose yellow say okay now I'm saying wherever the cell values are above average it would be yellow instead of green and let's go in here let's go and look into manage rules so this is basically the rule which we are applying now we can also add a new rule and I need to select the values so for example I will say here so we had gone for above now we'll go for below we'll go for format we will choose red we'll say okay we'll say now these are basically the rules which we have created and here it says applies to your data so right now it has not been applied so for example if I select this and then I could basically choose my area just hit on enter and similarly you can go in here and then select your area hit on enter and say apply say okay and now if you see I have really chosen bright colors but then I have said wherever my revenue generated is above average it should be in yellow and below average should be in red so we wanted above average to be in green and below average to be in orange so that's what we have here right so you can always color code your cell values based on some rules which you are setting up now similarly you can also find the top 10 and bottom 10 values and that's pretty easy so you can just select this and then you can go into conditional formatting you can go for top and bottom values top 10 items bottom 10 items or you can go in for more rules so you can say format only top or bottom ranked values so you have top 10 now you can choose the color and for example I'll go for blue and I'll say okay so now if you see my top 
10 values are blue. Now similarly I can add one more rule. So I can say new rule and I can say let's go for top or bottom. Let's go for bottom. Let's go for format. Let's say orange. Say OK. Say OK. And that's it. So now you have your values which are top or bottom 10 values. So you are using conditional formatting where you are basically highlighting your cell values based on different colors. And here, easy conditional formatting based on different rules helps us to do that. Now, similarly, you can also have the values which is basically showing you how the values are increasing. So what we can do is we can select our columns. Either you could apply this to all the columns. Now here I have applied this only to Jan and April. Now I could apply this for June. So let's say June. So you can go for gradient fill. You can go for solid fill. You can obviously just select the color and that takes care of the things. You can say for example select this and now this is selected but I would want to might be format this so I can go in here. I can go into manage rules. Now that will tell me what rule has been applied in the order. So I can just do a edit rule and that basically says this is a solid fill which is color. You have no border. This is basically color is black. Now I can go for something like gradient fill and I can say OK. And now if I say apply and OK. So this basically is like your first column. So you can use conditional formatting for various use cases and you can highlight the values. So anyone who would look at the value would automatically notice which are the higher values, which are lower values might be here. The revenue is getting generated or was getting generated, but did not grow beyond a particular value and so on. Now, similarly, you can also go in for different options. Say, for example, here we would want to see if the revenue was dropping or if the revenue was, if the revenue decreased, or say, for example, if the revenue was going up for this particular salesperson. So, here we are looking at Carol. So, in Jan, the revenue generation by sales was very high. Then in Feb, it was falling down. In March, it was kind of stable. Then in April, it went way below. So we can obviously work on this wherein we can grade our cell values. So what we can do is we can go in for highlighting the cell values. Now you can go for color scales. You can go for icon sets. And this is where you can choose your different shapes. So you could choose one of these shapes. So for example, I would be interested in looking at the indicators like directional. I could go using this three arrows. I can go in for this color. I can choose directional and then my values are automatically using directional. Now what we can also do is we can then go into manage rules and that basically tells me what rules have been applied. So for example, the latest one is the icon set which I have chosen. It shows the selected columns. I can obviously do a edit rule and then I can choose. So I'm saying the format style is icon sets. I'm not using a data bar. I'm not using color scale. Now here, I have chosen the style of icons and then here you can basically give some values. So you have icon which is green when the value is greater than or equal to 67 percentage. When I say hyphen or minus it is less than 67. It's way below 33 percentage then you give this value. So you can obviously edit and easily highlight your cell values based on this icon set. So I can apply this 
and that's how I use conditional formatting so conditional formatting can be very useful if you would want to use icon set if you want to use your data bars if you would want to highlight particular values if you would want to color code based on some calculation if you would want to use a three color or a two color scale or if you would want to just find out values based on some simple calculation so conditional formatting is used extensively by data analysts or people who are working in business intelligence teams or people who would want to use excel to easily identify the data easily identify the cells which contain particular value or finding out less significant or more significant cells to then pull out values and carry out your computations calculations or analysis so let's continue learning on using excel for various things now we have learned on conditional formatting and seen how that can be very helpful let's learn one more feature of excel and that's basically your data validation now this can be very useful when you would want to work on validating the data which is being fed in the cells so you could limit it to basically a number between a particular value you could also add some messages to it if you would want or you could even circle invalid data or clear validation circles so data validation really helps us in validating the data which is being fed in to particular fields now it's a feature in excel which is mainly used to control what a user can fill in a cell you can decide what type of values must be entered you can also restrict user to enter only valid data and if any invalid data is entered an error message will be displayed now that's where you can use your data validations so let's see how that can be done so for data validation let's see some exercises here so for example you have a name column and you would want to restrict that the name should accept only 15 characters now how do you do that so you can basically select the cells or you can just select a particular cell and then we can later drag the property to other fields now here once the cell is selected so for example let's try this out and let's see if that works so for example i will say peter johnson okay and that is basically five and nine and twelve characters so let's say junior and if i do this it says input length is greater than 15 do you want to continue if i say yes right so basically it is allowing me to add the value here but then it has basically violated the rule now this is giving a message to the user that the username should be entered less than 15 characters now how do we do that so for this we can basically select the column and then we can search for data tab and get into data validation so this is where you can create or select different kind of rules so for example i can go into data validation i can go into settings and i can say the text length and that should be less than 15 now this is the maximum i'm giving and it says apply these changes to all other cells within the same settings so i can do this or i can just drag and drop so i can basically apply this formula and now you can in fact randomly check in any particular cell is the rule applied so it says text length less than 15 so we can basically control data validation in this particular column and that will allow only 15 characters it will pop up a message if the user really wants to go beyond the particular limit now you also have similarly date of birth so the restriction is date of birth should be between 10 jan 1990 to 30 december 1998 so this is what we want to restrict how do we do that so we can select the field 
we can click on data validation and if you see here I have selected date and then date is between and then obviously you can give a range that is 10 Jan date 1990 12 30 1998 so that's the start and the end filter which has been applied and once this is done you can also check your input messages which says when cell is selected show this input message enter a valid date so if you see here on the left there is a pop-up which is coming up which says enter a valid date now I can also say when user enters invalid data show this error alert so I can say stop I can say invalid entered and this is how I have set a rule so for example if I just do something like this and that says invalid date entered I can do a retry it will take me back here but unless and until I do not give the right format the date will not be accepted and again the same thing applies to all the cells similarly email so we are saying the email should have at the rate present in the value provided now for this we can use a formula and we can select well I would want to apply this rule to all these rows starting from C2 to C14 so let's get into data validation let's look in settings and here we are choosing custom now within custom I am choosing what is the formula so I am saying is number and then I am saying find at the rate for the rows C2 to C14 so the only thing we are concerned about here is the value should have an email icon you can input a particular message you can say what has to be done for error alert so for example we can basically go in here and we can say invalid email that's the title I'm giving and we can say email should contain at the rate so if I do this and if I say OK now you can test it so you can say A B C D and that says email should contain at the rate and basically that will not allow me to add the values so now you have the field called salary it says salary should be greater than 50,000 now we can limit the values by choosing a whole number so for example for salary I can go into data validation I can go into settings so here I can say something like decimal or I can go for whole number so both of the things are fine it depends on what kind of values get into this particular field so if I say whole number and if I say it has to be greater than 50,000 so I'm saying the minimum is 50,000 or I could have given a decimal and then I can say greater than less than equal or anything or even between so I can sell it greater than and then I can just say okay now for rank the rule is rank should be between 100 and 200 so again we can use a whole number so ranks will generally not be decimal so this would be whole number salary is can be a whole number or it could be decimals so we have chosen decimal here and in rank if you click on data validation I have chosen whole number I've set data between 100 and 200 input message nothing error alert nothing but that depends I can give this so this is how you can just do a simple data validation and control the values which land in the cell okay so now let's also understand how we can restrict the values in a particular cell which might be based on a list of items now for example here if you see I have two columns so one column basically has the values of city names and then you have places within that particular city so if I would want to implement a data validation based on this so for example if you see here city and that basically shows me 
only the four values which can be entered and if I go to place then it tells me for Maharashtra I can only enter Pune, Mumbai, Nasik. Now how do I do this? So say for example you take an empty field and you want to restrict the values of city names so I could select data validation I could basically select list and then it tells me you need to enter the list values that is the source so you click here and then I can just select these fields now if I do this and if I say okay it has implemented a data validation but if you look into this it will show me the same thing but then it shows me some empty cells which did not have any value so this is fine but it would be better if we do it in a different way so I can select this and I have already given my city names here so I can just do a data validation and here in the source let me get rid of this now I can just have my cursor here I can select these values and then if I say ok so now if you see my city names have been restricted to these values and that's how you can implement your data validation so I have this data validation here but I will get rid of this one by just doing a control Z now I'll come here and say for example I would want to implement the same data validation now the easiest way would be in doing this for all my four cities now if you see here I have data validation I could choose Bangalore and if you come and check here there is no data validation but we have implemented data validation here now how is that done so I could select this or for example I can go in here I can select data validation I can select list and then here in the source I will say for Bangalore the value should be these and then if I basically say ok now if we see these are the values which are fed into Bangalore so we could do this or like what we have done here so if you can check the data validation rule I have used list and then I have said indirect F2 so basically I am giving in a formula which relates to the value which is in for the city Maharashtra so we could do this or in a simpler way we could do this and then just drag and drop here so we could check for Maharashtra what are the values let's choose a different city so for example Kolkata and here I will choose now since we did a drag and drop it has basically taken the values of Bangalore so that's not right so we select this we go into data validation and here I can either feed in the values that is such as Bangalore I could basically say something like this Kolkata and I could say ok so now if you see it shows me the places in Kolkata now here we have let's choose a different city so for example let's go for Delhi and here I can go to data validation and I can just say Delhi so this is an easier way of doing it or if you remember the formula then what you can do is you can just give in indirect and then basically give the value of the cell for which you would want to keep in the values so this is how you can do list validation so you can provide a list of values and then you can restrict the values in a cell which should be belonging to a particular list so this is how you do a simple data validation by restricting the data in the form of a list now let's learn about pivot charts and tables which is one more very useful feature of Excel and which allows you to work with your data or perform data analysis now pivot table is a summary of your data it is used in cases where there are numerous rows and columns in your data set and it allows you to group your data in several ways so that you can derive meaningful information from it 
Now the visual representation of a pivot table is termed as a pivot chart. Now how do we do that? So let's see an example. Now here is some data. Here you see we have some row labels which basically gives me some category of items here. It also tells me the sum of sales and basically it gives me per item what is the total sum of sales which were made. Now how do I get this here? So for example if I would want to delete this and I would be interested in getting the total sales under each category of items. Now we know that we have different data here and it's huge. For example on the row end if I just do a control and right arrow it tells me what's my right last column and if I just do a control and down arrow it tells me there are 9994 rows. Now I can use this and what I can do is I can basically work on insert and go to pivot table. Now this basically tells you need to choose the range. Now since I have chosen my first row and first column it basically has selected the data and that's fine. Now do you want the result in a new worksheet? I'll say existing worksheet and I can choose a location. Now that basically needs me to select a field. Might be we can just select this field and that should be good enough. So for example if I close this or if I say OK so this is basically an indication that my pivot table will be created. Now what are the fields we are interested in? So as per the problem we need to find out what are the total sales for each category. So let's go in here and let's select the field category. Now as soon as you do that it shows that the rows which are being selected are for this column category and now we are interested in getting the sales so we would want the sales per category so let's select this so you see sum of sales is selected now close this and that's it that's that's your data so it shows you row labels it tells you what are the different categories and it also gives you sum of sales which is per category now this is one easy example where we have solved the problem where we have tried to find what were the total sales under each category of items. So for example let's have another data set. So again you can just check how many rows we have and it is basically the same 9994 and if I look in columns it basically shows me profit is the last column and here we would want to find out which category so for example let me get rid of this which subcategory of items sold the maximum under each category so we have some categories here which says furniture and it shows some subcategories and then it shows me office supplies and then some subcategories and same thing with technology now we know how we got this data but this is different than what we were seeing here so here we were just getting the categories but, but we did not have any breakdown of subcategories within this particular category and here you see there is a breakdown and then basically you can also apply a filter which basically says what is the data you want and if you are interested in finding out a particular value now how do we do this so for example let me get rid of this now we know how we can find out the category of items but we would want to find out which subcategory of items sold the maximum under each category so here we are not looking at sales but we are looking at the quantity okay so what we can do is we can go to the first row and first column click on insert click on pivot table data is already selected let's choose existing worksheet let's choose a location in our worksheet where we would want to have this so might be I can select this particular field and then just close this so it says this is the existing worksheet say ok and now you need to select your columns so for example if I would want the data for categories so I can select this now I know that within category these are the options which we have 
and then there is a subcategory. So let's select that. And if you see here, now we have the data which will be filtered. So based on your category and subcategory, and then we will choose quantity. So it automatically understands that this is something on which summation can be done. So let's select this and close on this. Now, if you see here, we have got our items where we can see the subcategories within a particular category. Now I can basically close this and that just shows me high level categories here. So here I can again select a particular row and column. I can go for either a new pivot table. So we could basically select this. The row is already selected. Existing worksheet is what I want. So now I will select this particular place. Say OK. Now we do the same thing like what we did earlier. So we will select category, subcategory and quantity. So the data has already come in. Just select this and now you already have all your data but this is not what we want we want to basically apply a filter to this now how do we do that so we can go for slicer so i can go for insert slicer and then it tells what are the subcategories which you are interested in so for example if i go for something like subcategory and say okay so this tells me what are the categories you are interested in? So for example, we know that furniture has furnishings with the highest value. So I can select say furnishings and then I was interested in office supplies. So within office supply, I can basically search for here binder. So I can just do a control and select binder and then I can also know for technology I can select phones so I'll say control and select phones and now if you see the filter has been applied and we have these subcategories which are selected so we have our data here now we don't need really this so I can just delete this and I have my data which shows me furniture being the main category and that has only furnishings office supply having binders and technology having phones and that basically is a filter applied on the result of your pivot so this is how we are seeing which subcategory of items were sold maximum for each category so this is how you can easily use pivot tables and you can do some analysis let's look at some more examples now Let's see if you have to answer this question which says which were the top three states for each region that made the highest average profit. Now how do we calculate that? So for example this is the data we have and as I have instructed earlier you can select the first row and first column. You can click on insert go into pivot table and that basically selects all your data we will choose the result should be in this existing worksheet so select this click here and then basically let's select this cell and i will say okay so now my pivot table will be here so we are interested in finding out top three states within each region which have made the highest profit or which have made the highest average profit so for that first we will select region so when we select region it shows here region and within region you will then select state so within every region you have multiple states so that's what we are selecting and then we are interested in looking at the profit so let's select profit and that automatically shows up here so we can now say close this so basically we have all the data but we are looking at the sum of profit but that's not what we want we are looking for top three states from each region that made the highest average profit now how do we change that so here we have sum of profit so i can do a right click and basically i can say summarize values by 
average so now I'm getting the average here and that basically tells per region I have the average profit but first is let's sort this data so let's go into sort more options and here I have average of profit or for example as I said you can select region say ok and now it is basically having the regions and then you have your state value so again we can do a sorting here and I can say let's go for more sort options I'll say descending the state values should be based on average profit so let's say ok and now if you see in particular region we have the data which has been sorted wherein you have the highest average profit on the top now what we can also do is we can basically then go for filtering we can say top 10 but I'm not interested in top 10 so I could reduce this to top 3 and this is the items average of profit say ok and now you see per region you have the data which is showing me top three states what are the average and then you are also looking at the subtotal so which basically says average profit for your west now if you would want to arrange this your west and south and east and central in a particular alphabetical order if you would want to sort it you can always do a sorting and you can choose sort z to a if that's what you would want to do or you can go for sorting more sort options and you want to sort the region which is as of now based on descending z to a let's make it ascending say okay and now you see the data has been filtered so it says per region now you can always select this and you can say what is this so this is basically your average of profit now we are looking at each region and the states the top three states as we wanted within a region and what is the average now we have one more question what is the percentage contribution of each subcategory of products under each category to the total sales so we know there are different products there are different categories and all the categories contribute to the total sales so we would want to find out what is the percentage contribution of each subcategory of products under each category so we not only want the category percentage but we would also want what is the contribution of each subcategory to each category to the total sales how do we do that so for that we need to again just place our cursor here or select the first row and first column click on your insert click on your pivot table and now the data is already selected existing worksheet place your cursor here and then let's select this cell say ok now your pivot table fields are here so we are interested in category so let's select category and then within a category we will have subcategories and we are interested in the sales data wherein it is already going to give us the sum of sales but we would want this in the form of percentage rather than just the sum now we can click here value field settings and it says if you would want to summarize this it says show value as and what are the values you would want so you can straight away go ahead here and say percentage of grand total so we could do that because we know we will get a sum of sales and grand total now I could basically say percentage of grand total say ok and then just close this so once you have closed this you see already the data is in percentage so now we have our data with subcategories but we also want the data to be sorted might be in a descending order which tells which subcategory is contributing more than others we can select how many subcategories we are interested in so we can basically select one of the subcategory cells right click now you have option filter 
and you have sorting so we can say more sort options now here I will say descending and you want the descending to be sum of sales which is already showing as percentage click on OK and now you see for each category it shows the percentage contribution towards the sales it shows the subcategories contribution to a particular category and also to total sales so technically speaking if you look at all these values which are subcategories and if you would total them that would be your total grand total so this is how we can solve a simple problem like this what is the percentage contribution of each subcategory of products under each category to the total sales the next question is which customer made the lowest profit in the home office segment in each state now here we know that we are looking for home office segment we are looking for customer which made the lowest profit we are also looking for the state as the main criteria so in each state we would look for home office segment and within that we would look for customer which has made the lowest profit that means the lowest value of the profit so how do we do this so let's say let's get into selecting our row and column we will go into insert I'll say pivot table I'll say existing worksheet and let me get my result here so let's say okay now that gives me the pivot table so the first thing is we are looking at per state and I would be interested in home office segment or I could first start with segment now here we have segment and in segment I can basically select home office so I can just do a uncheck and select home office only and now I can select state so that will be my subcategory within segment and then within state we would want to find out the customer so let's get the customer name and we are interested in finding out the lowest profit so let's select profit and here we have sum of profit so the fields are selected close this and now you have your data which basically shows me the names of customers which made the profit but it's it's not sorted so we can sort this and we have state entries also so that's fine so what I can do is here I can basically say sorting go to more sort options I can say I want to do a descending or I want to do an ascending an ascending based on sum of profit so let's do that now you see the topmost value is the lowest value per state within home office segment now what we also want is we just want one value per state so how do we do that so we can just go for filtering go for top 10 values I'm interested in bottom value and in that also I'm looking for only the lowest value so let's select one say OK and now you see we have data for home office segment per state customer who has made the lowest profit so we have easily answered this question using our pivot table now say for example we have a question which says find the sales made in each quarter of 2016 for all the regions so the data has to be divided quarterly and use order year as a slicer we can do that by selecting what data we would want to slice and then we would want to create a pivot chart also so for example how do we do that so for example I will get rid of this I will get rid of this my pivot chart which we can recreate so find the sales made in each quarter of 2016 for all the regions so this is what we want now how do we do this so for example let's select this we will do a insert pivot table we will basically say existing worksheet and then I can select this particular cell I'll say okay and now 
I am interested in data quarterly. So first let's select our field here. So we should basically have if all our fields are selected, say for example, if I say order date now, you see we have quarters and years which are selected. Now we could be selecting these fields which says quarters, years and if I would want data to be filtered based on years, I could do that or I could get rid of years. So I have quarters, I have order date. So that's being already selected. Now, what else we need? We need to find out for every region. So let's select the region and we can also add region as a column here. So that will basically give me all the regions as different columns. And then finally, we want the sales. So let's select this and now Let's look what we have. So if you see here, we have our data, which is for each quarter. It gives me the total data, but what we would be interested in is not looking at the total data, but we are only interested in quarter of 2016. Now, how do we do that? So what we do here is we have row labels. So let's click on this. So we have date filters. And then in date filters, we can go for between and then we will say 2016 and the value has to be one. And then let's select this and let's change this to 2016. And this is 12th month. And then we can say 31. So we are saying the date has to be 2016. And it basically says not a valid date. So let's select, let's select a particular date and see. So the month has to be here. So let's change this and let's make it date and say, okay. And now we have our data, which is for 2016. So for example, I could basically select this and here, I could be looking at what are the filters we have. So it says clear filter from order data. So we have applied the filter on order date. And these are your date filters, which is basically date 16. Oh, this is wrong. So this one has to be changed to 2016. So select this. And now we have our data for 2016. So we have found the sales made in each quarter of 2016 for all the regions, the grand total for a particular quarter. If we are looking at the value or for individual months in a particular quarter and we have sliced the data. Now we could have also introduced a slicer by selecting which field we would want to implement. So for example, if I would select a particular field and then I could click on slicer, I could choose, I would want to slice the date based on order date and then could have done it. Or we have just given the date for 2016. Now we just need to plot a graph for this and that's very easy. So you just need to select the complete pivot data and here you have the chart options. So let's go for line chart and that basically shows me the line chart. So we can select this. We can just drag and drop it here and then we can basically check if that is showing us the data. So if you see here, this is line chart where it has divided the regions in different colors. So we have all the regions we could filter out in pivot chart a particular region. We have the quarterly time here in order data. The filter is applied. It says it is 2016 in quarters. It tells me it is 16. So we have our data. We have created a pivot chart and basically we have sliced the data for 2016. Let's answer one more question and that's finding the profit made in each year 
for all the categories of products in east and west regions only and then we would want to create a histogram for the same pivot table so histogram usually gives us the frequencies so let's look at how do we calculate the profit made in each year for all the categories so what i can do is i can basically select my row id here and now i'll do a pivot table so the data is already selected i'll choose existing worksheet let's select this particular cell say okay now what are we interested in now if you look at the fields we don't see any years or quarters and so on so for example here i can just choose order date and then basically i can choose say for example years or quarters the data which is coming out from my order date so here i will just select years now then i have my order date so we are interested in the years orders and we are interested in let's look at our column or the question what we had here so we have years find the profit made in each year so let's select profit so that basically says sum of profit but then i'm on also interested in for all the categories of products so what i can do is here i have my field which is category and that i'll add to the columns so that shows me what are the different categories and this looks fine now i'm also interested in east and west regions so that is basically in the region so either we could add a slicer or we could do a filtering here by adding the filters so first is i'll click on region and here it says select all i'm only interested in east and west so let's select this take this put it here let's say okay and now we have the data which has been filtered based on the region so here we have region so you can always look at the filter it is east and west and we have our year data per year we have different categories you can always look at what are these column labels so this is my different categories and this is the profit per category and then you have your grand total so we have already our data now let's say close this so we have our data for all these years different categories the profits made per year and if i would want i could go into an year and i could look into different months so that also is showing up and now we would want to basically plot a histogram with this data so i can just place my cursor here i can select this and then i can go into insert and here i have different options so we can go for bar chart we can go for insert hierarchy chart we can go into waterfall funnel stock surface or radar chart so there are different options what you have here and we will go for a simple histogram which is two dimensional let's select this and here you see you can obviously select different regions you have your years which shows up you have your order date and then you have your categories which can be chosen for your histogram or for your bar chart and that basically is how you use your pivot table you use some calculations and then you can plot your needed graph to visualize the data and understand it in a better way so what is excel power query power query is an advanced feature of microsoft excel that allows you to prepare your data for analysis you can perform numerous text computations and numerical analysis to make your data more powerful and informative excel power query is a data preparation and transformation engine it allows you to carry out the extract, transform and load operations on the datasets from multiple sources. Now, let's look at the challenges solved by Power Query. Earlier, in Excel there was difficulty in data connections. Now, using Power Query, you can connect to a broad range of data sources such as relational databases, web files, text, CSV, 
JSON files and even fetch data in the cloud. Volume, variety and velocity are the characteristics that define big data. It was a major problem to handle such data. Now Power Query enables you to transform your data to an appropriate size. It also allows you to work on any shape of data from any source. Earlier, updating your data and refreshing it in real time was an issue. Using Power Query, a repeatable process query is adopted to update the data in real time and in the future. In Excel, it was not so easy to reshape, transform and manipulate data. But using Power Query provides a highly interactive experience and sophisticated tools to prepare your data. Now, from Excel 2016 onwards, Power Query on Windows has been fully integrated into Excel. But in Excel 2010 and 2013 for Windows, Power Query is a free add-in. You can go ahead and download the link. Once installed, the Power Query tab will be visible in the Excel ribbon. Now coming to the features of Power Query. So Excel Power Query allows you to clean, transform, manipulate and process your data for analysis. It helps you to automate repetitive tasks that you want to do it over and over again. You can search for data sources and make connections as and when you want. Power Query helps you to prepare and shape the data in the right format for performing analysis. And finally, once your data is ready, you can share your findings or use your query to create interactive reports and dashboards. Now let's have a glance at the demo that we are going to work on in this video. So we'll look at how to load data from different sources. You will understand how to extract tables from web files. So we'll extract tables present on Wikipedia pages. Then you'll learn how to sort and filter data. Up next, you'll see how to group your data, how to split a column into multiple columns, and then pivot and unpivot your table. Then you're going to work on date columns and make some transformations. Understand how to append tables and merge tables vertically and horizontally. Now let's open MS Excel and start with importing a simple text file. So you can see here I have my Excel file opened and in the middle you can see I have my employee txt file. Now this is a comma separated file meaning that the values are separated by commas as you can see it here. The columns have been separated by commas and all the values have a comma between them. Now this text file has information about the name, age, company and the city to which the employee belongs to. Let's see how easily you can import this EMP text file into MS Excel. Here I'm using Excel 365 or Office 365 where Power Query on Windows has been fully integrated into this version of Excel. So what I'll do is first let's go to the data tab and you have this section called get and transform data. So I'll click on get data. Under get data I'll go to from file and select from text slash CSV. Once I click on it, it will ask me to give the location where the file is there. So my file is on desktop. I'll click on Power Query Files and here you can see I have my employee TXT file. You can see the type here. It says text document. Click on EMP and hit import. Now this will take some time to import the file onto Excel. It's establishing a connection you can see. There you go. So here you can see the file name emp.txt. You can see the file origin. As I said the delimiter is comma and we have the data type detection. And here you can see we have our text file. So Excel Power Query feature has automatically detected the column names. So we have name, age, company and city as our columns and these are the values. Now let's hit load. So this will load all the rows and the columns onto Excel. There you go. It was really quick. Excel has automatically loaded our text file. Now you can see here we have another tab called queries and connections. So we have made one query and have loaded the employee data. It gives a preview also. You can see it here. And if needed later, you can go to edit and change some values that we'll see later. Now you can use this data to create simple visualizations. So let me show you 
how to do it so let's first select the data and we'll go to the insert tab under insert tab I'll click on recommended charts let's say I want to know how many employees belong to a particular city so I'll click on the second chart which says the count of name by city and I'll click on OK here you can see we have a nice clustered bar chart and you can see in Bangalore there were five employees in Hyderabad we had two and in Nasik we had one you can see the count here this is a pivot table if you go back to our actual data here you can see in Bangalore we had Vidya, Sonam, Avinash, Varun and Himani and there were two more people from Hyderabad and one from Nasik so you can use the Excel Power Query feature to import data onto Excel and make some visualizations. Now, if you want to fetch some data that is present on the web or on the internet, Excel Power Query features and functionalities can help you import those data as well. We will now see how to import data, specifically a table that is present on the web. Here, I'll be using a Wikipedia article on the list of European Cup and UEFA Champions League finals. Let me show you the page first. So this is my Wikipedia page on the list of European Cup and UEFA Champions League finals. If I scroll down, you can see all the details here. And I would like to import this table, which has the list of all the finals. So we have columns like season, winners, scoreline, runners-up, venue and attendance. Let's import this table onto Excel. So I'll copy this URL first. Now let me open a new sheet. I'll go to sheet 1 and then on the data tab under the get data section I'll go to from other sources and here I have from web which allows me to import data from the web. Either you can follow this path or if you see here there's an option to get data from the web. If I click on this it is asking me to enter the URL so I'll paste the URL of the Wikipedia page here and let's click on OK. Now it's navigating and OK. You can see Power Query feature in Excel has given us a list of tables which you can see here. We have something called as document, there's a key table and here you can see there's one table which was extracted from the Wikipedia page and the table which I am interested in is this table which has the list of European Cup finals. You can see it here. Excel Power Query feature has automatically detected these rows and it has given a list of columns as well. You can see these are the columns. Now we'll explore the transform data tab present in the Power Query. Now if I click on transform data it will take me to the Power Query editor. Let me just click on refresh. Now this is the most important section. Now, using the Power Query editor you can clean your data, filter your data, manipulate your data and make it ready for analysis. Now let's explore a few tabs available here. So we have a home tab that has a query section you can see you can reduce rows, manage columns, sort the data, transform the data, combine different tables. Now there's another tab called transform which allows you to select your data type, transpose your rows and columns, pivot and unpivot your columns and here you can see you can find out some summary statistics and you can manage your date values as well. Now if you want to add some new columns to your data you can do that as well and you also have a view tab. Now here if you see the first two rows the values are the same you can see season season these are all repeated which we actually don't need and these are pretty similar to our column names. Similarly if I scroll down you see there are some rows which have null values. So actually these 
rows do not add up any value or do not add any value to our data so we'll clean this data first so let's see how to do it now if you want to remove certain rows in the table what you can do is go to the home tab and under reduce rows click on remove rows and then choose remove top rows if I select remove top rows it will ask me how many rows do you want to remove from the top you can see it here I'll give I want to remove the top two rows now let's click on OK you will see that the Excel Power Query editor has removed the first two rows and on the right you can see the steps that were applied you can see it here previously we had these two rows which were redundant and once we applied the step it has removed the first two rows similarly let's go down and remove the last one two three four five so we are going to remove the last seven rows from the table so again I'll go to reduce rows and click on remove rows now this time I'll select remove bottom rows and here I'll choose I want to delete seven rows from the table from the bottom I click on OK if you see the last seven rows have been deleted now let me show you the last row which is this one so the last season of UEFA Champions League was held in 2020 which is this year and Bayern Munich won the Champions League against a French team that was Paris Saint Germans by a score of 1-0 now if you see the last value that is the attendance you can see the value is 0 which means there were no spectators in the stadium it was because of the COVID conditions now let's do some more manipulation to our data suppose this time I want to add a new column let's say a stadium name by extracting values from the venue column so let me just show you the venue column so this is our venue column so the first value is the stadium name then we have the city in which the stadium is there and finally we have the country name so I want to extract only the stadium name so you can see we have some stadiums like Santiago Bernabeu there's Wembley, San Siro and other stadiums so I want to extract only the stadium names so let's see how to do that I'll click on the venue column and go to add column tab under add column here you can see we have extract if I click on this drop down there is an option to select text before delimiter so if I choose text before delimiter here I'll give my delimiter as comma so everything before the first comma will be considered as the stadium name now let me click on OK now here you can see under applied steps it says inserted text before delimiter if I scroll to the right you can see the last column has our stadium names let me double click on this and change this to stadium name column and hit enter even this step is applied here you can see renamed columns similarly let's explore a few more features now I want to add a new column called stadium city so if you consider this venue column whatever is there between the two commas is the stadium city so for example Santiago Bernabeu is in Madrid similarly Wembley Stadium is in London San Siro is in Milan so these medial values I want to extract into a new column called as stadium city so let's see how to do it so I'll click on the venue column and go to extract and again I'll select the extract tab and here now I'll choose text between delimiters and my first delimiter I'll give is a comma and a space 
you can see here all the values have a comma and a space and my end delimiter will be another comma then I'll click on OK this will add a new column to the extreme right of the table you can see here we have text between delimiters and it has extracted the stadium city let me go ahead and rename this column as stadium city and hit enter you can see the applied step here now I want to split the score column into two columns so here we have the score column and the left value presents the number of goals that were scored by the winning team and the right value presents the number of goals that were scored by the losing team so here I'll split the column into two columns as winner score and loser score so what I'll do is select this column and go to the home tab under the home tab we have split column I'll select split column and then choose by delimiter so automatically Excel Power Query detects that this dash is my delimiter and I'll split at each occurrence of the delimiter let's click on OK now you can see the scores column has been split into two it has renamed the column as score.1 and score.2 what I'll do is I'll go ahead and we'll rename this column as winner score and this will rename it to loser score I'll hit enter and I have renamed it successfully next let's change the winners team and the runners up team values to uppercase so suppose I want to change all the values or the club names of the winners team to uppercase so what I can do is I'll select this column and go to the transform tab under transform tab I have this option called format so here I'll click on format and then you can see I can change the case to lowercase uppercase capitalize each word so here I want to make all the winner teams as uppercase I'll select uppercase there you go we have successfully converted all the winner team names to uppercase similarly let's do it for the runners up team as well so here I have my runners up team I'll go to the transform tab click on format and select uppercase now we saw how to do some simple manipulation of our data so we created a few columns split a few columns now to save all this I have to go to the home tab and then click on close and load this will take some time and load our data onto this Excel sheet you can see here it's loading the data this will take a bit of time there you go Excel Power Query feature has successfully perform some manipulations on our data some calculations on our data and then it has saved the final version and loaded it onto Excel now using this clean data we can do some analysis let's say I want to find the seasons in which the winners team scored more than three goals so we have a problem statement at hand where we want to find the seasons in which the winner team had more than three goals scored so what you can do is select any cell in this data and go to the insert tab and click on pivot table here I'll click on existing worksheet and then I'll give my location I'll place my pivot table somewhere here and click on OK alright now since I want to know the seasons I'll drag season on to row and I'll also drag the winners team column onto rows then I'll choose my winner score under values here you can see we have the pivot table ready now we need to filter this table to see all the winning teams that scored more than three goals so what I'll do is 
I'll select this winner score column and place it under filters and here you can see I have my filter let me click on this drop down and I'll select multiple items from this multiple items I'll choose 4 5 and 7 because these values are greater than 3 and click on OK here you can see I have filtered my pivot table and to the left you can see the season and the winner team that had scored more than 3 goals in the finals alright similarly you can perform some more analysis suppose I want to know how many times Real Madrid won the championship so let's see I'll click on one cell in the data set go to the insert tab and click on pivot table I'll choose existing worksheet and give my location here let's say I want to place my pivot table here I'll click on OK alright so the question we have is how many times have Real Madrid won the championship so I'll choose the winners team column and place it under rows and let's say we'll select the winner score as well and let's convert this winner score from sum to let's say count and click on OK and since I want to check only for Real Madrid so what I'll do is I'll go to the insert tab and I'll insert a slicer here I'll choose winner teams as my slicer and click on OK and out of this I want to choose only Real Madrid so I'll select Real Madrid you can see it here Real Madrid have won the championship 13 times ok let's say you want to compress your data and remove unnecessary columns without losing any information you can do that using a feature in the Power Query editor called Unpivot to perform this task we'll use a census data of India from Wikipedia so let me first show you the Wikipedia page so this is my Wikipedia article which says list of states in India by past population and if I scroll down you can see it here there's a table which says by past population from 1947 to 2011 so there are a few columns like rank this state or union territory and we have population starting from 1951 till 2011 which was our last census here you can see if I scroll further there are nearly 29 states and we have seven union territories so we will extract this table and load into Excel first okay so let me click on a new sheet and we'll follow the same drill I'll go to my data tab and click on get data under get data I'll go to from other sources and click on from web here it will ask me to provide the URL link of the Wikipedia page so I'll paste the URL here and click on OK Now once I have done that, it will load a few tables onto Excel. You can see there are a few tables here. I'll click on the first one. So we have our table here. Now let's do some transformation to this data. This opens in the Power Query Editor. Okay, I'll click on Refresh first. So it'll take some time to refresh the entire data. Okay, we are done. Now if you see this data clearly the first row in this table is not necessary at all because these are our column names so we also have our column headers already present so let's go ahead and delete the first row so we'll go to the home tab under remove rows I'll click on remove top rows now I'll give my number of rows as one so we want to remove the first row only I'll click on OK you can see the first row has been deleted if I scroll further I actually don't need the last row as well which is the total so what we can do is we can also remove the last row from the bottom so I'll select one click on OK you can see the step has been applied and you don't see the last row that was the total row anymore 
So the task that I want to do here is, I want to compress all these columns, which are basically the population columns. So I'll select my state or union territory column and go to the transform tab and here I have the option to unpivot columns. So I'll click on this drop down and select unpivot other columns. You can see here the step has been applied and all the population column from 1951 till 2011 have been unpivoted. If you want you can go ahead and rename these columns. Let's say I'll write it as population column and let's say this is I'll rename it to total population value. Alright, now we are done with our preparation of data. Let's go to the home tab and click on close and load. Now this will take some time to load the data onto Excel. Alright, so we have our census data here. So first you can see rank 1 is Uttar Pradesh and we have the population starting from 1951 till 2011. Then we have for Maharashtra. If I scroll down you can see the other states. We have Tamil Nadu, Rajasthan, there's Karnataka. If I scroll further we have Odisha, there's Telangana, Kerala. Now if you see here the population values from 1951 till 2011 for the Telangana state are all NA which means there was no data available now this is because Telangana was only formed in 2014 so there was no census for this state. Let's continue with our demo and let's explore a few more features and functionalities of Power Query Editor. Now the next table we are going to use is an AdventureWorks customer table. Now this data set is provided by Microsoft for practitioners who want to learn Power BI, Excel or similar technologies and want to do some manipulation, some calculation, some data analysis stuff. So let me go to a new sheet and let's import the AdventureWorks customer data set. It's a CSV file onto Excel first. So I'll go to my data tab and click on get data. From here I'll go to from file and choose from text slash CSV. You can see it here in my Power Query files folder I have my AdventureWorks customer table. I'll select this and click on import. This will take some time to load the data set. You can see the preview of the data set here. So we have columns like the customer key, we have the prefix of the customer name, the first name, the last name of the customer, date of birth, marital status. If I go to the right, we have annual income, total children, education level, occupation and homeowner column as well. So let's click on transform data. Here we'll learn a few more features of Power Query. Okay, we have our data on our Power Query editor. So first what I'll show you is, let's change the prefix column, the first name column and the last name column to proper case. So you can see it here, the prefix, first name and last name columns are all in upper case. Now if you want to change the values to proper case, just hit control and select the three columns and go to the transform tab. Under transform tab you have format. So if you click on format here you can see we have lower case, upper case. Now proper case is to capitalize each word. So I will click on capitalize each word. You can see it here now. We have converted the prefix first name and last name column into prop case. The next step I'm going to show you is let's merge all the three columns, the prefix column, the first name column and the last name column into one full name column. So what I'll do is I'll select the three columns and then let's go to add column and under add column we have this option called merge columns. Let's hit merge columns. Okay. Now it's asking you to give the separator. I'll select my separator as a space. 
and click on OK. Okay, so before click on OK, I want to change my new column name from merged to let's say full name. And now let's click on OK. You can see here it says inserted merged column. And if I go to my right, you can see it here we have a full name column. Now, if you want to shift the location of the full name column, you can do that as well. Just hold this and keep on dragging to the left. This will move the entire table to the right and you can place it wherever you want. So I want to place it, let's say here. Okay. Now actually I don't want all these columns, so let's delete it. So I click on this and I'll right click and click on remove. You can see we have removed the prefix column. Similarly, let's remove the other two columns. You can either right click and do or go to the home tab and then select remove columns. All right. Now, let's say we want to add a domain name column from AWS customers by extracting the characters between at the rate and dot com. So actually I'm talking about the email address. From this email address, we want to create a new column called as domain name. For that we'll extract characters that are present between at the rate and dot com. So let's see how to do it. I'll select the email address column and then I'll go to add column. Under add column, I'll click on extract. And this time we want to extract between two delimiters. I'll, so I'll select text between delimiters and I'll give my starting delimiter as at the rate and my end delimiter would be dot com. Now let's click on OK. So this will insert a new column to the extreme right. You can see we have our domain name. Let's go ahead and change the column name to domain name and hit enter. All right. You can see the step has been applied. Now we are done with our preparation of customers table. Let's just go to the home tab and click on close and load. So all the transformation that we did in the Power Query editor will reflect here. So you can see we have our full name column and if you see we have our domain name as well. Okay, now using the Power Query editor, you can perform some statistical analysis. Now let's explore those statistical features. For this, we'll be using another dataset called AdventureWorks product dataset. Again, this dataset is also provided by Microsoft. So let's go to the new sheet and here I'll go to the data tab, click on get data. Under from files, I click on text slash CSV. Here you can see we have AdventureWorks products. I click on import. Let's click on transform data. So we have our data loaded on to the Power Query editor. The data is mostly clean, so let's not alter this data. Let's straight away go ahead and explore some of the statistical features that we have here. Now let's say if you want to find the total number of product names in the product table. We have this product name column and say if you want to find the total number of product names in the table, how to do it. So what you can do is click on this product name column then go to the transform tab now in the transform tab you have an option called statistics click on this drop down and select count values now this will open another window that will return the total number of products in the table you can see the value here it says 293 now to move back to the query editor we have to cancel this step here so let's just click cancel or close we are back again. All right. Now let's say you want to calculate the average product price from the product table. So if I move to the right, 
you have a column called product price. So let's see what is the average product price from the product table. So I'll select this product price column, go to the transform tab, under statistics, I'll select average. So this will give me the average product price which is 714.4373. You can consider any unit you want. Let's say this is in dollars. Now again, we have to cancel this step to move back. Okay. Now, if you want to find the maximum and minimum product price, you can do that as well. So, let me select my column product price and go to the transform tab. Under the transform tab, we'll click on this statistic drop down and let's say I'll select minimum. So, this will give me the minimum product price which is 2.29. Similarly, if you want to find the maximum product price, so select this product price column, go to the transform tab and then choose maximum. So this is the maximum product price in the product table we have. Let's cancel this step. Okay. Now you can also round the product cost and product price column to two decimal places. So if I show you both the columns, you have your product cost and you have the product price column. You can see the floating values or the decimal points are not constant, it's varying. So let's limit it to two decimal places. What you can do is, select both the columns and then go to the transform tab. In the transform tab you have here rounding. I click on this drop down and select round. Now here I'll give my decimal places as 2. If I click on OK you can see here both the columns the product cost and the product price column have been rounded up to two decimal places. I can scroll down, you can see all the values have been rounded up to two decimal places. Alright. Now, let's say you want to add a column called discount price column by multiplying 0.9 to the product price column. And let's say you also want to round that new column to two decimal places. So, how to do it? So, we want to give a discount of 10%. So I'll select this product price column, go to add column and then I'll choose custom column. Here we'll write a formula. So I'll give my new column name as discount price and my formula would be I'll select product price, I'll click on insert and then I'll multiply this product price by 0.9 so this will give me my 10% discount on the product price and click on OK you see here we have a new column added which is discount price so if the product price is 34.99 if you give a 10% discount it's 31.491 alright now the next question was to change the or round the decimal places to 2. So I'll go to the transform tab under rounding I'll click on round. Let's say I'll give 2 and click on OK. So even this has rounded the discount price column to 2 decimal places. Now we are done with our mathematical operation on this product data set. So we saw how to find sum, average, count, how to round up values, how to add a new custom column. So let's go ahead and close it and load it onto Excel. You see here we have our new product table added here and the last column if you see it's the discount column that we added. Okay, now it's time for us to explore another feature so we'll use a table called AdventureWorks calendar table which has basically a date column and let's see how using Power Query you can prepare that data as well and make some manipulations, some calculations. So let me go ahead and import AdventureWorks calendars table. Again this data set is provided by Microsoft. So I'll go to my new sheet and I'll go to the data tab, click on get data 
and from here I'll click on from text slash CSV and you can see I have my calendar table here I click on import now this will open in the query editor you see here this data set has only one column which is a date column so let's click on transform data okay now if you see here the first row is actually the column name so let's do the transformation here let's push this as the column name so I'll go to the home tab and under home tab you have this option called use first row as headers I'll select this you see here we have the column name as date now before making any operation let's see if all the fields are available you see here if I click on the date drop down year month quarter weekday day everything has been shaded out and I can't access this the reason is the date settings are not correct so we'll change the regional settings let me show you how to do it so we'll go to file and I'll select options and settings and go to query options under query options we have something called as regional settings here under regional settings we'll select English United States instead of English India so I'll just scroll down and here we have English United States and I click on OK now once this is done I'll go to my data type and I'll select date as my data type I'll choose replace current OK now you can see my date column has been formatted if I go to the date tab you can see I have access to all this now let's do some operations on this date column let's say you want to find the earliest and the latest date from AW calendars table or the adventure box calendar table so what you can do is select this column go to date drop down under transform and here we have the option of earliest and latest so if I click on earliest this will show you the last date which was 1st of January 2015 let me close this similarly you can see the most recent date I'll go to the date drop down and click on latest and you have 30 June 2017 as the latest date I'll close this now let's add a new column say day name start of the week and others so I'll select my date column go to add column here under add column I have my option to select the day name the week name and others so I'll click on this date drop down and under day let's say I want to choose name of day this returns the day name similarly let's say I'll want to find out the start of the week you can see we have the start of the week column or start of week column now one thing to notice here is in this power query editor the week starts on a Sunday now suppose you want to start your week on a Monday you can do some transformations on this formula tab so here in the formula bar you can add a 1 here to make sure your week starts on a Monday so if I hit enter you will see all these values will change you can see it's 28 4 and 11 this will become 29 5 and 12 let's hit enter you can see it here your start of the week is on a Monday now there's another method to make sure your week starts on a Monday let's cancel this step okay I have to insert it once again so I'll go to date and here I'll choose start of week now the week starts on a Sunday so one more method is to add day dot Monday you can see automatically power query is giving me a suggestion so I'll hit tab to finish it 
and I'll hit enter. Now you can see the values have changed and our week starts on a Monday. Now let's say we want to add a few more columns like start of month, name of month, start of year and the year value. So you can just click on the date column or select the date column. Go to the transform tab. Okay, not the transform tab. Let's go to the add column tab. And here let's say I'll choose year. So we have all the year values and similarly let's say I want to know the start of the year. Now you can do a few more transformations. Let's say I want to know the month. Now here it gives us 1 which means January, that's February, March and so on and so forth. Let's say we'll do one more. I click on this, go to my date drop down and here I'll choose let's say I want to know the day of year all right now we are done with all our transformation and preparing our data on our date field so let me just go to the home tab I'll click on close and load now this will load the data set onto Excel you can see it here we have the data ready now you can use this data to make some analysis draw a pivot table, draw a pivot chart and do a whole lot of things. Now while working on a project, it is possible that not all your data will be in a single file. It could be stored in multiple files. So it's important to combine and bring all your data together. Now we will see how to join your data vertically. I have my data present in a CSV folder. So let me show you the folder first. So this is my CSV folder. Let me open it. And I have some files. These are named as project 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5. Let me open just one of the project files. It has a very small quantity of data. You can see it has a month column and an amount column. Let me close this. And let me show it to you again. Let's open project 4. All the files have the same number of columns you can see this also has a month column and an amount column now we'll combine all this data together and load it into excel let's see how to do it so i'll open a new sheet and i'll go to my data tab and click on get data then i'll go to from file and this time i'll choose from folder now this will ask me to give the folder location or the path location where my csv files are so I'll choose browse and here you can see I have my CSV file. I'll just double click on it and click on open. Now it has selected my file path or the folder path. Then I'll click on OK. You can see these are the files you have project one.xls project2.xls and so on. I'll click on this combine drop down and I'll hit combine and transform. Now this will give you the preview of one of the data files. You will see it now. You can see it here it says sheet 1. Okay. Now it's processing all the data files present in that CSV folder and this will be uploaded onto our Power Query Editor. Now you can see here on the Power Query Editor all my data files have been combined vertically. Here you can see the month column. On the extreme right it's the amount column and to the extreme left we have the source name or the source file where the data came from. So first is project 1, then we have project 2, if I scroll down we have project 3 files, project 4 and similarly we have project 5. Now this is one way in which you can merge your tables vertically. So we are done with it. Let's just go to the home tab and click on close and load. All the transformations that were applied you can see it here. We have our final table and we have successfully combined 
five Excel files. Again, you can also join your data horizontally. This would be like an SQL join where the data is present in multiple files or sheets. Based on a common key column, you can join the tables. So you can perform a left join, a right join, an inner join based on the problem that you are trying to solve. So let's merge two tables based on a column. I'll show the data set first. It's an Excel file which has three worksheets. So here is my Excel file which we'll be using to merge our data horizontally. You can see there are three worksheets. The first one is year 11 which has data regarding the student name, the gender of the student and the course the student had opted for. Similarly, we have another for 2012 or year 12. We have the student name, gender as well as the course. And finally, we have a courses table or a courses sheet which has all the details regarding the course. So we have the course name, the teacher who teaches or teacher who taught that course. We have the lesson type, the number of credits and the assignment type. Now we'll use this data sets to load it onto Excel using Power Query. So I am on my Excel sheet. Let's just open a new sheet. I'll go to the data tab and here I'll click on get data and this time I'll choose from Excel workbook and I'll select my file which is students and courses. I click on import. So we'll just see how to import two tables and join them horizontally. So let me first select the courses sheet and I'll click on transform data. Now this has loaded the courses table onto Power Query Editor. The table looks fine. We have the course column, teacher, everything is fine. Now let's load one more table and then we'll merge it. So here under the home tab you have a section called new source. I'll click on file. I'll again select my students and courses and click on import. And this time let's choose another table let's say year 11 which has the column name as student, gender and course. I click on OK. Now it has successfully loaded this table onto Power Query Editor. Now if you say this, the first row is actually our column names. So I'll go to the home tab and select use first row as headers. So this will push the first row to the column names. You can see we have done it successfully. We have my student name, the gender column and the course column. Now let's merge it. So if you see here in the home tab, we have a section called merge queries. Let's click on this drop down and select merge queries. Here I have my table which is year 11 and let's choose one more table that is courses. Now the kind of join I'll choose as left outer join which means it will take all the rows from the first table and matching records from the second table. Here I need to select the common key column. So if you see both the tables we have the course column as the common key column. So I'll select this and now you can see there's a tick mark which means it has selected the rows and the column successfully. You can see it says the selection matches 175 or 175 rows from the first table and let's click on OK. Let's just expand this and click on OK. If I scroll to the right you can see I have successfully merged both the tables. Now if you want you can remove unnecessary rows or columns. Suppose if you see I have the course column from the year 11 table and here also I have the course column. Now this is redundant. Let's just remove one of the columns. I'll just select this column. I'll go to remove columns and I'll select remove columns. Okay. The rest looks fine. We have successfully 
merged both the tables by using a left outer join. Let's just click close and load. Now this will take some time to load our data onto Excel. You can see it here. We have successfully loaded it onto Excel. Now we are done with our demo part. Now let's just see what all we have done in our demo. So I'll go to my first sheet. Here you can see we had imported a simple text file first and then we plotted a graph which is a pivot chart. Then you saw how to upload a file from the web. So here we imported a UEFA Champions League table which was present on Wikipedia and then we plotted some graphs and charts. You can see we made some analysis using pivot tables and then we imported another web file which was based on a population data and we used the unpivot option or the unpivot feature in the Power Query to reduce the number of columns. Then we made some calculations to our customer table which was from AdventureWorks. Then we used another table called the products table. Here we saw some statistical calculations and we added a column called discount price where we used conditional operations. And then you saw how we manipulated a date column and then we saw how to append and merge multiple tables. Business intelligence is a set of processes and techniques to analyze raw data and extract information that helps drive business decisions. It helps you keep track of business data and draw valuable insights. There are several tools that play a key role in business intelligence. Some of the popular tools are Power BI, Tableau and ClickView. Hi guys, welcome to this tutorial on what is Power BI. In this video, you will learn why Power BI is needed, what is Power BI, the various features of Power BI and the different components of Power BI. Later, you will look at the architecture of Power BI, what Power BI service is and how to create a Power BI dashboard. Finally, you will understand a case study on Meyer and do a demo using Power BI. Now let's understand why Power BI is needed. First, Power BI has the ability to access vast volumes of data from multiple sources. It allows you to view, analyze and visualize huge quantities of data that cannot be opened in Excel. Some of the important data sources available in Power BI are Excel, CSV, XML, JSON, PDF, etc. Second, Power BI provides an easy to use drag and drop tool with features and functionalities that allow you to copy all formatting across similar visualizations. Power BI has exceptional integration with Excel. It helps you gather, analyze, publish and share Excel business data. Power BI helps to accelerate big data preparation with Azure. Using Power BI with Azure allows you to analyze and share vast volumes of data. Azure Data Lake can reduce the time it takes to get insights and increase collaboration between business analysts, data engineers and data scientists. Power BI allows you to get insights from data and turn insights into actions to take data-driven business decisions. Finally, Power BI allows you to perform real-time stream analytics. It fetches data from multiple sensors and social media sources to get access to real-time analytics. So you are always ready to make business decisions. Now let's see what Power BI is. Power BI is a business analytics service provided by Microsoft that lets you visualize your data and share insights. It converts data from different sources to build interactive dashboards and BI reports. As you can see, we have an Excel data about sales. Using this data, Power BI helps you build different charts and graphs to visualize the data. Now that we have understood what Power BI is, let us look at the important features of Power BI. First is Power BI Desktop. Power BI Desktop is a free software that you can download and it allows you to build reports by accessing data easily. For using Power BI Desktop, you do not need advanced report designing or query skills to build a report. Second, as already discussed, Power BI supports stream analytics. From factory sensors to social media sources, Power BI assists in real-time analytics to make timely decisions. Third, support for multiple data sources is one of the major features of Power BI. You can access various sources of data such as Excel, CSV, SQL Server, web files, etc. to create interactive visualizations. And finally, custom visualization. Custom visualization is another vital feature of Power BI. While dealing with complex data, Power BI's default standard might not be enough in some cases. In that case, you can access the custom library of visualization that meets your needs. Let us jump into discussing the various components of Power BI. As you can see, 
There are six major components of Power BI. Now let's discuss them one by one. First is Power Query. Power Query is the data transformation and mashup engine. It enables you to discover, connect, combine and refine data sources to meet your analysis need. It can be downloaded as an add-in for Excel or can be used as part of Power BI Desktop. Second, we have Power Pivot. Power Pivot is a data modeling technology that lets you create data models. It also allows you to establish relationships and create calculations. It uses Data Analysis Expression Language or DAX to model simple and complex data. Third, we have Power View. Power View is a technology that is available in Excel, SharePoint, SQL Server and Power BI. It lets you create interactive charts, graphs, maps and other visuals that brings your data to life. Next, we have Power Map. Microsoft's Power Map for Excel and Power BI is a 3D data visualization tool that lets you map your data and plot more than a million rows of data visually on Bing Maps in 3D format from an Excel table or data model in Excel. Then we have Power BI Desktop. Power BI Desktop is a development tool for Power Query, Power Pivot and Power View. With Power BI Desktop, you have everything under the same solution and it is easier to develop BI and data analysis experience. Finally, we have Power Q&A. The Q&A feature in Power BI lets you explore your data in your own words. It is the fastest way to get an answer from your data using natural language. An example could be, what was the total sales last year? Once you have built your data model and deployed that into Power BI website, then you can ask questions and get answers easily. Now, let's see what Power BI service is. Power BI service is the software as a service part of Power BI. It is also referred as Power BI online. To access Power BI service, you need to log into app.powerbi.com. Now let me show you that. I'll go to Google, I'll open a new tab and search for app.powerbi.com. It's loading. But this is how the homepage of Power BI service looks like. I've created some dashboards on it. First, you need to log into app.powerbi service. You can see I'm logged in. Now under my workspace, if I go to dashboard, here I've created a finance dashboard. You can see the different charts and graphs I have prepared and pinned it to the dashboard. So Power BI service allows you to connect to your data, create reports and dashboards, and you can also ask questions to your data. Now, as you can see in this dashboard, we have created some charts and graphs. So this is a tree map. There's a pie chart, there's a bar graph. Below you can see the line charts and donor charts. It tells you the total sales that were made, the total number of units sold, the sales by product, sales by country, sales by segment and lots more. One of the key features of Power BI is creating dashboards from multiple reports and datasets. Power BI dashboard is a single page visualization to tell a story. The visualizations on a dashboard are generated from multiple reports and each report is based on one dataset. A single page dashboard is known as a canvas. The visualizations you see on the dashboard are called tiles. These tiles are pinned to the dashboard by report designers. Now let me go back to my dashboard. So this is called a canvas and each of these are called tiles. So on the top, you can see we have three tiles. Now let's understand how to create and publish reports in Power BI dashboards. Power BI allows you to create different reports on Power BI desktop. These reports can be published on the Power BI dashboard using Power BI service. Here you can see there is a Power BI report created on Power BI desktop. If you click on publish, it will take you to the Power BI service where you can build a dashboard. Here is the button for Power BI Publish. Once you click on Power BI Publish, it will take you to the dashboard. So this is a single page Power BI dashboard on Power BI service. Now let's understand the Power BI architecture. Power BI architecture is a service built on top of Azure. There are multiple data sources that Power BI can connect to. Power BI Desktop allows you to create reports and data visualizations on the dataset. Power BI Gateway is connected to on-premise data sources to get continuous data for reporting and analytics. Power BI services are basically the cloud services that are used to publish Power BI reports and data visualizations. Using Power BI mobile apps, you can stay connected to their data from anywhere. Power BI apps are available for Windows, iOS and Android platforms. Now let's look at a case study on how Meyer, which is one of United States largest supermarket chains used Power BI to solve its business problems. Initially, Meyer had become dependent on its IT organization to extract insights from its data. It was time consuming and inefficient as you had to wait for IT to build every report. Meyer was unable to perform ad hoc and real time analysis easily. So what Meyer did was it connected Power BI 
to an on-premises SQL Server Analysis Services Cube. This allowed them to refresh 20 billion rows of data in near real time. With Power BI, teams can now pull in the data faster and perform real-time analysis to derive insights from data. A bakery department inside Meyer used Power BI to compare its sales with regional performance. They analyzed where Meyer was behind the regional trends, focused on the problem and created a solution. With Power BI, they can now drill down into hourly sales and send out a sales flash to 800 Meyer business leaders. So Power BI enabled them to standardize data sources and empower store directors and team leaders to develop and track their data to ensure what they can improve. Now, let's do some practical hands-on demo with Power BI. So this is how the Power BI desktop interface looks like. On the left, you have the report view, the data view, and the model view. The report view is where you visualize your data with different charts and graphs to build reports. The data view allows you to view the whole data, while the model view is where you check if there are any relationship between the tables. On the right, you can see the different visualizations that you can build. We'll quickly run through all of these in our demo. So here you can see there's a finance sample data that will help you draw insights about the sale of products in different countries. We will create a report to visualize different charts and graphs and analyze those sales. So let me go to my Power BI desktop. First, we'll import our data. So let me go to our Get Data tab and choose Excel as my data source. I click on Excel. So here is our finance sample data. We'll select Sheet 1. You can see the data here. Click on it and then select Load. This might take some time to load the data. Now if I go to my Data tab, you can see the entire data set. It has fields such as segment, country in which the sales was made, the name of the product, the unit sold, and the sales price, and many more. Let's start building our report now. I'll go to my report view. So first let me create a text box. Let me resize it. Let me name it as finance dashboard. We'll increase the size of the text. We'll use font consolus, center it. We'll also add a background to this. We we'll use blue color, change it to white, and increase the size. Now let me first show you how you can create a matrix. I'll go to visualizations and click on matrix. Let me resize it. From the datasheet tab, I'll select sales and drag on to values. So you can see the total number of sales that were made. Now let me do some formatting. So I'll go to the format tab, click on column headers. Let's add a background color and let me increase the text size to 20. Similarly, under values, we'll increase the size of the text to 20 as well. We can also click on border and choose the color of the border. We we'll take as, let it be black. So this is a simple matrix that we created which shows the total number of sales that were made. Similarly, let me choose matrix once again. Now, we'll drag on the unit sold onto values. We'll continue with the same drill under column headers. We'll add a background. This time, let's choose some other color and under values, let's increase the size of the text to 20. Even for the column headers, let's increase the size of the text to 20. Again, we'll switch on border. We resize a bit. So here, we have two matrix created for our report. The first matrix shows us the total sales that were made. The second matrix shows you the total units that were sold. Now let's move ahead and create a simple bar chart. So under visualization, I click on clustered column chart. Under this, we'll drag the date column onto axis and the sales onto value. Let me expand it. So it shows you the sales per year. This is the sales that were made in 2013 and this shows you the sales that were made in 2014. Now there's a drill down option which gives you more granularity. This depicts the sales by quarter. If I drill down further, you can see this shows you the sales by month. Also, you have some options like sort by and sort by sales. So you can see October month made the highest number of sales. Moving ahead, let me now create a pie chart where we will see the sales by different segments. Under visualization, I'll click on pie chart. Let me first resize it. Here, I'll drag the segment column onto the legend and the sales column onto the values. 
as you can see we have the sales made by different segments. Government segment made the highest number of sales with 44.22%. Now let me add a border to both the visualization. I'll click on the pie chart and go to the format tab. I'll switch on the border. Similarly, for the clustered column chart, I'll go to the format tab and click on border. Now let me resize a bit. All right. Next, we'll create a very simple table that will depict the total sales made by each product. So under visualizations, I click on table. Let me bring this below. So from the data sheet, I'll first drag product onto values. You can see the different products and then sales just below it. So this depicts the total sales that were made by each product. And finally, it displays the total value of the sales that were made. This is same as the one shown here. Now let's do some formatting. Under format tab, I'll go to values and increase the text size to 15. Let me expand it. Also, under column headers, I'll increase the text size to 15. Then, let me go and add a border. Now let me create a map that will show you the sales that were made by each country. So first, let me create a new page and under visualization, I'll click on map. Now, I'll drag the country column onto location. So you can see we have our map ready and we'll drag sales onto size. You can see the different countries and the sales that they made. If I move the map, you can see the sales made in the Europe region. Let me resize it. I'll add a border to this. Now let me go ahead and create a donut chart that will show you the profit by each segment. Under visualizations, I'll click on donut chart. I'll move this to the top. Now from the data sheet, I'll add profit onto the values and segment onto the legend. If I expand this, you can see government segment made the highest amount of profit with 65.04%. Let me resize this and we'll add a border. Okay, in the final visualization, I'll show you how to create a tree map. This tree map will tell you the total amount of sales made by each product. So under visualizations, I'll click on the tree map. Let me expand it. I'll drag sales onto values and product onto group. So here you can see our tree map and the sales made by each product. You can see now we have our report ready. We have created two separate canvas to visualize our data. Now, if you want to change the color of these bars, you can simply go to the format tab and under data colors, you can choose whichever color you want. In Power BI desktop, you have an option to switch your theme. This will make your dashboard or the report look more attractive. So now we are under the default mode. Let's try out different themes. That's frontier, it's temperature, it's solar, which is a little yellowish. The one which I like is tidal. I hope this was helpful in making you understand the basics of Power BI and how it works. You learned the various features and the components of Power BI and looked at the architecture of Power BI. Finally, you saw a demo to create a report using finance data set. So what are the benefits of Power BI? Here are some of the benefits. So extract intelligence rapidly and accurately. So that's basically transforming your enterprise data into rich visuals and accurate reports for enhanced decision making. Now, one thing we already know that when we talk about data, data in raw format might have a lot of hidden information. If we look at different data sets, which I'll show you in the process, it might have a lot of meaning, but then the real meaning comes out of the data if we can create visualizations, if we can create relationships between different data sets and thus that can help us in enhanced decision making. Now, Power BI supports advanced data services. It integrates seamlessly with advanced cloud services like Cortana to provide results for the verbal data queries as well. When you talk about seamlessly integrating with existing applications that's one more benefit of power bi so it adopts analytics and reporting capabilities easily to embed interactive visuals quickly in your applications
you can build rich personalized dashboards so it basically provides a unified user experience with customized dashboard and reports that meet your exact needs it also has a way where you can have secure way of publishing your reports so you can set up automatic data refresh and rapidly publish reports allowing multiple users to avail the latest information across your organization or across your working community so power bi can connect to different sources we'll see that in a while so basically you have an option which says get data and that basically opens up a window where you can find different type of data sources such as Excel, your CSV or text, JSON, PDF, getting data from databases or directly accessing data from databases. Now, before we get further into understanding how Power BI looks like, it would be a good idea to share information in how you can set that up on your machine. So when it comes to your Power BI, and let me open up a notepad here so for example i bring up a notepad let's say when you talk about your power bi components so you basically have power bi desktop and that's mainly your playground or that's mainly used for any kind of development activities you have your power bi server or you can say service so now this one is where you would make reports online and share or make them available to different views now that's one more component of Power BI and then you also have your Power BI mobile which is mainly for viewing the information or I would say viewing reports. So these are the three main components. We can also look at the licensing information of these. So these are the main. So Power BI desktop is something which you can set up on your laptop or on your machine. Power BI server is where you can log in with your user ID and password and Power BI mobile is mainly to view your reports. Now, how do you set this up before you can explore or start working on Power BI? So here is a link which you can basically use. So if you look into this, so this one basically says service cell service sign up for power bi it says sign up of power bi service as an individual normally when you would want to use power bi you can use a website called http and then you have basically app and let's say I think it's called apppowerbi.com. Now, this is the place where you can basically log in. Now, if you see here, I have created an account. And if you look at my account, it says auatl.onmicrosoft.com. Now, how do you get this kind of email? Because when you talk about Power BI, it will expect you to have a official ID and it does not take IDs which are from common uh, domains such as Google or Yahoo and so on. So this particular link gives you an idea how you can do that. So basically you have what is Power BI, basic explanation on that. It says signing up for Power BI service, so Power BI desktop, it's a totally free download. And then you have mobile apps, also a totally free download. And here it says that what kind of email addresses it supports. And if we look into this, you have to either sign up because that does not accept your private email IDs or you can go for this one which says enroll US government organization and this is where you can basically sign up for Power BI. So it basically says try free if you go to the website say powerbi.microsoft.com or you could go into this one which I was saying http slash slash app dot your powerbi.com and this is what you can use or as mentioned you can go to powerbi.microsoft.com for example if i open this in a different tab it takes me to power bi microsoft i can say start free i can click on this 
it says try free but then when it asks you to sign in this is where some of us face problem because it does not take your private email id now how do you tackle that what you can do here is on this page which says learn about alternate ways to sign up you can basically open up this link and in this link it says sign up for power bi with a new microsoft 365 trial account and what you can do is you can basically click on this link which takes you to the office 365 and what you can do here is you can search for something which says say 365 e3 and here you have tried for free so in my case it is translating okay so here you have an option which says try it for free click on this one and then basically go ahead with your sign up process now once you do that you can basically create an account or give a email id so it asks you to give an email id to check if you already have an account and once you do that it will guide you through the process where you can create an account like i have done now once you have done that so for example we can go into my this page which i said http slash slash app power bi.com now once you have created an account you would be asked to log in now i can click and log in here and then basically given my password and once i do that it takes me to the power bi server or service now on the top right it might say that go for a trial version i have already selected that and this is a pro trial which is giving me validity for 60 days so this is the service which i can use now what it means is i can be using my power bi desktop which would be also installed so once you log into this page you can basically click on apps you can basically search for something like power bi and that will show up an app and you can install and download on your machine now once that is there you can basically bring it up so for example in my case i can just say power bi desktop and that's the app which I have installed on my machine and basically that comes up so that's your power bi desktop which is coming up and it will still ask you to sign in so that you can share your information through power bi so you see here on the top I'm already signed in and here it also shows you some tutorials and videos which basically helps you in getting to know something more or what's new so you can always browse that so you would have your power bi desktop which would be set up you would also have your power bi service which would be running and then basically whatever you have developed on your power bi desktop you can share that through the power bi service now usually when you talk about licensing i can give you brief insights here so you basically have your power bi service as i said licensing so you have the pro version which is basically uh, your 9.9 dollars .9 per user per month and basically it has some kind of limitation so it has say max 10 gigabyte you can work on uh, some features like incremental refresh is not allowed you can always look onto the microsoft website for more details and in those kind of cases you usually go for the premium account if you are a extensive user and premium account basically is conditional based so it depends on your requirements and then basically you pay for the service what you use so that's mainly about your servicing now when you talk about your server and service as i said it is basically making your reports online and sharing and making them available to different bus so that is the highlight so when you talk about sharing reports that's one of the things you have anomaly detection that's also possible here you can talk about automation of reports you have security that is you can go for role based or role level based kind of security implementation all those are 
some of the features of your Power BI server and service. So it is good to know and basically have your desktop and Power BI service set up. Now once you have that, then you basically have your Power BI. Now when you talk about your Power BI, it basically helps you with various things. So this is how easily you can have it set up and then basically you can explore this. So for example, as I was saying, Power BI can connect to different data sources. Now I do have an option here which says get data. I can click on this and that shows me all the different data sources. I can even click on more. If I'm interested in looking what more Power BI desktop tool helps me to do. So it shows me all the different ways in which you can get the data. You see here the servers, so the database services, your folders, your different formats. You can click on file formats or databases. You can look at Power Platform. So if basically you are connecting to a platform and getting some services, you can connect to the cloud that is Azure. You have online services and then you have other options. So these are all the ways in which you can get your data. When you talk about visualizations, you see a lot of visualization options here, which can be used once your data is loaded. And I will explore and explain more about this. So you have something called as insert wherein you can go in for different visuals or different types you can also get into say transform the data now that basically is going to pop up and bring a power query editor now that's where a lot of your etl works happen so when you when you do a transform data it opens up power query editor which we can use to transform the data or change the data or modify the data as per our requirement before loading all of it into our Power BI. So you also have option here which says modeling wherein we can create new tables or we can work on our data where we can manage relationships. So as of now we don't have any data so it does not show this one as activated but that can be activated. This is where you can view your reports. So this is in short exploring your Power BI. We'll see what are the different options which we can use here. So it basically supports different kind of data. So when we look at the visualization pane that basically allows us to create different kind of visualizations here and we will understand that. So you can basically visualize on your different data and create different kind of charts, graphs, maps, and basically derive insights from your data. Now, when you talk about data models, that's where you can basically establish relationships. So when you talk about data models, it is basically used to connect multiple data sources to build a relationship. Now, we might have different data sets or we might have data coming in from different tables where we may want to basically get insights or get data from multiple data sources for our purpose. Now, in that case, data models do help us. So for example, if you have two tables, let's look at the standard tables. So you have products lookup table and you also have the sales table. Now, usually what you have in any kind of scenario is if we basically say you have your data tables. So that's basically where your data resides. And then you have series of your lookup tables. So usually you might have say your data tables here. And this is what I'm talking about, which might have some data. For example, let's say sales is one of them. You might have some other data table, which might be, for example, let's say budget table or might be something else. And these are your data tables. Now at the other end, you might have your lookup tables. So basically you have various lookup tables. And these lookup tables, for example, let's say this one is customer. This one is territory. Let's say this is product. And let's say this one is a calendar. 
So these are basically my lookup tables. So we can basically, as I said, your data might be coming in from different sources, let's say database or let's say some kind of files or let's say some kind of systems what you have. So your data might be coming in from different places. Now you might want to transform the data. So this is where I could say there is your query editor, which I was explaining. So you have your query editor, which basically allows you to edit the data table or basically allows you to edit the data before it is loaded, right? You can hide a column, you can add a new column, you can modify your column. So your query editors would be basically used to work on the data which goes into your data tables. Now you might have a lot of lookup tables, as I said, so let's say these are my lookup tables and these are my data tables so what we need is sometimes we need information based on our lookup tables and data tables now that's where data modeling comes into picture so basically if i would want to extract information from here so i can notice that there is a product key here and there is a product key here. Now this is where we are already talking about say foreign keys or we are talking about your relationships, right? Now when you talk about relational databases, you have something called as foreign key constraints, which is in, in Power BI terms, I would say it's not exactly a constraint, but it is more of a filter propagation instead which is used to basically connect your different data sources and you could have basically cross filter directions you can go for single or one to one or one to many or many to many kind of relationships which basically allows you to work on the data so we will learn more about data models when we are doing a quick demo there where we can talk a little bit about normalization and denormalization the way the data exists right and then you basically would want to gather insights from your data so when you talk about your two data sources as i said so you have a products lookup table you have a sales table now if you would want to calculate the total order quantity of each product name which is we are talking about the order quantity as a information here and you have product name here now how do you get that information what we see here is we would want something like this or we would want more information so how do we do that so what we can do is the order quantity for each product is basically showing us the same value now this is because the product and sales tables are not connected and there is no relationship between them even if you would want to take two sources and just get information out of them power bi would complain that there is no relationship established between them so what we do is we create a data model so what we do is we build a relationship between both the tables using a common key column which exists in both cases as i said there is a product key here there is a product key here so that basically allows us to have a relationship between these two now that could be one to one this could also be related to other tables so it could be one to many you could have many to one so all those relationships are possible so product key is basically used to create a relationship you see the arrow mark and then there is also this star which can basically mean one to many now when the product key is used to join these two tables or form a relationship then we can look at the product names and the order quantities which basically gives me a total now that's the basic use of your data models now what about this dax so basically data analysis expressions now that's a, a library of functions and operators that can be combined to build formulas and expressions in power bi desktop usually when we work on our data sources when we would want to connect them it automatically shows us these data analysis expressions however this gives us extension it basically gives us more power to work on our data now sometimes instead of working on dax or dax expressions 
it would be good to go for better data modeling and have the relationships established better and sometimes when the relationships are established you could use your tax which basically gives you more power on working on your data so your values are calculated based on information from each row of a table it appends values to each row in a table and stores them in the model it increases the file size so that's what happens now you can right click on any column to add a new column and for example in this one it shows that there was a quantity type calculated column which was based on the calculation what we see here on the top in the in the expression bar which says what kind of calculation was performed and that basically gives us the value for quantity type and that is basically added here to our existing data so that's the power of DAX and Power BI so you also have something called as uh, measures so DAX allows you to create new calculated columns and measures so basically here if you see we are working on aw underscore sales and then we have selected quantity sold and what we are looking at in the report is we can basically right click on any table name to add a new measure here so we have added what we call as quantity sold as the measure so values are calculated based on information from any filters in the report we will see this how this can be done and that basically here the measure does not increase the file size it does not create new data in the table themselves in comparison to what we were seeing earlier that is your calculated columns so these are your type of DAX functions so DAX allows you to create new calculated columns and measures so you have date and time which basically allows you to work on date and time data or fields you have logical functions which allow us to create new filters or add more filters to our data you have text functions which basically allows us to say transform the data into a lower case or an upper case or basically get the length of a string or concatenate two fields or basically uh, do a filtering based on some criteria or replacing some content you also have statistical functions which can be used you have information functions which can be used so these are different types of DAX functions which we can use in Power BI so we will learn more on Power BI through a quick demo where we can uh, use some data sets and those data sets could be found on internet although I can also upload that on a github link and you will have access to those data sets so let's learn about Power BI through a quick demo by uploading some data sets and playing with those data sets let's look at a sample data set and let's upload it and as I explained while uploading let's also transform the data so that we can have selective fields or selected data loaded here instead of loading the complete data set and then let's see how we can visualize this or how we can use the information in this data set now what we can do here is we can click on get data and then we can choose one of the data formats which we would be looking for so for example i can go for excel and basically click on this now here are some of my data sets so let's look into the folder here and these data sets are also available on my github link which I'll share with you later so here we have something called a superstore let's click on this and here I already have a data set which is global superstore or I also have selective data so let's select this one click on open now that's basically connecting to my data source and that will show me what does that excel sheet have so it has different tabs which is orders people and returns so let's select orders and that basically gives me a preview of the data which i have and if you scroll all the way to right it shows me city state 
and then country and if you see here we do see information of all the countries now this can be huge amount of data which may which we would want to look into but say for example my use case is that i'm interested in looking for the data for united states and uh, as a country and all its states so we will do that when we do a transform now we can also select the returns tab and that shows me these three fields however the first row should have been the heading of this uh, particular data set and we will transform that now i can go ahead and click on load but that will load all the data so instead of that let's go for transforming so let's click on transform data now once you do that it brings you your toolkit that's brings you your power query editor which allows you to transform your data so for example we have our data from returns tab or returns data source as you see here so we see column one column two and column three and that also shows the type of the data here it also gives me a quick small option here let's select this and then i can say use first row as header now there are various other options which you can do you can add a custom column you can add column with examples you can keep the top rows you can remove the top rows you can keep errors keep duplicates so there are different ways and you can also do a merge query or a append query so as of now let's just say use first row as headers and that basically shows that now my first row has become the header you also see in the applied steps it basically tells me if i have changed the type of the data if i have made any other changes those steps will get added here so it basically shows me the name as it returns it shows me applied steps where i've changed the type and now i basically have this information now this is something where you can change the type or you can basically set it to a particular format however we are not doing anything of that sort right now so we can do that for any of these columns so this looks good when it comes to orders let's click on this and as i said i would be interested in selecting for country as united states only and let me just work on that data however we can work on all the data so let me scroll all the way to right and here i have the country now there are these filters which we can use so basically i can click on this and that shows me all the countries are selected now there is also something called as text filters which we will see how we can use to select particular data i basically have other ways of filtering the data so for example now I will just uncheck the select all and what I would be interested is in United States so let's type it here that shows me as an option here select this and then basically say okay so that should basically now filter out and it shows me the data is United States only and then you have different states and rest of the data remains so if you look at the applied steps it tells me that there are filtered rows now we have done the basic transformation for this data set on these two data sources that is orders and returns so here you have an option which says close and apply so close the query editor window and apply any pending changes you can click on this and it says apply so for example i can just say apply for now and that should basically apply the changes which i have performed using my query editor that is i have transformed the data so that i can have selective data uploaded in my power bi now it's doing that it shows me it is working on both of these data sources that is orders and returns so that's done and now basically if there are any other pending changes we can just do a close and apply so that basically has closed and now you would see the data appearing here so I have uploaded the data as per my preferences now if you click on the data tab here so it basically shows you your data fields it might take some time to populate but if you see in the country field now if even if i click on the filter it just shows me united states now that's what we wanted
So we have already uploaded this data in orders. You can always expand the option here, which shows me all the fields which are there in this. Might be this is an aggregation, might be that's an order date. So this is again some kind of aggregation. We can change the data types. So we are looking at all the fields in my orders table or basically coming from the orders data source. I also have returns which shows me three fields and that shows me the data which is returned order ID and region. So the column names are applied correctly as we want and that basically looks fine. Now we can also look at your model so when you click on model it shows me these two however there is no as of now relationship established between them so it says under properties select one or more model objects to set their properties so right now these are not related there is no relationship established between them so if i would want some data which relates to orders and returns then that would fail because it would say there is no relationship. Now I can go to the first option which says report and we have not created any report here. Although we can create a simple report, we can look at the data. So we have our orders field. Now we can basically pull out some information from here. We can choose what kind of report we may want to create. So for example, let's go for uh, the table option from visualizations you have various options here which we can use this is where you can do a formatting this is where you can select the fields this is where you can search and filter out the data you can also add data fields here so first let's click on table and that basically gives me a table now this table as of now does not have anything so you can use the filter and slices option here which will affect the visualization or basically what you can do is now since we have orders here so this is my orders and i would like to work on this so let's say for example country is i can select country as a field and if you say it shows me country is all as of now and it says the value is united states what i can also do is i'm interested in the states so I have state now I can basically drag and drop it here and then the state gets added here so I can basically say select all and that should basically take care of my state field being added here so state is all country is all now we can basically look at something else so might be let's choose sales and I can just drag and drop sales here. So that basically says if you would want to have any kind of advanced filtering, which says filter type. So go for advanced filtering is less than or equal, or you can also go for advanced filters. So that's fine as of now. So we have added some fields here and that's basically my data here. So let's go for filters here which basically should select all my fields. Now, if you see the visualization shows my country, sales and state, which we had either by selecting the fields and dropping them here, or you can in this section where it says fields. So you can, for example, let me show it again. So I can just delete this. I can click on the table option. I can just drag it here. I can basically make it bigger and I need to add data to this one. So it says add data fields here. So now let's say country is what we are interested in. We are also interested in states. So let's drop that here and let's say sales. So this is also what I'm interested. In. So I'm looking at one specific country. I'm looking at sales per state and when we look at sales it basically tells me that this is a summation so you will basically get the total sales which have happened now we are looking at this data here we can always go to formatting we can click on grid we can basically increase the font here we can change the grid color so for example let's make it for example blue 
so I can just select this and it should basically allow me to have the grid color as blue now I can go in for the grid thickness I can go for row padding outline color so we can basically make it a little bit more readable and then we can basically increase the font size here to look at the information and you have other options here so what would you want to do with column headers so I can basically have the font color background color is fine do you want to have an outline do you want to have a change in font what is the text size might be we can make the heading a little bigger and then basically you also have the field formatting so all those could be done you could go for background and all these things can be done in formatting so now we already have our data here and this basically looks good and this is basically one of my visuals which I have here and this has given me some information for sales and basically I can scroll this I can also make it bigger so I could select a particular field if I'm more interested in looking at the information for a particular state now I can add more fields to this so this is my one of the reports which I have created now what I can do with this report is I can basically have more data fields I can add filters to this I can basically look into all the data here by just clicking somewhere in the grid but somewhere outside if you select a particular row then that data shows up here you have an option of focus mode which you can go for you can look at the other options which says export data now if this is the data which you are interested in you can export it you can always do show as a table if you are interested in you can do a sort by country sales or state so for example let's do a sorting by state and that basically gives me the data which has been sorted by state information now we could obviously have the information here so I can then change the order so it shows me alphabetically this is the information which I have so I've created a simple visualization using the data which I have and what I can do is I can click on save so that basically asks me to save this as a power bi file which has an extension of pbix and I can basically call it my report so let's say first report and here I can say country or I can say state wise sales in USA let's say USA and that basically is my first report now once you have saved this report you can always look on your machine for example if I go in here and if I go into this folder might be I should look on desktop and this is where I should have saved it so it shows me first report state wise that will open up in power bi and we have created a simple report which we have basically used by taking our data now I can also do is I can publish this if I would want to share this information so publish this report online in power bi service you can basically select your report what we have here and I clicked on publish so it says what's the destination so you can have different workspaces I will choose the default that's my workspace I can click on select now it says publishing first report statewide sales in USA to power bi you can create a portrait view of your report and you can do all that stuff so let it publish and then we can basically look into our power bi server that's our service where the information is already shared or published i would say which can then be shared with different resources so we can come here and basically i can look into the power bi 
and this is where I will be able to look into my workspaces and let's look in my workspace. So it says this is the place where I had initially downloaded Power BI data set. It says your data set is ready. Let Power BI help you explore your data, right? So you can always do this. You can click on view data set, which basically allows you to bring out your workspace and first report state why sales now that's the report which we have published so let's first check in our desktop if that's done so it says success open first report in power bi now i can click on this one straight away and that takes me to my service now once it takes me to the service it shows me the report which we created which we published and it basically has the option where i can save it as a a different copy or give a different name i can embed this in diff in a website or a portal i can publish to web embed this report for public access by anyone on the internet we can do that we can export it to powerpoint so we can do all these options you also have an option of view where you can change the view you can basically also edit report here so you can do that if you are interested in something specific you can do a sharing to teams so if you have your teams or groups set up you can share it with them you have an option of common panes you can basically view usage metrics report now that can be sometimes helpful you can basically go ahead and go and subscribe a particular report so if there are new changes made you will be the one who will be informed you can click on share now if i click on share here from my service it says only users with power bi pro will have access to this report recipients will have the same access as you unless row level security on the data set further restricts them so i can grant access and this is where i will have to give the email ids of the people with a message that I would want to have them look at this report, right? You can also allow recipients to build new content using the underlying data sets and you can send an email notification to the users. As of now, I don't have any other groups, so I'll not be sharing it, but I have created a simple report. Now let's also look at edit report. Let's just to see what it helps us. And when you click on edit report, it basically brings up this one which says your file view it gives you the filters it basically allows you to add data fields to this so it is basically giving access to these data sets which were in my desktop it is basically allowing you to give or create different visualizations now here we have the data which we are looking at and if say for example somebody is interested in filtering the data so you could do that so you could click on filter here and that basically applies this is the filter we have now country is fine sales might be i can click on sales and i would say okay let's look at sales which is more than a particular amount so we can say is greater than and might be i can give a number here so i can say 30000 and basically i can say apply filter so right now i'm applying filter and i would look at the values which also shows me the total value is changed so you have not only created a report you have published it and now from the service you can edit it so i'm looking at particular data here and then basically I can click on file and I can save it or I can say save a copy of the report and let's say I will call it the same name so I'll say first report underscore state wise sales and I will say modified so let's do a save and the report has been saved so now you're looking at the data here so that is basically giving you information so when i click on my workspace here 
I can click on reports and that does show me my previous report. It shows me the modified report. It gives me an option of looking at the usage metrics report. So say for example, you want to click on this one and it will basically give you the usage metrics. So let's click on this one and that basically shows me the report usage metrics, which is generated. So views per day, unique viewers per day, you would want to look at the different platforms who was using it views by user and this can be sometimes useful if we would want to look into this one now i can go back to my workspace i can click on reports and that basically took me to usage metrics i could be sharing it i can analyze in excel i can look for quick insights based on this data what we have you can basically look at the related information. You can also look at the settings of this one. And basically this is how you have your data report here. Now that also shows me the data sets option. So which basically gives me the data sets which can be used to create further reports. And we have our data here. So for example, if I click on create report, it basically gives me these data sets and we can continue working on this. So this is how I have a simple report created without basically working on two different data sources, but I have selected some data here and then I can basically add details to this. So for example, now if we look at orders and say for example, this is the data I have and say you would want to add some fields so let's go to returns and say for example i would be interested in looking at the the products so might be what i should do is i should replace the report here instead of country it would be interesting to look at the product which we have or basically customer id so we can look at customer id we can look at the order id which would be interesting to see if there is a particular order, what was the sales which was generated and if there were any returns which were happening on that. So for example, here, when I have these, let me cut out country as a field and I will basically take order ID and place it here. So now if you see my data has been easily modified. So I have my order ID. I have sales and I have state wise information. So you have basically all the information, but this is now order ID, state and so on. Now, what if I would want to also see based on the order ID, if I say I would want the returned field. So for example, I would want to take this one and let's drag and drop it here. Now that says cannot display the visual. Now, why is that? So if you click on see details, that says cannot determine relationships between the fields. So it cannot display the data because Power BI cannot determine the relationship between two or more fields. And how do we fix that? So for example, if I click on fix this, now it says there is a missing relationship between these fields. Use auto detect to search for relationships or create them manually. Now I can click on auto detect which will try to search for fields which exist in both the data sets or basically I can create relationships. So let's click on create relationships and that basically takes me to this page which says there are no relationships defined from table to table and so on. So I can click on new. Now here it says select the tables and the columns that are related. Now I can say orders. Now those are my fields where you have order IDs and it automatically shows that returns also has an order ID field. Although all the values might not be same, but this is how you can create a relationship. And it says the cardinality says many to one. So you can have basically many to one relationship. You are saying cross filter direction is single. So make this relationship active and it has already helped us basically identifying the field. So I can say, okay. So it says now these two tables should be related or should be connected based on order ID. So 
here we have this and let's basically say close now once that is done if you see I have order ID I have returned I have sales column and I have state and if you see in returned I do have a value of yes which shows this particular order ID had generated some sales and it was for state Alabama and it was returned and the value is yes so if you scroll down you basically see all the values now we can add different filters where we can say I would want only yes and no now this is again an interesting report so let's go in also into the formatting and what we can do is we can look at say the grid option if we would want to basically say vertical grid and let's say on and it says vertical grid color so let's select this might be I can try doing a black here it puts it in the right nice table format and that basically looks good so you have sales returned and so on and this is basically the order which I'm seeing here so for example if I would want to change the order and if I'm saying okay I would like to look at sales and returned and so on so we can be doing that we can come here and say for example I have sales and returned let's try moving the sales column over here might be state is uh, an information which we would want in the beginning so let me also move the states all the way here so it gives me state it gives me the order ID sales and if there was a return which was happening on that particular product so easily I've modified my report now what I can do is I can just save it and I can do the same thing so I can publish it I can basically continue using it or I can work on a new report so let's continue learning and uh, now here we will also see how you can load some data and perform some transformations and basically get multiple results or multiple tables or multiple data sets which can be then further used for reporting so power bi does give you a lot of options now here you have an option as we saw earlier that is get data or what you can do is you have an option where you can create new data also which says enter data now this is something which can be easily used if you have relatively less number of fields so you can basically add more columns here and you can basically add values so for example if I would just call it something like uh, scientist ID okay and then I can say scientist name and then basically I can say uh, domain and then I can say for example let's say year of joining and and I can keep adding the number of columns here I can delete the columns right and I can give this and I can say country so that's it and now we have created these five countries uh, sorry five columns which we have given some names and we can start entering some values so I can basically say let this scientist ID be 2234 I can give some name so let's give Peter let's say domain and I can say biotechnology I can give year of joining 2011 and I can say Germany as the country and I really don't want this particular column so I can go ahead and delete this now I can come here and then I can give something else so I can say this is scientist ID I can give John let's say the scientist is mainly working in physics and then I can say 2018 and let's say France and go back here and let's say 4567 and let's say Marie 
and let's say uh, she does her research in uh, molecules and let's call it 2001 and let's say Italy okay and you can continue adding data in this way now you can say if the data is already here so I can say for example no I do not want this particular row I do not want this particular row so you can basically keep adding values here now you can say edit so here we have to give some names so let's say scientists okay and then if you choose edit it basically brings up your power bi editor which allows you to work on these fields if you would want to make some changes now we can make some changes here we can see what are the number of rows we can basically perform any kind of transactions here so this one basically tells me what is the data type so here we see scientist id and this clearly tells me this is an integer however we will not want to do any kind of computations here so we can as well change this so i can just do a right click and i can work on this particular column what i can also do is i can just click on this and this tells me that you would want to change it to date time or you want to change it to some number so i can just say string because we are not going to perform any computation here so on the id column so let's say text and i'm changing it so it says replace current add a new step so selected column has an existing type conversion would you like to replace the existing conversion or preserve the existing so i will say replace current and now the data type has been changed it is of a string and if you see this step has got added here so it says that the change type is the kind of transformation we did here so that's fine now what we can also do is we have the scientist name but we don't like the column name here so it would be good to change this so there is something called as remove or remove columns and so on so when you do a right click it gives you a lot of options in applying filters or doing some transformation if i just click on this one so what i can do is i can look at the date time and let's go here so we have an option which says do you want to change the type now we could have done that here or like i said you could choose the time and do it you can just say transform and how do you want to change it so do you want to change it to uppercase well you can do that and changes all the values of this one what i can do is i can again do a right click and i can choose basically if you would want to clean up the data or if you would want to convert to lowercase you want to capitalize each word so let's choose that and if you see here the steps are getting added now to undo any particular step if i just cancel this then i'm back to this if i cancel this i'm back to my original form so you can anytime undo your changes and you can basically work on this so we are working on this particular column now there are various other options that you can look at so for example these are this is some of my data but it does not have much information it would be good to load some bigger data set and then use these transformations or basically working on changing the data types as i mentioned or if you would want to do a filtering and remove certain fields and only select particular fields if that's what you're interested doing a right click where i want to create a copy of this and then basically i can use that particular copy now what i can also do is i can add column from examples i can duplicate column and then i can make some changes to that so this is my duplicate column and say for example you would want uh, this one to be changed so we can say remove duplicates we can basically if you are doing some kind of change you want to change the format here you can do that you can use for other things like filling up and all that now i can just call it rename and let's say 
uh, alias scientist name right and I can continue adding columns or I can do some transformations and once you have done with these transactions now this one if you see it shows as integer but is it an integer no this is an date format so I can go for modeling and change the formats what I can also do is I can select this and it says it's not a decimal it's not a fixed decimal it is date time it is date it is date time and time zone right and you can select any one of these so for example let's make it date which makes it more meaningful but then what happens is when you do this it is going for the default dates or the older dates so I don't like that so what we will have to do is we will have to basically transform this and here we have transform you have change type so you have date and time you have date you have time so let's choose date and time and if you see here it gives me some default timing based on these values which we do not like so again filter it out but what we can do is we can just make sure that this is changed or you want to make it a string because we are not going to do any computation here so I can keep it as date but then if I have more fields like month and days and so on then you can do that so here it also has the option so when you have selected this you have an option called transform and transpose uh, sorry transform also has various options which allow you to work on these do you want to do some scientific calculations do you want to work on the date field so as of now it is just integer so we can use one of these we can do a group by but obviously we don't have much data here so as of now let us retain this I can just change this to text and that's okay because we are going to look at this later we can add more data and work on it so as of now once we have done all these changes you can go back to say home and here you have close and apply and I can basically say close and apply so the changes will be applied and then my new table which we just created by entering some random data performing some basic transformations will be available so if you look into this one so that's where my data is it shows me the columns but there is no aggregated column as such here you don't see any summation mark you just see the field names or the column names you see the values now obviously if you go into modeling there is no or there is no existence of a different table which you can join these tables or you can perform some transactions come back to the data set so this looks good and we have it here now obviously we have not created any visualization based on this which we can and we can continue working on it so here this is my data set which is a small table where we have created some data and we can use it anytime now let's work on a bigger data set and see what kind of transformations we can do we can then also see on modeling or basically using some smarter ways of working with the data so what we would want to do is we would want to load some data here so let's go into sorry let's go into home let's go to get data let's use our old store data and I'm going to take the global superstore which is huge data set with all the countries and the products and the sales which have happened and we can take this data but before loading it as I suggested earlier we should basically transform the data we should basically transform the data so that you don't end up loading everything and you don't work on all the data I mean unless you really want to so here I will this Excel sheet which I'm talking about has two different tabs we have used it before so let's use orders let's use returns and that basically shows me the data what we have so I can do a load but that's not what we would want to do so you can do a load and you can get all the data but let's go to transform make some basic transformations before we load the data so our power BI editor allows us to work on this now here we have 
it says this preview may be up to nine days old so I can do a refresh I can select this and I say first thing is use first row as header because that's what I want so it is basically setting the first row as header which looks good and we have some order IDs we have the returned if the product was returned so let's look at the filter here so it just has yes values which we are looking at so it says list may be incomplete let's say load more and let's see what are the filters here so either there might be a product which is returned or it might be blank field so that is chosen so that's fine we have order ID we have region which is basically showing me different regions here let's look at orders and orders is again having your row ID order ID order date ship date ship mode so you have quite large amount of data here for your different countries now in earlier example I chose United States and then I was only focusing on the states and city in United States so we can do that now I can basically work on refresh so whatever preview was stored in the memory we are just refreshing it now here we have this row ID and if you see the row ID is an integer obviously we will not be performing any kind of computation here so here you don't have any row ID but here we have row ID so let's make it uh, from integer let's make it string and I'll say replace current so that's that looks fine it's a row ID which we will use to search but we are not going to perform any computations unless you want to find on an average on row ID or anything else now you have order IDs so what we can do is we can filter some values we can rename the field as we desired right so for example let's go in here and what we can do is let's go into a customer ID ship okay and here you have say state you have region okay now at any point of time if I would want to filter out the values the easier option is that you can select on this one and here you can do some text filtering okay or you can basically select the values from here so for example if I say let's get rid of select all what we will be interested in uh, say United States and UK that's the data we want and then I can basically say okay so it is basically going to filter out the data which is for United States and UK as of now now what we can also do is how about doing some more filtering before we basically work on this so let's go in here and we are looking at United States and UK related data and let's look at it is sometimes good that you can basically uh, work on the data here so for example I go into orders now what I would want to do is I would want to look at the fields okay and we want to we have not yet loaded the data so if you look in the background I just have my scientists because we have not applied these changes we have not loaded we are still in the transformation stage right now what we can do is let's go for so we can do segment and all these kind of fields can be used for grouping the data so we will see that whenever you have a data set you would already know there are certain fields which have repeated values which can be used to group the data and we can do that we can change any kind of values which are not going to be computed on so for example I have postal code I can use this but again we are not going to find a postal code which is greater than something right so integer is not the valid type let's change it to text okay and uh, if for example I would want to look at this so I have done some changes here okay and this shows me null so for example let me just revert this back and let's make it 
uh, whole number. Okay, so there are certain columns or rows which do not have some values and we can basically get rid of those values. So as of now, we can do a filtering here. So let's keep the postal code as integer or let's change it to text, do a replace content. And now what we will do is we'll scroll all the way right. Might be I'm interested in technology category. So that's what I'm interested in. So what I can do is here, I can do some filtering. So I can basically choose technology now the easier way would be since these are categories and there are only three categories we really don't want to go and apply text filters here but if you had something like an office supply and um, office inventory then you could have done some text filter so let's not do some text filtering here what we can do is i would be interested in technology so that's the field i'm interested in so now you are only having data which is related to technology okay and you have some product names so this is where we want to do some kind of filtering so we can rename the field we can select some fields so let's for example let's go for uh, any of the field which i think might have more entries here so for example let's go for Canon wireless or Canon image, right? So let's go for product names and I will say let's go here. Now I could have done a transformation, but that's not what we want. We want to do some filtering. So let's go to text filter and here I can say begins with, I can say ends with, I can say contains. So let's go for contains and it says enter a value here so you would want to keep the rows where the product name contains something and it gives you some suggestion right so where you are seeing in some values here so for example if i would have selected this then it applies the complete thing but that's not what i want so i will get rid of all this and i will say it contains canon now i can go for advanced filtering also okay wherein you can select advanced and then you can give different columns and what do they contain what kind of values you are looking for so you can do that but we will not go for advanced in one step let's go for basic and let's say okay and now i should get all the products which are canon and you have different products so this is one kind of filtering I've done, it tells me what is the category of this. It is machines, it is copiers, it is obviously belonging to the technology category. We are looking at uh, the market, which is for this particular data. When you look at the country, we are still focusing on United States and United Kingdom, that kind of data, right? So we have filtered the data, we have done some uh selection based on the data here and what i can do is i can then basically rename a particular field so i can do that i can say i'm interested in um sales which is the data here we can basically look into the quantity so sales is something which we are interested in but might be we are interested in sales which are more than a particular value i'm not interested in lower amount of sales i would want to look into united states and uk data but i'm interested in sales or i'm looking at if the discount percentage was something or if the profit was more right so we can apply different kind of values here but what we can do is with these changes because you don't want to transform and make changes all here you want to make the changes once the data set is uploaded. So we have selected some data. We have create done some transformations. We can basically break a particular column into multiple columns if that's what we want. If we see that we will do an aggregation based on year or we will do 
a aggregation based on the country or year and order id right so we can break this data into multiple columns so we can do that but for now let's do a close and apply and let's apply this so that's going to apply all these changes it's going to load my data but remember now we are having selective or selected data which gets loaded so that should get be available here so it takes time sometimes so you have to wait and then you can go ahead and check here so for example now I'm looking in tables let's basically minimize this let's go for orders and this is the data I have which obviously row ID if you see so you have all the row IDs and again again you can do filtering here but this is where you have already loaded the data the data is available and then you can start working on the columns here so we have this if you closely see we see this summation mark and this basically means that these are my aggregated columns or these values are measures which can be used for calculations so we can see that we can create our own aggregations so we can do that we can rename the field as we have seen we can filter out the data so we have all the fields showing up from orders and let's also look at the returns which basically has the columns the order id and your region so it basically shows the region here where was the product returned from and we have this information so what we are doing is we when we were doing a text filter in the previous example remember it was case sensitive okay and you have to take care of when you're doing a text filter you have to give a field which exactly matches as it exists in the content now okay this is the data we have and let's look at the order column right now what we can do is we can do some quick transformations here and we can basically look for more data here so let's say we have uh, some filtering to be done now i can do a filtering based on my uh, products so we had all these products but now let's do a filtering on product and then products you have copiers you have machines so you have mainly two categories right and when you look at machines it basically talks about your pc uh something so let's look for machines and here we have basically the copier fields which are more so i can basically go for filtering here and that's the data we have so we don't want to really unselect any of these here but what i'm doing is i'm saying text filter and let's go into this one now and let's say contains okay so I'm saying contains and then I can basically say uh, let's say copier now that's what I'm interested in and uh, show rows where product name contains copier okay now you can give a and condition here so if you would want a specific copier if you are interested in okay let's also say uh, contains and let's go for laser also laser and let's say okay so you see the data gets filtered out here and uh, we have the sales which we are seeing here so let's go to sales and we will be interested in anything above 500 so let's go to sales let's go for number filters let's say greater than and I will say for example 500 oh sorry 500 okay and uh, let's say okay so that basically filters out the data and then I am also interested in quantity where I would want the quantity to be more than one or more than two so for example so let's go in here 
and you can basically choose what is the filter you want so you can apply any number of filters now you have the filtering here you can always click on the filter and if you want you can just do a clear filter and the filtering will be gone so you have all the data right and this is the particular data we have and here I have say for example product name now I can keep the filter because I'm interested only in these values or I can filter out so this tells me that when we did a and it is basically going for laser and copier right so let's say for example clear all filters the thing is gone what we can do is let's go here go for text filters say contains and here I will say it sh can be a copier okay or so last time we did a and and I'll do it contains laser so let's choose this that gives me more entries so either the product name has copier or it has laser it has the quantity it has the product name and we have all this detail here now what we can also do is we can do some transformation on the product ID so for example you have product ID or order ID so order ID shows up as uh, looks like the country name uh, the year and then the order ID so we can basically split it up so I can select this and here I have option of let's go to home so when you have you have selected this column so you have an option of transform data here so use the power query editor to connect prepare and transform the data so if you really want to transform the data here if I basically select this if I just do a right click here now here it just tells me do you want a new column do you want to create a copy of this column okay you want to create copy table so this is your transformed data what you have and for example let's create a copy table and let's come in here so you should be able to see your copy table now so let's go in and select this one and what you need to do here is creating a copy of this or copy table would not be the right option what we can do is we can work on transforming this rather than doing it from here so you have this option of adding a new column going for a new measure renaming it right so that's okay but what we can do is select this particular column let's do a home and first thing is let's go to transform so I want to transform the data now let's select this one and it brings up your power editor again here we were interested in orders so we are looking at our data here now if you see my countries United States and UK so you can confirm that if you look at category it is technology product name has copier and laser as we selected so those things are retained so you have not lost any changes as of now so this order ID column what we have now as I said you can be doing a filtering okay you can select this particular column and then you have other things which can be used to transform here like you want to change the data type you want to use first row as header you want to replace some values okay you want to run some merge queries you want to do some analytics so all these options are here now what we can do is while this column is selected I can do a right click now there is an option called transform which is basically going to help me in changing the data here okay now I can basically duplicate the column so I really don't want to work on this column itself but it would be good to have a duplicate column on which we can work on so I can do a split column here if I would want to but let's create a duplicate column so let's say duplicate column now that gives me a duplicate column so we can rename it later so now I will not work on my original column but I'll work on a duplicate column and what I'm going to do is I'm going to basically transform or split this so again do a right click 
now you have a split by so we can say split by by delimiter or by number or by characters or by position so by lowercase and uppercase so you can do all of this so let's go for by delimiter now if you see it basically identifies the delimiter which is hyphen or dash now you can go for split at leftmost identifier right uh, sorry leftmost delimiter rightmost each occurrence of delimiter and that's what we want to do you can look into advanced options where it says split into columns so do you want to split that into columns do you want to split that into rows because that's more or less like doing a group by and you can say number of columns to split into so we have here one two three four values so that looks good to me and uh, let's do say for example if i choose three so i can choose three and then split using special characters so you could do that so let's for example let's say okay and let's look at the data how it looks like we can anytime delete the data we can keep it the way we want right so what we did was we created a copy of the column then we did a split and what we have seen is we just have three columns now if you see the fourth bit is gone fourth bit doesn't show up right because i just did a three as the resulting column so i have the order id okay and we can check if there is already an order id column so we have order id but that has the complete order id year and the relatively product id so you can see the customer id you can look at this one so it basically has your order id and then let's look at the fields here so we have the product id which says tecma i'm looking at the first one 3700 and that has in no relation to the order id right so we can make sure that there is nothing which is conflicting with our entries now once that is done so we have order id which can be used to categorize the data you have order id which is basically the year okay and you have order id which is basically having some more value now i can keep this data as i want so i can basically click on this i can go for renaming and i can say let's say let's call it order id and let's say ids so let us in case there is a particular column and you would want to look at so just give the name correctly now order ids is fine so here we will also rename this one so let's call it uh, order year and that's going to be order year so we can again change this to string okay and here you have the order id so let's rename this one and i have my let's call order number right so we have we are seeing all the steps which we have added here we just split the data based on the delimiter and we have now three new columns which have got added to our existing data which was already filtered and we have done some splitting up of data by creating a duplicate and then renaming it right so if you go and look at your transformations now if i would have done a split here straight away then my original column would be gone but probably we want the original column because sometimes you may want to search order id with a consolidated information sometimes you may want to segregate it based on year right now we have the year field or order date field here you have the ship date right but then might be you want to just aggregate based on year you don't want to really spend time in aggregating or extracting the month and day and so on so my these three columns can be useful now what i can also do is i can 
merge the columns if I want so we have split the columns but what I can do is I can say select 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 so using your control and now do a right click so you should have an option called merge columns right now this is something which is uh, we would want to merge so let's say merge columns and let's say do you want to keep a separator so yes I want to keep a separator but might be this time I will give my separator is a uh, colon and then what is the merge column name you want to create so let's call it something like um, order okay uh, year and then let's call it num right so sometimes renaming the fields to a name which makes more sense or based on your naming convention is good so let's do a merge and now what I have done is I have done merging of those columns so I split the data I merge the columns and now if you see my the columns which I had created those columns are gone because you did a merge you did a merge and now you have the fields which are either uh, earlier you had something which is separated by a hyphen and here you have something which is separated by colon right now anytime if you want you can unmerge this by removing this step right and you can get rid of this merge column so if for example I would do that so I have my data back right I have my data back so what we could have done is we can select this okay and then what we can do is like what we did earlier so you can basically go for removing the columns okay you can do a merge column okay you can select one by one and create duplicate of those and then you can merge them right so all the possible options are there so you can the best option would be to create a duplicate of these columns and then basically merge them as per your convenience so might be you can say order IDs and order number is the pairing what you want here is something which you don't want right because we already have the date field so I can basically say remove and this one is gone now I will select this and this and let's go for merge columns and I want to give a separator which is might be without the year and you have space or you can go for custom like earlier we had give a symbol and then what do you want to call it so let's say order specs okay right so this makes more meaning because we already have the date field so why do I want the year into my order ID so I can always be doing a segregation now based on order specs right now this is some simple transformations what we are doing here we are seeing the data which we have okay now what I can do is I can basically first apply these changes so that all my changes what I have done are applied right now once these changes are done we can basically go ahead and save this file so I can just say save I can go for save as I have different other options so if you would want to perform keep performing your transformation then you can just do this you can add a column you can view the data so for now our transformations are good enough and what we can do is we can basically go back to home we can do a close and apply and we will be back to our data set which has been modified so we can see if the data what we have has been transformed so we have ordered specs here that's good we did not do any filtering or uh, we, we have the filter left here 
which basically tells me that there are these different fields we have not removed them but what we are doing is we are just applying a filter to choose copiers and laser printers so that's what we have here and this is good enough now what I can do is once this is done I can basically save it so I would want to call it some kind of report if you would want to create okay so let's call it as uh, uh, let's say second report and here I will say country and technology specific info let's save it and now basically I have saved my data so what you can do is you can go for creating other report or basically having this information published if that's what you want to do if you want to go for visualization because right now what we are seeing is we have a lot of data here we have a lot of data here it shows me there are these uh, tables or data sets which we have worked on that shows me here in the models but there is no relationship with them if you go into visualization then you don't have any option or you have not created any visualizations based on this data but if you go here now based on the data what we transformed if you see we have order specs right now that's what we chose we basically have other fields so you have ship date you have aggregated columns which can be used for visualizing and we can work on this so I can come back here and what I would be interested in is this data set is fine but I want to do some grouping I want to basically have some selective data in this and for that what I can do is uh, let's go for ship mode now this is something what we have so we are in this data field now we have this transform so let's go back to transform again and let's choose our orders so that's the data we have and now if you see here this is you know huge amount of data what we want is we want to group them based on the shipping mode so here you have an option called group by so I can select this I can go in here I can basically work on okay get rid of duplicate values but that's not what we want to do you want to do a group by so as I said you can do a group by from here or you can choose from the transform option above and you can do a group by so let's do a group by now how do you want to group the data so I'm saying I want to group the data here based on shipping mode or which is the other column you want to use to do a group by so let's go for shipping mode and what is the new column name right so we want to basically find out that you want to go for ship mode but that's not enough I mean I can do a ship mode and I can do a grouping by but you want to just count the rows no that's not what we want to do so let's go to advanced so ship mode is fine so that's your grouping right but then what we also want to do is we want to do a grouping based on say sales so here for example let's go for sales okay and what should we call this so might be we can say uh, shipment wise sales whatever you would want to call so you can basically get the operation do you want to really count the rows no we want to basically do a summing or we want to might be find out an average price right so let's do a sum okay and here I would want to do a summing based on say for example sales so this is what I'm going to use for getting a count of the sales now grouping by might be we will change this instead of uh, 
instead of sales we are using a ship mode what we can also do is let's go for a segment and that would be valid grouping so it will take a combination of ship mode segmenting group the data based on that and then get me the sales which is which is basically let's call it shipment wise sales so it gets a sum so let's do a okay and that's my more relevant data which I'm looking at so I'm looking at the ship mode I'm looking at what is the segment and then I'm looking at what is the total sales there I'm looking at again the ship mode standard and home office so always remember when you are choosing multiple fields or multiple columns for grouping by you are basically having a combination of two fields so that has to be unique and your grouping is done based on that so now you're looking at the sales wise and this is something as an important information what we have so we have done some transformation and what you can do is you can use other ways like you can use pivot to get individual values from it you can run on merge queries which is basically running some merge queries and merge the query with another query in this workbook if you have so you can go for this now I can basically go for apply and close so just to add to the group by step what we did was if you see here I have removed the group by filter which we just did a couple of minutes back and what I have done is instead of transforming your complete data set you can basically create a copy of it so for example I can just do a copy and then I can come here and do a paste and I have done that and I'm calling it order summarized but this is my complete data now what we will do here is we will basically go ahead and do a grouping by again like what we did earlier based on your shipment based on your segment and based on the sales so that's what we are looking for so let's go for the ship mode and we go for group by and here you would want to go for advanced to ship mode and this one I will go for segment so that's fine now we want the new column name so let's say shipment wise sales so I want to do a summing not the counting of rows and I want to do a summation based on sales like what we did earlier and then you say OK and that basically gives you the data here now what we have is we have the resultant data based on the data which is coming in from here we did the same thing just one minute back but we worked on the original data set so what I did was I created a copy and now I'm working on this one so I'll say close and apply and now we are back to our desktop so it is applying these changes where we have done some transformations we have done some grouping by and what we can do is once we have the data here we can anytime look at our data sets or tables so this is my original one if you see now I have order summarized I can just pull out this information I basically have my returns which we have not really touched and we have the scientists so we have all the four data sets here now what we can also do is let's look into order summarized and we just have this data here so this is fine and you can continue working on this you can basically merge columns from two different data sets and then you can get the merged column and you can rename it so you can obviously do that you can basically do a uncheck whenever you are working on these data sets so what you can do is if you would want to work on transforming for example let's go back here and say I want to do some transformation on it so how did we do it we just did a transform and 
you can go back to transform so you have this data here and the data what you have you might be interested in transforming this into something else and then you don't want to maybe load this data so you have this option where you are selecting orders and then you have something called as enable load which can be unchecked so when you do a uncheck what will happen is whatever changes you perform only those changes related data set will be loaded and they will still be available but this will not affect your it will not affect your original one so for example let's say copy and let's go in here i will do a paste let's say orders oh i did a paste i need to rename this so let's do renaming let's say orders and here i will say summarized and i will say us so i'm renaming it now let that get loaded we can perform some transformations on it so i have here where's my country so let's look for country yeah and let's look for country so here i will go for only united states okay that's what i'm interested in and then i can choose well i am interested in just central us so i can basically go for just the central us and i can get rid of all of these So now I should have only central US data and this is fine and this is the data might be we are focusing on right now for doing some visualization might be looking at sales might be looking at the product names so you have the product name now remember you don't see any filters here right because the filters are coming from the resultant set and your transformation so if you have any filters you would be seeing in the top row now this is the data we have let's uh, let's not restrict it to region region would then reduce my data but that's good enough for us i can just say no i'm clearing off this filter i'm still looking at united states but i want to look at all the regions yeah what are we would be interested in category and that's anyways chosen as technology which we had chosen when we were loading the data we have copiers and machines right and we can basically keep this now this is fine i can apply the changes i can apply the changes based on this one and what i can do is i can just say for now apply so that's going to apply all the changes which you have done in orders or summary or the new one right and what i can do is now i can choose order and i can say don't enable this in load so it says disabling load will remove the table from the report and any visuals that use its columns will be broken we are not creating any visuals as of now the table will be removed so that's fine and now i will say close and apply so what happens is you are loading the data based on the changes okay now you have your order summarized you have returns you have scientist but you basically do not have orders anymore so that was not loaded so i only have this one i only have this one and you have returns you have scientist you don't have the orders column right now that particular data set was not loaded at all because we did not choose that to be loaded right now while i'm in this orders which is let's see here and actually you can drag in yeah so you have order summary and this has basically kind of data which i'm looking for so i really don't need the orders table so you can do it in steps and you can aggregate this you can have aggregated data you can have all the data which is filtered transformed grouped by and then basically just load it and the original data set which you used that's no more 
being loaded here. Now at any point of time, if I really want, I can go back to transform data and remember, it is still here. It is still here, it's not gone, right? So you can basically select this and you can say enable load and you will have the data back which you can continue working on, right? So these are some quick transformations which really help us in working on the data. Now, obviously, if you have data, you want to perform some left joins, right joins, you have inner joins, outer joins, so you can always do that. You can take two different data sets, might be I'm interested in taking the orders summarized, which talks about standard class, consumer, shipment wise sales. And here, if I look at order summary, I have other details, but the thing is we need to make sure that these have the values. These have the values, say for example, the segment column here and the segment column here can really be used to join these two tables. So if I create a relationship or if I create a join, I can basically merge the data. So this is how you work on data. We will also see some more examples on might be modeling the data using some expressions to work on the data. So we already looked at creating a report, selecting particular fields and then publishing the report onto your Power BI service. Now this is the report which we had created which says state, order ID, sales and then I also added this returned field and that was basically by creating a relationship between order and returns which we can also have a look in model. So this is the relationship which is created. If you just place your cursor here, it tells me that we have a relationship between order ID of returns and order ID of orders and that basically allows me to join the data, bring it in my one report. Now this is basically your data sources you can look at and if you click on your visualization, so that shows you your report. Now what we can also do is we can make it interesting. Now we would not want to scroll through the fields to see wherever or what was the order or what was the order ID which was returned. Now I can do a sorting, I can filter out. What I can also do is I can use this option which shows slicer here and that basically allows me to work with this data. So we have this report here and basically as I said you can click in here it shows the data now what I can do is I would want to filter out information or slice the information using your returned either being yes or having a field which has no value how do we do that so basically I can drag and drop the returned here as a field which comes from returns now that basically shows me only the value is yes but I do know that there is there are some fields which are blank. Now, how do I add filter to this? So I can click on this one and then I can click on slicer. Now, once that does, so it basically pulls out all the different values. So you have either yes or you have the blank field for returned. So what we can do is we can select yes. You will see only the orders and their IDs and sales where the products were returned so that gives me 108,118 and I can select blank so that will basically get me all the orders or products which were not returned. Now this is a simple way wherein I can add a filter to or a slicer to my report to basically give viewers a choice of uh, selecting different fields and you can add any number of slicers. You can basically say I would want particular kind of information. So for example, if I go into orders and we know we have the state. Now I do have the state information here and basically I can, if I would be interested, I could filter this out in my report itself. I can sort it. I can look it in a different order. What I can also do is how about bringing in state here and basically dragging it here. So that gives me the state option. It is giving me a visual, which is basically giving me a geographic location of all these points. So yes, that can be good. What I can also do is I can keep this, which basically shows me the state 
map might be it can be useful you can zoom in you can zoom out you can look at specific information here you can drag and drop here so that's fine what i can also do is i can again take the state and bring it here and that basically can be instead of my map i can go for slicer so that gives me all the values here and which basically allows users to choose the fields or the states which you would be interested in looking at so for example if somebody is interested in looking at the data for georgia just select this one and you see the map automatically shows you where in the map that's the place and it shows me all the sales for georgia state now i can also basically select yes and that shows me which were the orders which were basically returned so that gives me a quick overview of state wise what is the geographical location if the orders were returned or maybe i can just click on blank and it shows me the non-returned orders i can again go here and uncheck the georgia option and that shows me all the states now once you have done this this looks like a comprehensive report which can be useful for the viewers for your management team and so on so we can just do a save and that basically is saving my report so i have this report now what if i publish this report so i can just do a publish and when i publish it says okay workspace so let's say select and then it says replacing this data set may impact two reports you already have a data set named by this one view the impact i would say replace or i will say view impact so that basically takes me to the power bi service because sometimes we may have some reports which we have already uploaded and updating an existing report might basically affect my existing report so it basically shows me the impact analysis it shows me one workspace there are two reports they are they have not been added to dashboard but these are the ones which will get modified so let's for example as of now go ahead here and let's look into my power bi so go back to your desktop and i'll say no i don't want to replace so click on cancel so i do not want to publish it or it might be what i can do is i can try saving it as a different report so let's say save as and now i will basically say additional filters okay let's save it so now you see the name on the top changes to additional filters and now it's save to publish this and now i can go ahead and publish it select your workspace and basically it says this is the report being published with our additional filters with a map which gives a geographical uh, area showing us the information and then basically what i can do is once it is done i can look into my power bi service like we did earlier you can do a filtering we can basically query this data we can share it with other users who might be interested in looking at this particular data now this says it is done so it says get quick insights and might be it's a good an option to look into what kind of insights it's it gives you so click on that see the beauty of power bi where it tries to search for any kind of insights which it can gather from the kind of report which you have built now once the insights are ready it will let you know what we can also do is we can come in here click on view data set so you see now it shows your additional filters and here you have option where it should be showing your report so let's say view and view is fine so and if it doesn't show up sometimes it might be taking taking time for refreshing so you can always go here and then you can click on your report and that should get populated so this is the report these are the filters which i have gives me an option of choosing all the states 
and basically allows me to edit the report and look at all the information here. Meanwhile, we can see here it is still trying to gather some insights from the data. And now you see there are some insights here. So it says sales, which is coming up and a subset of your data was analyzed and the following insights were found. So you're looking at sales by ship mode. So it says standard class, second class, first class and same day. So there were different shipping modes in our data. And that's what it shows me the sales, which one had the majority. It shows me the profit. So which city or state had more profit. So New York City has noticeable more profits here. Average by shipping cost by subcategories. So there are these different subcategories which we can look at such as copiers and machines have noticeably more shipping cost profit by product name and you can basically look at the row ID and quantity. So this is where you're looking at a regression analysis. You're looking at row ID and quantity. So there is a correlation between row ID and quantity. So these are two different variables or fields which are related. You're looking row ID by category. Row ID. So it says California has noticeably more row IDs. Sales. Your profit count of region and count of returns. So there is a correlation again between two different variables. Average of shipping cost. Now we would have taken a lot of time building all these visualizations, but Power BI has already helped you in gathering all these insights. And then you can basically select which one of these is what you're interested in. You can focus and look for more information based on all the fields it has given you good amount of insights which will help anyone who is looking at this particular report. So that's your quick insights here and we have this information. Now once you have this information this is basically where you have your focus mode. So it says subset of your data was analyzed following insights were found. You can basically say download and uh, here you have other options which allow you to work with your Power BI. So let's look at this one. So this is where we have our report and we can continue exploring it more. One more interesting feature which Power BI has other than having your insights ready to use, which is basically in your workspace and you can basically use these insights what we are looking at various options here and basically you have this option where it says spin the visual if you are interested in a particular insight you can always spin it which you can always go back and look into what you can also do is you can also click on edit report here now that's a report which has already been published to your Power BI service not yet shared, but that can be shared or that can be subscribed. Now, once you click on edit report, it has option of reading view mobile layout. You have basically an option which says basically options for navigating through the data set. You can go for how visuals on the canvas interact with each other. You have all these options and one of the good options is ask a question. So you can always click on ask a question and that basically ba says some suggestions. Now you can open this and it says, okay, ask a question about your data. Try one of these to get started. What is the average sale? Sort orders by order date, sort orders by product ID. How many ship modes are there? Compare quantity and discount. So do not worry that your report has only four fields. So it has state, order ID, sales and returned with some filters. But what about you looking at how many ship modes are there? So it is already looking at your data. So if you click on this one here and you can see what are the different fields what we have and you have ship date and ship mode. So this is one of the fields which it is showing you to ask a question. Now what you can do is you can say how many ship modes are there. Let's click on that. Let's ask this question. It says four ship modes and do you want to add this to report? Yes, you can. You can let it be as it is. 
So you can basically keep this question here and here you have an option the visual is showing number of ship modes when you place your cursor here if you see here turn this q and a result into a standard visual and let's do that and basically it is saying number of ship modes right so now that's the power of your uh, bi power bi which has basically allowed you to ask a question and quickly add a visual to your report now what we can do is we can basically save this or you can say save as and give a different name so might be I'll just say save because I would want to have this information and the report is saved so in this way you can basically not only create smart visuals you can not only relate different data sources using data models or relationships you can add maps you can add filters you can add quick questions you can basically just go here and say for example you would want to ask a different question now we see the fields here how about looking at the shipping cost right so here i can say um what is the uh, highest shipping cost and that shows me some suggestions let's select that and that shows me the value which is great and I can keep it as it is I can basically convert this to a visual I may want to keep the question because might be this question was asked and uh, you would want to see the result here might be you can move this somewhere here and that gives me some kind of question which was asked and we can do a save and that's my report which has been saved in my bi service the data set is still there you can basically go ahead and share this um, let's take a look at some of the benefits of tableau as your business intelligence tool so why would we use tableau it can be connected to 40 different data sources. The more data sources it can connect to, it means that you are more likely to get direct access to your data. It can build interactive dashboards with just a few clicks, which can help you quickly understand your data, and it lets you see your outliers. There's also simple analytics built right into Tableau, such as trends and forecasting, that can help you understand your data on a deeper level. Tableau has been a leader in the Gartner Magic Quadrant, for the last six years, and that includes 2018. Here we will take a look at an overview of the products offered by Tableau. So we have Tableau Desktop, which is where you do all of your development. This is where you connect to and build visualizations and dashboards. Today we'll be using Tableau Public, which is a free version of Tableau Desktop, but with some limitations, such as having no R integration and it can only support up to a million rows of data. Also, any data published here is made public. So you can't use this for private company information. Then there's a new tool called Tableau Prep, where you can prepare your data by seeing it visually before you connect and build reports. There's also Tableau Online, which is a cloud-hosted version of Tableau Server, a place where you can publish your dashboards, and it enables you to share your dashboards in a secure way. Tableau Server has an option to be on-premises. So let's just do a quick comparison between building a visualization in Excel and building one in Tableau. Okay, so here we have an Excel file full of data that we will soon connect to and use for some of our demonstration purposes. And you can see that we have information about orders. If we wanted to find out the quantity sold and the sum of sales for each region, we could do that by creating a pivot table. So we'll make it, I selected my cells, we'll make it in a new worksheet. And here we have the beginnings of a pivot chart and we can grab region and pull it into our columns. And then we'll grab sales and put it into values. Um, and then we also wanna look at quantity and put that into values. And it's automatically summing up sales and quantity, but you can choose if you want it to be sum or not. And then um, we'll take our values and put it on rows so that we can see sales and quantity one on top of the other. And that's the basics of a pivot chart. Now let's do a similar thing in Tableau. Okay, so we have our connection to the data and Tableau automatically splits out 
the dimensions from the measures. We'll go into more depth on that later. But we can come and grab region and put it onto columns, and we get a similar thing, maybe a little nicer formatted. And then we can come and put quantity there. And if we want to add sales to it, we can double click on sales, and we'll have quantity and sales one on top of the other. We can put sales on top by dragging quantity down in that box. We also have this show me dialog box, which allows you to see what visualizations you could build using what's already on the screen or the things that you have selected. So right now we could quickly switch it to bar charts and now we can see quantity and sales across our region with bar charts. Or we could switch it to stacked bars and we can see our quantity across the regions. If you close that we can see our legend over here and then our sales across the region. So in Tableau we have a lot of really quick flexibility to turn just text into a visualization. So in summary we can see a side-by-side -side of what we made using pivot tables in Excel and what we made in a similar amount of time in Tableau. Let's get started with the Tableau installation. As for requirements, you need Windows 7 or later or you need your Mac operating system to be 10.11 or later. Here are some of the browsers you can use to install Tableau. We will be installing Tableau Public today, and to do that, you just Google Tableau Public Download and click on that first link, and then you put in your email address and click Download the app. So, let's just look up Tableau Public Download, and it's this first one. You can click Download Now, and it takes you to the Tableau Public page where you can click Sign In and create an account free. This gives you a place to save the visualizations you make, but keep in mind that anything you save on Tableau Public is public. And then you come here and you enter your email address and click download the app and it should give you an executable file that you will download. And once it's downloaded, you should be able to open Tableau Public. So let's go take a look at the Tableau Public opening page. So this is what Tableau Public looks like when you first open it. On your left, you have the different things you can connect to. This is more limited in Tableau Public than it is in Tableau Desktop. So if you invest in Tableau Desktop, you have many, many things you can connect to. You can also connect to data by clicking this drop-down Connect Data piece. That's especially useful when you've already started your visualization. Then we have this central portion called Open. This is where anything that you have opened up previously will show up. You can also click open from Tableau Public, and when you have, my connection's timed out so I need to log in, um, but when you log in, it says no workbooks found, try publishing first. This is where you'll see all of your published Tableau Public dashboards. Over here we have discover, and it has some how-to videos, um, visualization of the day, which is where people who have made Tableau Public visualizations get recognized for their skill and you get some pretty cool ideas when you look there. So let's get started by connecting to a data source. We'll click Microsoft Excel and we'll choose our Excel file and open it up. And this is our data source page. This shows you the sheets on the Excel file and allows you to drag them in so that you can see the data show up. This gives you a preview of what your data will look like. You can see the Tableau is starting to classify our fields. So anything that has ABC on it um, shows that that's a column that has strings in it. We also have a globe, which is where Tableau has recognized these values to be geographical. So we have um, state, and it's recognized that it contains states. It bases it on the keywords that it stores to identify if it's geographical. And so it takes a look, and you've named it city, and it knows that city is geographical. We also have the calendar symbol, where it's recognized that it's a date field. And we also have row ID that shows up with the hashtag, and it recognizes it's a number. So now that we have our data source pulled in, we can come here and hit Sheet, which is where you start to build your visualization. Let's take a look at all the different pieces of this before we go any further. We have the data that we're connected to up here. It's our orders sheet from the Sample Superstore Excel sheet. We have dimensions on top and measures on bottom. These are where we're going to get the fields to drag and drop. Here we have our cards. We'll look more in depth at our cards in a moment. And these are our shelves, the column shelf and the row shelf, 
where you can drag things in to make changes happen in the visualization center. We have our show me tabs where you can see, we took a brief look at this earlier, but you can see all of the different visualizations you can build here. A neat thing about show me is that when you hover, it will tell you what types of fields you need to build it. So for a symbol map, try one geographical field, zero or more dimensions, or zero to two measures. And that's what, how you can build a geographical symbol map. And when you're done with show me, you just close it. Let's take a look here at our sheets. So we have sheet one and sheet two. A sheet is basically just one visualization at a time. Let's get rid of the extra sheet. We have a dashboard, which is where you can pull multiple sheets on to show multiple visualizations at one time. And then we have what's called a story, which allows you to show a sequence of visualizations so that you can tell a story. Perfect. Okay, so we saw that Tableau is categorizing our different fields and it is also giving it a role. So we have dimensions on top and measures on bottom. Dimensions contain descriptive values such as names, dates, and geographical data. You can use dimensions to reveal details in your data that is qualitative details. We also have measures which contain numeric, quantitative values that you can measure. Measures can be aggregated, and when you drag a measure onto the view, Tableau will apply an aggregation to that measure. It's sum by default. So let's show this by building what we built before. We'll grab region, and we'll see its four distinct values as a dimension. And then we'll double click on quantity, and we can see the numbers here the measures and you can see here that it is the sum of quantity and now we can also double click on sales and we can see quantity and sales to discuss a little bit more about dimensions and measures you can see that in general measures are numbers and dimensions are not but sometimes like row id it is a number now why would we have a number up here instead of in the measures? So you can tell the difference between number, whether it should be in measures or it should be in dimensions, based on whether you'll need to do any calculations on it, or if you would want to be able to aggregate it at some time. So for sales, if you have several orders in a day, you might want to know what the sum of those sales are. But if you have several orders in a day, and they are on rows 2, 3, 4, and 5, you might not want to know the sum of the rows. So Tableau is smart enough that when it sees ID, it knows that it belongs up in the dimensions. Now you can switch. So if row ID was actually something you would want to aggregate for some reason, you can drag it down to the measures and add it down there. But in our case, row ID isn't something that you want to sum or average. Can you think of any other numbers that might not show up as a measure that should be a dimension? Comment below with your answers. As we discussed before, dimensions are on top, measures are on bottom, and you can see the blue is associated with dimensions and green is associated with measures. But it's a little bit more complicated than that. So dimensions are qualitative and measures are quantitative, but blue means we want our label to be discrete and green means we want our label to be continuous. Let's make a new sheet and make a visualization to kind of show this. So we can bring on quantity and we're going to use it as a dimension but you can see even when it's a dimension you can choose continuous or discrete so right now it's a dimension but it's green it's a little bit different than what you might expect and then we'll do sales so now we can see over the different quantities what our sales was yeah has been for this last this period of time that we're looking at I believe it's four years so for when people bought three items the total sales was that number and you can see that this is an axis so it's from 1 to 15 now if we change it from continuous to discrete you can see that 1 is a label 2 is a label and it's not an axis ranging from 1 to it doesn't even have 15 because there are no values under 15 these are just individual labels so we go back it's green again and you can see that it's an axis so we have two greens on here so we have two axes and change it back to discrete and now we have one axis and one set of individual labels so let's go back to our sheet 3 
we have all of these different sales by the different quantity numbers and up here we have our sorting when you hover it tells you what kind of sorting is going to happen so we could sort quantity descending by sales so we can see that when they buy three things we have the highest sales you can do the opposite where it's the lowest to the highest number of sales you can also do sorting more in depth by clicking on the quantity and right clicking sort so we could just sort by descending or ascending or by sales or alphabetic which is not what we want you can choose the field or you can manually change your sorting here and now we're back to what we had at the beginning now that we've had an overview of how Tableau works, let's go into a little more detail. Tableau is very much built on the premise of drag and drop. So let's build a simple visualization and talk about what each of these shelves and marks cards specifically do. So we're going to make a simple chart which is average sales by region. So we know we want sales on let's do sales on rows now for rows and for metrics since this is continuous like we talked about before it's making an axis for our sales um, we also can drag region onto columns and it makes one column per region so that's how it works with dimensions if you um pull a dimension onto columns, you're saying I want one blank per column. I want one region per column. So if you wanted to do it by instead of region, um, if you want to remove something from a visualization, you just pull it back off. Or you can hit undo or control Z. Uh, Tableau has the benefit of having unlimited undos. So let's say we wanted to bring on city let's say we want one column per city and that's what you get and there's a lot of cities so that's what it looks like let's take city back off I want one column per region and for sales I want my rows axes to show me where sales are great now let's say we want to adjust the color of these bars you can click on color and you can select any of them so let's pick this nice blue or we can pick an orange and that's how you can determine the color um, but if you want something else to determine the color you can take region and drag it onto color and now we have one color per region now with measures again since they're continuous it's going to be more like a scale so if I want them to be a different color based on sales and I pull sales onto color it's going to be darker where there's higher sales and lighter where there's lower sales so it's continuous from light to dark but for region it is one color per region so they're distinct colors it's not continuous great um let's say we want to sort this biggest to smallest and we can look at size here so if we want to adjust the size manually we can click on it and drag it but if we want the size to be based on something else um, you choose a measure for the size so if we want it to be wider based on sales we will drag sales onto size and we can see that it gets bigger with bigger sales we can do the same thing and replace the sales with profit and now it's bigger if there is bigger profit and drag that back off so you can determine it manually or you can do it with your measures um, for label let's say we want the sales onto label now we can see the exact sales number for each region um, what if we wanted the name of the region there as well we can drag region onto labels and we can see sales for the west region um, you can adjust which one goes on top see how we have two T's here those are both labels great uh, tooltip 
when we click on tooltip, it'll show us what's going to happen when we hover. So as I hover here on east, it says region east sales, and that shows the sales amount. Um, now we talked about, I'll take my labels back off, wanting to make this visualization not for the sum of sales, but for the average of sales. So we will right click on our sum of sales here in the rows, hover over measure, um, which right now is sum, and change it to average. And we have a different result here. So let's sort again. And we can see that the south region actually has the highest average of sales, which was not the case for the sum. Now let's say we want our sum, or I mean our sales to be on the label, but look, it's giving us the sum of sales label. So we just do the same thing and change it to average. Now we can see our average on the label. Uh, the label has some interesting options, like you can format this, and we could say maybe we want it to be all of them to be blue, and that happens right there. You can also choose to only show the minimum and the maximum. This becomes handy on a line chart where you don't want all marks labeled because it gets very messy, but you want the tallest and the shortest part to be labeled. And maybe you just want the tallest, so we'll click Label Minimum Value and remove that checkbox, and now we just have the tallest value there. And one card that we haven't used yet is the Filters card. So we could allow people to look at this, but rem only certain regions. So what we can do is we can come over to Region and right-click on it and click Show Filter, and it will add it to that Filters card and now we can remove central from the mix and just look at those ones. You see if we remove south, the new highest, east, now has the label, but if we put it back in, south will have the label again. If we don't want to have these filters, we can pull it off there, or if we wanted to filter out by country, oh, we just have United States, so let's not filter by country, um, but we could pull in category, and we have these filters by category. If we select them all, they'll all be there. And we click Show Filter and it will bring it over here. And we can remove out technology. And the self still has the highest for the other two. But if we only include technology, you can see the difference there. So that's the basics of filters. One Another thing that I can mention here is that you can change the type of mark manually. So you saw when we pulled on region and we pulled on sales, it automatically made us a bar chart, but we could change this to be a line chart. And you can see that the color changes because we told it to based on region. So we pull that off, then it would be a line chart there. You can change it to be a lot of different type of visualizations here. So when you're not using show me to help determine your graphs, you can choose it manually right here. Okay, now let's look at building a scatter plot. So a scatter plot is when you have a bunch of shapes and points on a visualization with two axes that are both measures. So if we take sales and put it on the Y axis and we take discount and put it on the X axis, we can see our point that represents all of our data with the sum of sales and the sum of discount. And if we wanted to see this per order, we'll take order ID and put it onto detail. Now what detail does is it determines the level that we are building our visualization at. So grabbing order ID and putting onto detail gives us all of these little points. So for each order, what was our sales and what was our discount? So we have out here some outliers that you can find very quickly. Let's actually do product ID instead. So I'll put it right over top of order ID and it will replace it. Now we see all of our products. Anything that has high sales is up here. Anything that has high discount is over here. You can see that it sort of has a trend where things with high sales do not have high discounts, which makes sense. If we wanted to know what category these products 
all show up in, we could take category and put it onto shape. And now we have three different shapes that tell us the categories. Tableau has a cool new highlight feature, which allows you to show just the dimension that you want to see, but it leaves the other ones in place. So for example, if we click on furniture, first we have to turn on the highlight feature, and then click on furniture. And now you can see all of the furniture items popping up in our visualization and how they're kind of clustered in this area and the pattern for them. When we click on technology, we can see their pattern, which is a little bit different. So we have them by shape with category. Let's drag category onto color as well. If you remember, category will determine the color and the shape at this point. And so we can kind of see the patterns happening there. So if we want to see our high discounted items, they're all over here. And most of the things that are getting high discounts are office supplies, which is interesting. And then our highest sales product up here, now we could take that product ID and find out what that product actually is out of our, oh, look, we have product name. Let's replace product ID with product name. And we see that that is a Canon Image Class Advanced Copier. So this copier is our big salesperson. And office supplies binders do not give us very many sales and we're highly discounting them. So now you know a little bit more about the details card and the shapes card and about using highlighting in Tableau. So let's say we wanted to know by subcategory what our profit is like. We could grab subcategory and pull it onto columns and we would say we want one column per subcategory and then let's grab profit and pull it onto rows and you can quickly see which categories are profitable and which ones are not. So we can also take profit and put it onto color so that you can see that even more clearly. Right now it is going from orange to blue which is Tableau's default. If we wanted to change from what color to what color it was going. We have a lot of options in here when you go to edit colors. So maybe you wanted to go from red to blue just to emphasize that the profit that's negative is bad. So we can hit apply and now we can see red to blue. We have our categories here, our subcategories here, but let's separate it out by category. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna take subcategory off. I'm gonna put on category and that's my category and then I'm gonna put subcategory on after it so when we put it in order like this the order matters in Tableau so first it breaks it up by category and then inside of that it breaks it up by subcategory so furniture is all here and then there's our subcategories under furniture if we were to move subcategory to the front it really doesn't group it appropriately because first it's breaking it up by subcategory and then by category and that's not effective. We end up with furniture, 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 furniture spread out across our visualization. So again, let's put category to the front. And now we have our profit by category by subcategory. And we can click sort subcategory descending by profit. And now what it does is within the highest group, within each group, it then sorts it by profit so you can tell it's not going to break this group apart to move tables to the very end it's going to keep tables inside of furniture and then it doesn't move furniture to the very end either so what we have here is a quick view by category by subcategory how we're doing on profit we can see that tables is our biggest drain on profit and so if we wanted to improve the profitability of furniture, maybe we would not sell tables anymore. It's just not working out for us. Another thing about this visualization that we could do to improve it is you can see that there's some of these words are getting cut off. So we could right click on this axis and click rotate label. And now you can read the whole word. And so that's helpful. Also up here we have our title, which right now is the same name as our sheet. 
So if we rename the sheet to profit by subcategory, then it names the title up here. So this is making it look a little bit better. And then here we have profit and it shows it but without any like dollar signs. So let's come up here to profit and click format and you can see that we can format the sum of profit to be currency. And we can do it currency by the thousands and we can get rid of these decimal places and now you can see it's just a little bit nicer, a little bit more clear. Maybe we don't have to have the label here that says category slash subcategory. So we can hide field labels for columns because it's pretty clear that these are categories and these are subcategories. So those are some formatting tips for you. Formatting in Tableau is one of those things where there are just a lot of different ways you could change things. So in more in-depth videos, especially from Simply Learn, you'll learn more and more about this. Also, as we are building these visualizations, if you want to have access to this data set so that you can build along with me, just make a comment in the comments below and the Simply Learn team will send you this data set. Now we're going to take a look at creating a hierarchy in Tableau. So we'll make a new tab. And we're going to make a sheet called sales by product. And so we will be looking at sales as a number. And let's bring on product name. Now there are a lot of product names, so it's going to make sure that you really want to do this. I'm going to click add all members. And now we can see all of our products and their sales over all time. So if we sort this, we can see our highest sale selling item, which we discovered earlier as the advanced copier. And we scroll down to the bottom, our lowest selling items. So we have our products and we can group that by subcategory. And you can see I need to put it in the front again and by category. All right, I'm gonna take product name back off and we're gonna talk about hierarchies. So a product rolls up into a subcategory, which rolls up into a category. You can create a hierarchy by, let's start with subcategory and dragging it onto category. And it's going to create a hierarchy. We'll call it our product hierarchy. And now it knows that category is the parent to subcategory. Let's do the same thing by grabbing the product name and putting it underneath subcategory. So now it knows category is the parent, then there's subcategory, and then there's product name. This allows you to, instead of pulling this off or putting it back on, you can bring category on, and then you can expand it by pressing this plus button. And now we see, but here's our sales by category, by subcategory. And then here's our sales by category, by subcategory, by product name. This is really useful when you're creating a detail section for your users. And so when somebody wants to know, let's say you have show filter for category and a filter for subcategory filter for subcategory and they're looking at category here and they're just like I see technology has the highest sales and I just want to see technology so I'm going to unclick furniture and office supplies let's put category on top and then so I just have technology well I want to see what has the highest sales inside of technology and let's sort it Oh, phones phones does so I just actually want to look at phones so I'm gonna remove accessories copiers and machines and what has the highest sales inside of phones? And sort it. And now I can see quickly the detailed information without having to change my visualization. Let's give this visualization a little more depth. First, I'll add back in all of our categories and subcategories by showing across region. So we know technology had the highest, but how does it look across region? Now, part of the point of Tableau is to allow the users to read the visualizations very quickly. And when you have big 
blocks of text like this, it's kind of hard to see which one has the highest because it doesn't quite stand out very quickly. So what we can do is take sales and drag it onto color. Let's change our marks to a square. And now it's going to color each of these. It colors every one of these cells based on its darkness for sales. This is a little bit heavy of a color. You can click color here and change the opacity to give it a little bit of a lighter look. Just makes it a little bit see-through. Great, so now it's a lot easier to see that the west seems to have the highest sales and that technology in the east is the very highest. So now when we drill into subcategory, it keeps that coloring and we can see more in depth and quicker that phones has the highest across most of them. It's not quite the highest in the west because chairs is the highest in the west. There is one place in Tableau where hierarchies are built in and that's in dates. So dates in Tableau can be very complex because they allow very complex visualizations. So we will not go into depth about dates at this time, but let's take a look at how they work for hierarchies. So we have order date that we can pull onto columns here, and you can see that it's blue, meaning that it's discrete. So each one of these is a header instead of it being an axis across the top. Now let's drag profit onto rows. So now we can see our profit over time for each of these years. And Tableau has some hierarchies built into dates already, so when I click this plus on columns, it'll split it out into quarters. So this is a header, and these are all subheaders underneath that header, because it is distinct um, and discrete right now instead of continuous. So it's split out year, 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 and quarters, 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 quarters. This allows you to quickly compare quarter one across all of the years, and quarter two across all of the years, and quarter four across all of the years. Another way you could add some more detail to this is by taking maybe category and pulling out a color. And now we have one line for each category and we can see that a uh, drop in technology is a big part of the responsibility for that drop we were seeing in quarter two of 2016. So let's take that back off and let's take quarter back off and let's explore continuous dates. So here in dates we have our top section of dates and then you see it repeats and we have the bottom section of dates. So we've got year but we also have year here quarter and quarter. Now the top ones are all discrete and when I change it to a bottom one, year, same thing, same year, it changes it to be green and now it's continuous. So now instead of this being a header for 2013 and a header for 2014, it's an axis. So the difference here is when I press the plus and it changes it to quarter, instead of adding quarter to year, now it's doing quarter for each year and making one continuous line and we can keep going and drill down to month. You can go pretty far. Now when we add category as color we get our three lines for the three categories and we also have highlighting turned on here still so when we click on technology we can highlight technology with the others in the background so we don't lose the context of the other categories. Let's take that back off. Next, let us talk about calculated fields. So we'll make a new sheet, and we're going to create our first calculated field. We can create a calculated field by clicking this arrow, which gives us some options, and clicking Create Calculated Field. Or we can come and click in the white space below Dimensions or below Measures, and we right-click and click Create Calculated Field. Let's name it Profit Ratio. So this is for if we wanted to create a visualization that showed the profit ratio, but we don't have that measure readily available to us. To bring in fields for our calculation, you can do it in one of two ways. One is to start typing it, and it will start auto-prompting you for the different measures or for different calculations or values you can use, or you can come and drag it in. So if we want profit and we want sales, if we do profit divided by sales, that is 
a profit ratio unaggregated. Okay, and let's make a second calculated field. We could come here and click duplicate, and that will duplicate our field. But I just want to start over again, so I'll click create calculated field, and I will call it profit ratio aggregated. And in this one, we're going to do sum, click, of profit, click, divided by sum of sales. Okay, so now, what's the difference between profit ratio aggregated and profit ratio unaggregated? How will those behave differently in Tableau? Let's look at this by looking at a single order. So first, let's bring on all the orders and all the products under that order. And let's look at this order. So I want to filter this whole dashboard to only this order. So I can right click on it and click keep only. That creates a filter up here that only has that box checked. And if I want to get rid of this later, I can just pull it right off of filters and everything will come back. But I want to, so keep only. And now let's take a look at profit ratio aggregated. I double clicked on it and I added it here and profit ratio unaggregated. Again, double clicking and now they're side by side. Let's give us a little bit of more room. So when I dragged that out, it gave us more room so we could see them side by side in the entire titles. Okay, so I chose to look at one order and these product names because the combination of order and product name is unique, one per row. We know that Tableau will aggregate the data up to the lowest level in the visualization, and I brought it all the way down to the lowest level of the data source, so we have no aggregation right now. So. When we're looking at it without any aggregation, these two calculations are the same. Profit ratio aggregated, let's look at that again. We'll click edit, and that's the one where we sum profit and sum sales before we divide. And then we've got profit ratio unaggregated. So let's also look at profit and look at sales. This is a technique that I use when I'm trying to understand how my calculated fields are working, try to break it down to the lowest level possible and see if it's doing what I expect. So we've got profit and we've got sales. Now, both of them are at 0.5 or 50%, and that's because profit is eight and sales is 16 for Adam's telephone messaging. Now, let's take off product name. When we take off product name, we can see that they start to vary. We've got profit ratio aggregated and profit ratio unaggregated. So here we have profit and sales. The profit ratio should be profit divided by sales. So let's open up a calculator and make it a little smaller. So if we take profit at 219.1 and divide it by sales at 508.6, we get 0.4, not 1.8. So where does this 1.8 come from? Well, let's put product name back on here. What happens is with profit ratio aggregated, it sums up the profit and then divides it by the sum of sales. So that's what we did. When we took off profit ratio and aggregated, we had the sum of profit and divided it by the sum of sales, which is what we want. Profit ratio unaggregated, however, does the calculation profit divided by sales and then sums it afterwards. You can see it right here. It's the sum of profit ratio unaggregated. So it makes this calculation and then it adds up 0.5 plus 0.5 plus 0.3 plus 0.5. And that's where we get our 1.8, which is what we see when we pull off product name, 1.8. So for most calculations, you want to do profit ratio aggregated, where you determine how it's aggregated before you do the calculation. So let's remove profit ratio unaggregated and delete it. Let's go to profit ratio aggregated and just call it profit ratio. Perfect, now we no longer need anything that we have on our visualization right now, so let me show you a quick trick to clear the board. Tableau has this button up here, which is called Clear Sheet. You can also do on Windows Alt Shift Backspace, and you just click Clear Sheet, and it will start you over with that sheet. And that really helps when you've dragged a bunch of things on and really made a mess when you're trying things out.
Okay, so we're going to build a visualization and we're going to look at region and we're going to look at it by profit ratio. And so now we have this bar chart by profit ratio. Let's color this by region. We can also pull on profit and sales and we can see all three of them side by side split out by region. Now let's say we also wanted to see each region by sales per customer. So let's create some calculated fields that will help us do that. Let's create our first calculated field that's going to get us a count of customers. Let's call it total number of customers. And so we have customer name and customer ID. Let's do count distinct of customer ID. And that gives us the total number of customers. Apply. So right now, we could take total number of customers and see which categories have the highest number of customers. Perfect, but that's just one part of our calculation. We want to see total sales divided by total number of customers. So let's make our second calculated field, and we're gonna call it sales per customer. We're gonna do our sum of sales, which we can drag in and divide that by total number of customers. Now you see that calculated field we just made pops up inside of our calculation dialog box. And we hit apply and it shows up, so we hit okay. And let's replace total number of customers with sales per customer. And now we can see our sales per customer ratio and which ones have the highest. For, for this next part, I'm going to make a couple of visualizations in a row that all apply to the same information using a couple of different tactics. So first, let's use show me. So I want to look at region and sales for this visualization. So I'm going to control click region after I click sales. So one more time, I'm going to click on sales and I'm going to control click region and I'm going to click show me and it's going to give me all of the different visualizations I could make with region and sales. Let's pick tree map. Great, so now we have a tree map that shows us our sales by region and we have the size and the color of the box is both sales. So let's say we wanted the size to be sales but the color to be profit. So let's grab profit and drag that onto sales. So now we can see our most profitable to our least profitable. Let's edit our colors and we're going to change it from red to blue diverging. Red to blue. But let's go to advanced and make the center number zero. This means that it will never be red unless it's less than zero. So let's hit apply. So it's all blue and if anything ever goes negative then it will be red. Okay. Let's call this sheet sales profit by region. Perfect. Now we're going to start using our geographical fields. So we have state, city, country, and postal code. Let's double click on state and see what happens. Awesome. So it is generated these two fields. Tableau has generated longitude and latitude for us and it's been able to recognize the states in the United States and where they're located and given it a longitude and latitude. So next we will look at sales by state by double clicking on sales and what it's done was change the size of the dot based on sales. Now I think I'm going to move sales from size to color and it has automatically changed it to a filled map instead of dots on a map. Perfect. So now we can see the states with the biggest amount of sales. Let's put it back onto size and we have our circles again. Let's put sales onto size, not state onto size. And we have our circles again. But let's make them a little bit bigger. These two marks on the Tableau size line are to give you an idea of how big and how small you should go before it gets too difficult to see. So when we go bigger than the bigger line, it detects that you're getting close to having overlap. 
but it's up to you as the builder. Okay, so we have size for sales again, and for profit onto color again. So you can see anything that is more profitable is darker, and anything that is less profitable, or less than zero in this case, is orange. Let's do what we did with color before. Change it to red, blue diverging, and set our center point to zero. Okay, so now we know that if anything is red, it was negative in profit. Perfect, let's name this sheet sales profit by state. Great, now let's look at sales and profit by category. So we have category and we've made columns. So this is when we drag something to the columns shelf, just remember we want one column per category. And let's double click on sales and it's going to put it into text and that's not what I want so let's take sales and drag it onto rows and it automatically makes a bar chart so now we have a one bar with the axis of sales for furniture office supplies and technology now let's take profit and also put it on rows so now we have two bar charts one for sales and one for profit we can change which one is a bar and which one is maybe a bubble chart by clicking on its appropriate marks card. So if we want to change them both, we can click on all and change them both to maybe circles. And you can see how they go up and down. But if we want to just change one of them, let's put those back to automatic. We'll go to profit and change that one to the circles. So now we can see those profit numbers. And if we want them to be overlaid on the same area, we would right click on profit, the second measure on the rows, and click dual axis. So now let's put them onto the same axis. You can see that their axes are not lined up. Let's go to sales and change it back to a bar. So now we have two charts occupying the same space. One of them is a bar chart and one of them is a bubble chart. And we can see our sales versus our profit. At least they're not the same amount of dollars, obviously, but we can see a higher sales and a higher profit. We also have medium sales and a medium profit. We have a medium sales, but a really low profit, and it's interesting to see that contrast. So let's rename this sheet as sales profit by category. And finally, we're going to make our details sheet. So we're going to go down to subcategory level and bring it onto rows. And remember, subcategory can expand out to the actual products. Let's bring that back in. And we're going to bring sales onto columns, which makes us a sales bar chart, and profit onto columns, which makes us a profit bar chart. Now let's color them by their appropriate individual color. So we'll go to the sales marks card and drag sales onto color. Now sales is colored by sales. We'll do the same thing here we did before. We'll go red blue diverging and make the center zero. We actually don't have to do that for, for sales because sales will never be negative, but it's pretty important for profit. So we'll, we'll go to the profit marks card and take profit onto color and do the same thing there. We have red blue diverging, advanced, center is zero. Great. So now if it's negative, it will be there. So let's sort this by profit. And so both of them have sorted with profit in mind. And we can easily see our subcategories that have a negative profit. Let's rename this, and we'll call it our details sheet. So now we have these four visualizations that all have to do with similar information. I think I want these bigger on the states. So we'll just keep making that bigger. Perfect. Now we're going to make our first dashboard. So for our dashboard, we have information over here that shows you what sheets you can bring on. These get a little bit more complex, so they'll be covered in more in-depth type of videos. And then we have our size. So we could make a range of sizes based on um, maybe what you're viewing this on. But we're just going to change it to a fixed size and we're going to make it 1400 by 1000 and this is our 
dashboard size. So let's bring on sales profit by region, sales and profit by state. Now a map needs a little bit more horizontal space than region does. Let's bring sales and profit by category underneath the region and the detail underneath the state. Give our map more space again. Perfect. Now Tableau has this neat feature called Uses Filter. So you can click Uses Filter here and now if I click on any of these it will filter the other dashboards based on these features. So if I just want to look at the south and I click on south it zooms in to all my south states. Now my categories have updated to be just the south ones and my details have updated as well. So we could see that central has pretty big sales, you know, bigger than the south, but the profit is lower than the south. So we can click on central and focus on central. Let's use that uses filter on all three of these dashboards that lead us up to the detail. So building a quick dashboard like this, let's make this taller, would allow you to do some sort of analysis such as, let's take a look at Central because they have relatively high profits but low sales. So we click on Central and then we see, oh man, Texas is having a really hard time. So let's click on Texas and now we're seeing in Texas that we have negative profit in these categories. So we can control click on furniture and office supplies and we can see all of our products that are really just killing us in Texas, all of our subcategories. And if we want to go deeper into products, we'll just click that plus sign. And now we see all the products and we'll sort again. And we can see all the products by subcategory that are really just killing us and are maybe not worthwhile to make anymore. So we're going to have to reconsider making the 3.6 cubic foot counter height office refrigerator, at least for Texas. It's not very helpful there. And then when you back out of that subcategory section, you can also click somewhere neutral in the dashboard or click on each thing that you had selected to unselect it and go back to the main part of your visualization and start it all over again. Now let's move on and take a look on how to create parameters and sets. So new sheet and let's make a quick visualization that will apply our parameters and our sets to. So let's take a look at all of our customers by their sales and let's sort customer name descending by sales. Great. So now we're going to make a parameter that will allow the user of the dashboard to choose how many customers they want to see how many of our top customers that they want to see. So let's click this down arrow and click create parameter and we will name it top n customers. Great. We're going to make it an integer and we're going to give them the option to choose the number of customers within a range. Our low is going to be 5 so we'll let them see 5 or up to 20 and we're going to let them skip with step size of 5. Let's start their current value right in the middle with 10. Okay, so now if you want to see how this parameter looks, you can come down to parameters. You, before we only had dimensions and measures on the left side of our Tableau workspace, but now we have parameters that it's appeared once we create a parameter. We can right click on that parameter and click show parameter control and we can see our top end customers. Right now our parameter control isn't built into any of our visualizations, but you can see how it works. We allow them to go down to 5 and up to 20 with steps of 5. Great! Now we're going to create a set. A set is a custom field that defines a subset of data based on some conditions. So the set we're going to build is going to be based on customer name. So when you right click on customer name you can come down and click create, hover on create, and create a set. With so far when we created a parameter and a calculated field you clicked here with this down arrow and you saw create calculated field and create parameter but it's not there a set has to be based on an existing field so you come and you click on the field you want it to be based on and then hover on create and you see set so here's how we can create a set let's name it top n customers by sales so we're going to allow them to select the top n customers and have that select our top customers by sales 
So we want this set to include anything that is in the top however many they define by the parameter by sales. So you can come over here to top and change it to by field. We want it to be top, but not just top static 10. We're going to click here and our parameter shows up. So it's going to be top, top end customers. And then you can choose another field here to, for it to be defined by and it's sales. And we want it to be by sum of sales. If we wanted it to be by the average profit, we can come here and click profit and change this to average. And now we would see our top end customers by average profit. But we want sales and sum. Okay, so we've created our set and we can drag it onto rows to see how it works. And we can see these are our top 10 customers by their sales. And we have this in slash out that's generated by our set. So if we take our set, first let's see how this line moves when we change our number here. So right now it's 10. When we move it up, we see our line moves down to include the top 15. And now we can quickly see our top 20. We'll go back to 10 and let's grab the set and drag it onto our filters. So now we have filtered the data down to our top 10. If this were applied to a dashboard, this would allow the end user to see the top 10 quickly and then maybe expand it out to the top 20 if they're interested in that information. Now let's move on to creating a donut chart. So a donut chart is basically a pie chart with a white center. So um, let's start by building a pie chart, which in Tableau is pretty easy, especially if you use Show Me. So let's create a pie chart for each category by sales. So you're going to click category and then we're going to control click sales. So we have them both selected. We'll come over to show me and click pie. And there we have our pie chart. We'll close show me. Let's come up here and click entire view. So we see our pie very clearly here. And if we wanted to have one pie for each region, we can take region and drag that onto columns. So we have one column for each region and then one pie for each of them. You can see that the pie varies in size based on sales as well as the angle is for sales. So east has more sales in general than south. And this helps you to see that technology has smaller sales in the south than it does in the east. So I recommend keeping, if you're going to make pie charts, allowing the size of the pie chart to be affected as well as the angle by whatever measure you're using. But for our purposes for donut charts, we're gonna want them to all be the same size. So we took sales off of size, and now we have all of our pie charts the same size. Now we're going to make what's called a dual axis chart. And to make a dual axis chart, we have to have two axes. So let's grab number of records, and we'll grab it and drag it to rows, and we will change it from sum to minimum. And that's because every record will have a minimum number of rows of one, and then they all end up on the same axis. Great. And now we're going to make a second number of records by minimum. And we can do that by doing those steps again, by dragging number of records up here and changing it to minimum again. Or a quick trick that I can show you is if you want to duplicate anything you have on the chart here, you can just hit control and then click and drag it and it will duplicate it. So if you wanted your number of records to also be down here onto your details or on your labels, you can control click it and then leave it there. Great. So now we have our two axes and we have our two marks cards that each affect their own set of visualizations. So let's go to this top one affects these. So let's show that by changing the size. And it's made these bigger. And this bottom one affects these. And we'll do that by changing it to circle. So now each of these are a circle. Let's take category off of color. And we can take some of sales off of detail. And let's change the color to white. And now we're going to put this white circle on top of our pie chart by clicking here on our second measure and clicking dual axis. And now it's got them lined up one on top of the other. And we have our donut chart. So if we want our donut slices to be a little thinner, we can change the size of our inner circle and make it bigger. 
Perfect. And so now we have one pie chart for each region, one donut chart for each region. And if we wanted to take this header and put it inside of our pie chart, what we can do is take region and put it on the label for the circle. And it's putting it down here. You can come and edit that by clicking on label and changing its alignment. So let's put it in the middle. Perfect. So now we can see our header here, so we don't need it down here anymore. You can right click and click show header, and it hides that header. We also don't want to see our labels for our axes. So we right click and click show header there, and now we just see our pies. So to get how the number of sales here for each of them, let's go to remember our pie marks card, and let's take our sales and add it to label. So now each of our slices of pie can tell you how much sales they have. If you take the sales here that's on label, right click and click format, we can change that to currency. And let's get rid of our decimal places. Perfect. Now I'll close formatting. And let's say we want the total amount of sales to be in the middle here with central. So we go back to affecting our circle grab sales, drag it to label. So now we have four donut charts formatted to allow us to quickly see the sales numbers for each segment and also for the donut as a whole. You can also change the colors that Tableau selects for each slice by coming to the marks card that has color for the pie, so category color, and clicking edit colors. And you could change it to any of these automatic ones, or if you double click on one, it gives you all of the options for colors that you could possibly want. There's also several different palettes you could choose from. So let's say we like this one, and you can just click Assign Palette, and it will grab those off of there. Those look very similar to what we have already, so I'm going to pick a different one. And click Assign Palette, click Apply. And this allows you to make some color changes and fit your business a little bit more specifically perfect and let's say we make our pies bigger increase that size and we'll also increase the center size oh not that much perfect now we'll use a similar technique to create the two-dimensional pie chart a two-dimensional pie chart can be used so that you can show um, two pie charts at the same time um, or a pie chart that's kind of split up by different categories. This has been available in some other tools and Tableau can do it too, so let's just demonstrate that. We're going to start again by creating our generic category by sales. So we'll control click sales, we come over to show me and click pie, and it makes our pie for us. It remembers the colors that you have determined in other pages, so that's a nice feature. Again, let's make it entire view so we can see our pie nice and big. And now we're going to create our dual axis again, so we grab number of records, put it on rows, and see how it adds an axis, but each one of these categories has a different value for the number of records. However, they have the same minimum value for number of records, and it puts them all back onto the same spot. Great. And then we will control, click, and drag to make our two axes. And we'll just come to our top one and make it bigger. That affected both of them because we still have sales on size for both of them. So sales is affecting the size of the pie chart as well as the size of the angles. So let's take sales off of size for both of them and make the second pie chart a little smaller. Perfect. Now let's also affect our second pie chart by having the color defined by region instead of defined by sales. Let's talk about how I'm replacing it with region. So you could change the color by dragging region onto color and that replaces it. Or let's go back and we can drag region right on top of the thing we're trying to replace and it will replace it there. Great. So now we have the smaller circle that's going to go on top, split up by region with the angle defined by sales, and the category is on the top one with the angle defined by sales. Let's pick some nicer colors. Maybe we'll use the same palette we used for category. I 
this one. This one seems right. But we'll pick different ones than those three. So we click on the one we want to change and click on the color we want to change it to. I'm just going to keep following this right down. Click apply. Great. And then we put it on top of the other one by clicking dual axes. Now, sometimes it's easier to see these when they have a border. So we can come to color, we click border, and add maybe some black lines. This will allow you to see the inner pie separate from the outer pie. Maybe our border could have white lines. How does that look? And we can make them both bigger, like we did before. Whoa, not that big. And you can also add labels like we did before. We'll take sales onto our labels here. And you can see that hovering allows you to see all of the information you need. Now, one more thing. So while we like to hide this axis, we'd also like to maybe hide this grid line that's occurring. So you can click right click and format. And let's go to our lines. That change that zero line to none. Perfect. Get rid of some of the clutter on this visualization. I still feel like this outer pie should be a little bigger. And we want to clean up our tooltip so it doesn't have min number of records in it. This piece should be 100% behind the scenes. So we can come to tooltip. Right as you click on it, it'll pop up with everything that's in your tooltip. And we're just going to erase min number of records. I erased too much. You need to leave your angle brackets. Okay. And now this piece of the pie no longer has that. The inner one, let's do that there too. Min number of records, remove that right out. And there you have it, a two-dimensional pie chart. And here are our donut charts. This demonstration goes to show you that even when Tableau doesn't have visualization you're looking for in their basic show me options, you can still get to it. So donut charts aren't included up here and neither is a two-dimensional pie chart, but without too much extra work we can make it happen. Uh, these visualizations are a little bit more complex than your everyday visualizations, and so I recommend going through this tutorial with the data set and following along. If you want access to the data set, just comment below and the Simply Learn team will get back to you. Also, comment below with any questions you have. At this point in the presentation, we're going to put together some dashboards. So first, let's build our worksheets for this dashboard. We're going to build a worksheet called Sales by year, which adds the name up here, and we're going to take our order date and drag it onto columns. And now we want this to be a continuous axis, so we're going to change it to our continuous year. And now we have an axis, and we're going to look at sales. So now we have our sales by year. If we want labels on each of these dots, we can drag sales onto labels. And if we want to have different color lines for each region, for example, we can drag region onto color. And that splits our lines up into the different regions and gives us a legend over here. Perfect. Now we're going to duplicate this sheet by right clicking down here and clicking duplicate. Now we have sales by year two. Let's rename it to profit by year and then let's drag profit right over top of sum of sales so that it replaces it with profit. Now it's been replaced with profit and all of these different data points are here however it's still showing the title of sum of sales and that can be very confusing. So always make sure that your labels are consistent with your data. So let's take profit and drag it over top of the type labels as well. That's more consistent with our axis. So now we have sales by year, and we have profit by year. Let's do a couple of things to clean these up, like right click here, go format, and we'll change our numbers to currency custom. And now it's marked as dollars. One thing you can do in Tableau is, let's undo that, since sales is going to be dollars pretty much everywhere we use it, we can define our default property 
for these numbers. So when we right click on the measure here, you can go to default properties and you have the options to change the defaults for any of these things. And we're going to change our number format. Change it to currency custom, no decimal places, hit OK. And that also has updated this sheet. Now that only works on places where you haven't specifically defined it to be formatted differently. So we could still define it to be different here on this sheet than it is on any other sheet. Let's do the same thing for profit. Change our default properties to the same thing. Great, now let's build our dashboard. We're going to call this our overall dashboard. Change our size. This size is a personal preference of mine. I think it fits nicely on the laptops that I use and that is used by most of our customers. Now let's drag sales by year. Now watch what happens when I drag it on here. It brings sales by year, but it also brings the legend for the region that was created. The same thing should happen with profit by year. It's detected that the same legend is being used, so it didn't bring over a second legend. And we have highlighting turned on. Let's see if this works for both charts. We click on central, and you see it highlights central in both charts. That's great. So now we have a dashboard showing us profit by year and sales by year. But let's say we want to be able to filter this dashboard to just maybe one category. So let's go back to our sales by year sheet and let's drag category onto filters. And now it's going to let us select, we're going to select all and hit OK. And then right click on category and click show filter. So now it is over here. And we're going to do um, a similar thing on profit by year, but we'll do the shortcut where you come over here to category, you right click on it and you just click show filter and it puts it here and it puts it here. So now we have a filter here for category and a filter here for category. And so when we go to overall, we can come to our drop down here, more options, hover over filters and you can see category. Now here's an interesting thing that we'll see. Even though we have a category filter on both charts, when I take furniture out, you can see only sales by year changed. And profit by year stayed the same. Now why would that be? That's because we have two different filters for category. One on the sales worksheet and one on the profit by year worksheet. I'll show that by clicking here, going to filters, and grab category. Now we have category that will affect profit by year and not sales by year. That's not what we want. We want one filter to affect them both. So let's back it up a bit. Take these back off. Let's go to profit by year. Now we're going to take off category. Let's go to sales by year. And we're gonna say we want this same filter to affect both worksheets. So we're gonna right click here hover over apply to worksheets and click selected worksheets. Now we select sales by year is selected and we select profit by year. Okay. So when we go to the profit by year sheet, you can see that it now has category on there. Let's go to overall. Let's come here, filters, category, and now we have a filter that affects both worksheets. There we go. Let's format this filter a little bit. We'll come to more options and we're going to select, we want them to be able to select multiple values still, but let's do it in a drop down. So now you still have those options, but it is a little bit more compact. Let's do a couple more filters so we can do by category, let them filter out regions. Let's do it the, the shorter way. Right click, Show filter, there it is. Apply to worksheets, selected worksheets. Both of these, okay. Dashboard, filters, and by region. Multiple values drop down. And let's let them change their time selection. 
So this one's a little bit different. Since we've already determined that we wanted year and we wanted it to be continuous, filters for continuous fields are a little bit different than filters for these discrete fields. And that's because continuous fields are a range instead of just a list. So we don't list out a continuous field, we make a range for it. So we've already defined that we want it to be continuous year. And if I come over here and click on right click order date and click show filter, it's doing discrete year by default. So remove filter. If you drag order date onto filters, it lets you pick what you want it to look at. Um, let's come up here to year that's already marked as continuous and click show filter. And now it is year but it's based on a range and we have this slider. And you can see how that slider affects our visualization. Let me show you a trick to make this apply to both. Not a trick but just if you have not applied it to both worksheets but you already added it to the visualization. See, it's here, but it's only affecting one worksheet. You can change the worksheet's settings right on the filter instead of having to go to the worksheet where the filter exists. And it will only give you the options of the worksheets that are on the dashboard. So there we have it. Now it affects both. And now we have our overall dashboard. Now let's say you want to be able to see the total sales on this chart as well as the sales split up by each of the regions. We can do that as well. So let's go back to our sales sheet. As a quick tip, you can go to the sheet by clicking this go to sheet button here or here in the event that you want to go to a sheet but you don't want to scroll back and forth to find where it is. So go to sheet. Now we're going to do a dual access chart again like we showed earlier and I'm going to control click and drag so now we have sum of sales twice this marks card affects the top one so we can see that by if I change the opacity how it changes the color right here this is the top one and this marks card is the bottom one and we're going to remove region off of color and that makes our combined one line again. Perfect. Now if we want this to be on the same space as this, we right click here, the second measure in the row section, and click dual axis. So let's put it right on top. I can see this versus this. Now if we wanted to on hover show that this is overall sales, we can click on tooltip. Region is missing because we don't have it with the color by region anymore. So we'll erase that and put Oh, we don't want it to be orange. Let's make it black. Overall sales. Okay, so when you hover here, it says overall sales. So we can see the difference easily. Let's make it um, a little bit more of a color that'll stand out. Just a little darker than the others, perhaps. So when we go back to our work or our dashboard, we can see sales and we can see our overall sales. Let's do the same thing for profit by year. Go to sheet and control drag release we'll go to our marks card for this second sheet and pull off region make it darker change our tooltip not orange overall profit okay and right click dual axis there we go now I forgot to do one thing on the last dashboard. When you make a dual axis dashboard, it doesn't necessarily um, sync up these axes. And so this axis over here is for the overall line, and this axis over here is for the region line. So if we want it to stay that way, we should edit our axes. And instead of calling it just profit over here, we'll change it to overall profit. And over here, profit by region just so that it's clear which axis goes to the which one or you can come here and click synchronize axis so it's very clear that this is much bigger than these and if you synchronize the axis let's go back before we named him okay synchronize the axis then we don't need both of these headers so we can come here 
and click show header and we just have the one. Let's do the same thing on sales by year. Synchronize. Always good to make sure that your axes are either synchronized or well labeled. And let's hide it. Let's see what it looks like now. Great. Okay, one thing to keep in mind. When we do filter to just one region, the lines are going to end up at the same spot. If we filter to two, then it's only the sum of those two. So perhaps the header overall sales and overall profit isn't quite accurate because it isn't overall necessarily when we have it filtered. Um, why does this happen? Why doesn't this line always show the total no matter what you select here? Well, that's because this filter applies to the whole dashboard. So it filters this line to those regions just as much as it filters these lines. So I'm going to remove out that tooltip line because it could be a little misleading. Let's continue on and make a dashboard that digs a little bit more into sales specifically. Great, so we'll make our first sheet, we'll call it sales by region. And we're gonna make another pie chart. So let's do it using show me. We'll click on region and then we will control click on sales, open up show me, click pie, let's close it again. Great, so now we have the sales by region pie. We'll make it the entire view. And when you hover, you can see that it's showing us sales in dollar amounts. Now, it would be more like a pie for it to be percentages. So a lot of pies, each of these slices is shown as a percentage of the whole at 100%. So let's come here to our slice size. We'll right click on it and we're going to use what's called a quick table calculation and change it to percent of total. So now when you hover, you can see that the west is 31% of the pie. Great, let's also label each of these slices. So I'm gonna control, click, and drag region onto label and add region to the labels. I'm gonna undo that and show you what would happen if I just dragged region onto labels without copying it, without holding control. It will move it and get rid of our colors. And we don't want that. So we're going to control and drag. Another way to do this, let's go back, is by taking region and dragging it onto label just straight from over here. But in this case, for the sum of sales where we've applied the quick table calculation, we want that quick table calculation to also show up in our label. So I'm going to control and drag, and it brings that quick table calculation along with it. If I were to undo, just drag sales on, it's going to go back to that dollar amount and I'm going to have to add another quick table calculation. So instead, control and drag. That's probably one of my very favorite Tableau tricks. Great. Now let's add um, a filter for region. So I'm going to right click here and click show filter. And we will make sure that this gets added to all of our sheets once we've made them all. Okay, next sheet. We're going to call this sheet sales by state. Let's do a map. Great. So um, one way to get your map started is to double click on any of these dimensions that have a globe next to them. So since we want to go with state, we can double click on state. And it starts mapping out state. So what it does is it adds latitude and longitude to our rows and columns that are generated here. And another way to get going, so let's go back, is to click on the geographic part you want and then control click on sales like we did for map, sorry, for our pie chart. Come over to show me and choose one of our maps. We could do it with the circles, but we're gonna do a filled map. Click on that. So now we have our filled map based on state. We can choose one of these different palettes if we'd like. Let's try this one or blue teal or we could do green, so that darker green means more money. Great. So now we have all of our states colored by sales. Let's also control and drag sales onto label. 
and you can see we have the dollar sign and the money formatting that we made earlier and let's control and drag state onto label now maybe we want the state to be on top so we can click on label and it pops up with all of these different options and if we want to edit the text you can click here on the ellipses and edit it there so let's cut state and paste it at the top there I think I lost my center alignment so we'll do that again hit apply see what we think great okay so now you can see that it puts the state on top you can also see in some of these places where they're super close together that you can't see all of the states labels and that's because um, this option here in labels is unchecked allow labels to overlap other marks so Tableau senses when the marks are too close together and it's going to become too hard to read and will hide anything that overlaps with each other. If we click this option, now you see everything, but it gets a little crowded over here. So let's unselect that and you'll be able to see what the sales are upon hover. Great. Now we have our sales by state. For filters for this one, let's, no, let's right click on sales here and click show filter. So basically wherever you're using your metrics, your dimensions or your measures, you can right click on them and create your filters. Um, so now we could, uh, the lowest amount for a state is $920 for sales for this time period. And we could filter out ones that have sales lower than that. But I think this isn't what I want. Let's remove that filter. Let's do it for the state, show filter. Great, so now we could filter out a state. We could just show Arizona or show them all. Excellent. Let's move on to our next visualization. New sheet. Rename it to be called sales by sub category. Great, so we're going to drag on category onto columns and subcategory. And we could either drag on subcategory here or because of our hierarchy, press plus. Now we have subcategory and category and let's bring on sales. It's defaulting to this bar chart, which is perfect. That's what I want. And now we could color it by subcategory. And this is a discrete coloring. We could also color it by sales and this is a continuous coloring so the darkest corresponds with the height now we don't need to do this there is already an indicator of who has the most sales and that's based on the bar height so if we wanted to color it by subcategory then each one of them gets their own color we could color it by category to add to the distinction between the different categories so that's very clear where they start and stop Let's do by subcategory. Excellent. So now we have three different dashboards. Oh, let's add some filters for subcategory. So let's bring on category as our filter. So we'll right click here, click show filter. There's category. And let's do a filter for our date. So we're going to come here to order date. Let's drag it onto filters and let's click years. Now, these are all the years options. We'll click all and hit OK. Right click here and click show filter. So now, instead of doing a range where we could drag that line, now we have discrete filter. And so we can check and uncheck boxes to choose what years we want to see. Awesome, let's start with our dashboard. Let's call this dashboard our sales dashboard and change our size. If you have any questions about different sizes, what's available here, be sure to ask that in the comments below. And let's start with pulling on our sales by region. So last time we pulled on a chart, we saw that it added the legend for us. But this time you can see it added both the legends and the filter. So last time we created the filters after we built the dashboard, but this time you can see that the filter um, gets brought in when we brought in the dashboard. Let's do our sales by state, side by side here, and let's do sales by subcategory underneath. So I dragged it. You can see how I pull it towards the bottom of the dashboard, and it kind of fills in the space where it's going to be. 
and then brings it in. So now it's brought in all our filters and all of our legends. It defaults to putting the filters and legends over here. We're going to click select layout, layout container. It's going to select what's, what they're all inside of. And we're going to make it take up this whole side. But it doesn't need that much space. So you can see in Tableau there's a lot of dragging, there's a lot of dropping, and um, a lot of resizing to get things the way you want them to be. Give our map more room. And we have a mixture over here of legends and filters. Let's move our legends out of there. So we can grab this legend and come and put it on this side. And this legend, come and put it over here. So that we're getting a little bit more near the visualizations they belong to. This legend goes up here with this one. I'm going to actually click here and change it from a tiled, so right here it says tiled object, to a floating object. That lets it sit on top of a visualization. I'm going to put it on top of this visualization right up here. Excellent. And then we have this one that's showing us the size of sales. That's because on this dashboard, it says that size is determined by sales, but since it's just one circle, there's no size comparison. So it's not like we have several circles and we have to look and see which one's the biggest so that we can tell the, the amount of sales. So we don't need this legend and we can just remove it from the dashboard. Let's clean up some of these. We have several different versions of what your filters could look like. So my personal favorite is multiple values drop down. It gives you some of the most flexibility. But if you wanted them to only be able to select a single value, you could turn it into a radio button list so that it's a selected all or it's one at a time. You could also do a drop down or a slider and make that happen. A slider is a little bit different from a range. On a range, you can see that we could edit either side and it's picking everything in between. But with discrete values, if you say everything in between, it doesn't make a lot of sense because what's everything between furniture and technology? We don't know that office supplies goes between those. There's no order. So let's do multiple value drop downs. Um, for big ones like state, there is the option of searching. So I know I want Utah, and I search and there's Utah instead of having to scroll through the list. This could be really helpful for if you had a filter for by products, and that would allow somebody to look at just one product at a time, if they know their name of the product, but also not have to just open up the product list and scroll and scroll and scroll, since there are very a lot of products. So we can filter by region by doing this. Oh, this is a great reminder. You saw that this did not change all the visualizations. We have yet to apply these filters to all the worksheets. So let's do that right now. Apply to worksheets, selected worksheets, and we will click all on dashboard. Hit OK. We'll do this again. Until we have selected them all. Great. So it's really nice you get to choose what worksheets you wanted to apply to because in the event that you had maybe um, a total number up here at the top that you just wanted to stay the same all the time, no matter what they selected, you could make that happen by not selecting that worksheet to be changed by these filters. Oh, great, great. So we can change what region we're looking at by selecting central here. And then we're just looking at central throughout all the visualizations. I love looking at it on a map and seeing just one at a time. It just really makes the region name just stand out to you. But if we wanted to use this as our filter to filter the rest of the dashboards, we can click this Use as Filter button. And now when we click on central here, it stays in context here, but the other two dashboards change. One thing you may notice is that Texas is not the darkest on this chart because of the scale. The scale goes up to half a million there. But then when we click on central, the scale updates just for what's selected. So everything else is filtered out and now the darkest of the dark is only $170,000. And Texas becomes the darkest on the visualization. There are some ways you can change that, but if you're wondering why do my colors look a little differently when I filter, 
that's why. Great, we could also click uses filter here. So if we just wanted to look at Texas, we click this. This updates to just central. This updates to just Texas down here. And unselect by clicking on maybe another state or when you click on the state again it should unselect and we could do the same thing here or if we just want to look at one subcategory and say oh, let me scroll down a bit storage now everything updates to just storage it's interesting i wouldn't have known very quickly that there are some states that didn't have any storage sales but now when we click on storage we can tell i showed you before that you can control click and look at binders and storage and it puts those two together. Also, in Tableau, you can drag, and we could select all of these. So we have art, binders, envelopes, fasteners, labels, paper, and storage. And none of those are getting sold here. I don't know what's up with Wyoming. Excellent. So now we have our sales dashboard. And let's get started on our next one. Our next dashboard is going to be the profit version of this dashboard. So some of these visualizations we can use again. So let's go to sales by region, right click and click duplicate. Rename it to profit by region. Now you have to be careful whenever you go to reuse a visualization because like I mentioned before, you gotta make sure everywhere uh, that sales is used, you have to replace it with profit. I'm also going to drag this sheet to be more at the end here after the sales dashboard just to keep them separate so that we have the sheets that lead up to overall and then the sheets that lead up to sales and then we'll have the sheets that lead up to profit. Great! So we'll grab profit and drag it onto angle size and that updates the angle size. Drag it onto the size of a circle. Shouldn't make a difference since we only have one circle. And onto the text. Now, when I dragged it on, it didn't do the percent of total anymore. So let's change that to the quick table calculation of percent of total for there and for the label. Percent of total. There we go. Now we have our percent of total again by region. Region. Okay, here's another thing. Since we duplicated that filter, it's going to be using that exact same filter. You see, it's using region from sales by region, all the sales dashboards. But we don't want that. So let's remove out all the filters here and these action filters that are generated by our filtering. That, those come from this. These are called action filters. And it's generated when we click this uses filter button. Okay, stack to profit by region. Great, we're clear of filters. And let's add back in a region filter. And this one no longer has the icon that shows you that it affects multiple sheets, which is what we want for now. So you might want, perhaps, there would be a situation where you would have two dashboards and you would want these filters that you put on here to affect both dashboards. And in this case, that's not what I want. Great, so another one we can use the basics for is sales by subcategory. So let's duplicate that. Great. Profit by subcategory already exists. We made this earlier. Tableau will not allow you to make a worksheet that has the same name as another worksheet. You can call it number one, or since it does put the title up here, you can put an extra space at the end. Or it does detect that space, it counts it as a different title even though it's the same title just with a space. That does cause some issues, so like when we're looking here and we're saying, oh profit by subcategory, I want that. Oh, this is when we made it. But you don't want this one, you want this one. And it gets a little confusing. The nice thing is when you're dragging things onto your dashboard, when you hover, you should get a little picture here of what dashboard, what visualization you're looking at. It really helps you to make your decisions and not just have to do it by name. If you're a little bit disorganized and you have all of these called sheet 5, sheet 7, you won't know exactly what that is right away. And so that little preview is very helpful. Great! Profit by subcategory. We'll do the same thing by removing out all our filters. So I just click on it and hit delete. You can also control click and then hit delete. 
or you can drag them off into a space that's not the visualization space. Great, and we only have some of sales right there, so we'll change that to profit. And we have some negative profits there. We'll keep the colors the same for consistency between the two dashboards. And let's bring on category as a filter. Okay, show filter, there we are. And let's do our order date filter right now. Order date, we'll do years, okay, all the years. So it gives you this option here because it assumes that you're making a filter because you want this dashboard to just be filtered to your selection. You can do that. You can make a filter that isn't exposed to the end user. So let's say you were making a big dashboard and it was just focused on furniture then and you don't want them to be able to select a different category for because of your analysis. You can make that happen. You can just click furniture and not show this by clicking hide card here. But in this case, we want to be able to make this interactive in a lot of different ways. Great, profit by subcategory exists. Now, instead of our map, we're going to make an area chart. So I'll rename this and call it profit over time by category. So we're going to bring on our order date into columns and it goes to our discrete value. Let's change it to our continuous value so we get the axis. Let's grab our profit onto rows and it makes us a line chart. We're gonna change that to an area chart. An area chart is nice because when you split it up by category, by dragging category onto color, you can now see what category is responsible for how much profit, like you do with a line chart. However, its area is what defines that, so you can see that area over time and do comparisons. And also, it stacks them on top of each other so that you can tell that for 2013 our profit was around $50,000 really quickly. Otherwise, we have to add that line, this line, here, and it makes these lines smaller and lower, um, more difficult to see. So, back to our profit over time by category. So that's some of the benefits of having an area chart. And if we wanted to go a little more detailed than year, you can hit this plus. And now we have over quarter. We have some negative profits. That's interesting. But let's go back to over the year. Great. And for this one, we're going to make one more pie chart. So we could start from scratch or we could duplicate our profit by region pie chart, which is what I'm going to do. We're going to do this for the comparison between a pie chart and an area chart. So it's going to be profit by category but not over time. So right now it's profit by region. Let's drag category right on top of colors there. And now it's split up. It's having some trouble because it's splitting it by category, but because of we brought region onto text, it's also splitting it by region. So we have region, 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 region inside of this category, and we don't want that. So we're gonna drag category right on top of region here as well. And now it's just the three segments. So whatever you have in this marks card, unless it's on tooltips, will affect your level of detail in the visualization here. When it's on tooltips, sometimes it won't change the level of detail, but it could have an effect on, like, so if we brought, oh, let's do this right now. So right now the level of detail of this chart does not go to the category by region like it did before. You can bring it onto detail here and it won't affect color and it won't affect labels but it will change the detail and you see how it splits it out again. This is what it would look like if it's by region by category and you have much more slices to this pie. We'll go back. But if we take region and put it onto tooltip, it's not at a low enough level for that tooltip to make any sense. So it's going to put that star. You see region is star. That's because this section of the pie covers multiple regions. If we filtered the region to just central, now it populates. So there are sometimes benefits to having it in there, even when at all levels it doesn't make any sense. But we won't leave it there. Excellent. So you can see how the color is what determines, uh, is a big part of what determines how many slices you get. The level of detail for the whole chart is a big factor as well on how many slices you get. Great. Profit by region, profit by category, by subcategory, and by 
profit over time. And we have our category filter. We don't have our subcategory filter yet. We grabbed category. So let's right click on subcategory and click show filter. There we go. Now we have a filter for category and subcategory. Here's our region one. We have region in two places and we don't want that. We want it to apply to all of them. We'll do that when we get to the dashboard. And we have category, year of order, date, and subcategory. Great, those are all the filters I wanted. So let's build our dashboard. We'll call this our profit dashboard once I get it set to the size I want. Profit. We'll start with profit by region. And we'll have our profit by category over time next to it. Great. We'll give that some different space. Have this at the bottom. Have this underneath there. Now it's bunched all these up next to it. So let's again drag it over to the side. It's always good to pay attention to the highlighted section. And it gives you kind of an idea. Oh, you see, I accidentally dragged an individual filter instead of this whole section. So when I grabbed this, I didn't grab all of these. So if you want to grab all of these and they happen to be inside the same section, you can come and click Select Layout Container. And now I'm grabbing all of them. There we go. We'll do the same thing as before. You know what? I'm going to make these floating. Because then it kind of sits inside of that same area. I'll make that one floating. And this one too. This category legend applies to both this chart and this chart. So that's very nice. And this subcategory legend, I won't make floating, I'll just put here by subcategory. And this profit by category doesn't need quite that much space. Let's give our bar chart some room. Excellent. We don't need the size of the circles make these drop downs. Now, um, because I didn't have to on this chart and this chart change profit to dollars because we set that as the default, it definitely saved us some time. So I recommend setting default number formatting at the beginning of your visualization. Really nice. Excellent. Now you can rearrange the order of these. So I like to have the date at the top. It's sometimes hard to get it to the top. So I take it the second to the top and I drag the top one down. And then um, category above subcategory, just for logical sense. Excellent. And we have our profit dashboard. Let's see. There is this checkbox down here called show dashboard title. So if we wanted to have the title at the top here, you can click that button. Any floating objects don't shift down like everything else did. There we go. So we could have that title, we could not have that title. That's up to you. Excellent. So at this point, we have our overall dashboard that looks at sales and profit. We have our sales dashboard and we have our profit dashboard. Our profit dashboard isn't 100% complete because I forgot to make sure all of these filters apply to all of these worksheets. So let's go ahead and do that right now. Apply to worksheets, selected worksheets, all on dashboard. One thing that is nice from this view, it's really nice to click all on dashboard and you only see the ones on the dashboard. But you can click here and say show all worksheets in workbook and you can see the rest here. So if you wanted all on the dashboard and you wanted this one or something like that, then you have the option to see them all. Great. Perfect. So before you ever publish a dashboard, it's always good to double check that your filters work. When you filter to just one year, this area chart becomes a lot less useful. But if you're looking at two or more, you start to see the shape of it. Great. Now we're going to take a look at linking from our overall dashboard 
to our sales dashboard. Great, so we'll go to our overall dashboard and we'll be creating what's called an action. So you can make an action on a worksheet. You can see right here, actions, or on a dashboard, actions. So since we're linking between two dashboards, this is going to be a dashboard action. Sorry, just trying to unhighlight there. But if you're ever looking for an action you made and you can't find it, look in the other one. Great, this is our actions dialog box. Here we can see the highlight that has been generated. When it says generated next to it, that means that you didn't come in and define an action. It was made by clicking this highlight button here. That'll generate an action. Or when we look on our sales dashboard, we clicked on this uses filter button. So we should have several actions here that were all generated. We have a couple different kinds of actions when you go to make an action. There's a filter action that we see when we click use as filter, a highlight action that we can see from here in region, and a go to URL action that we haven't used. Um, if you have any questions about go to URL, please post them in the comments below. It basically allows you to be able to select a URL here, and so if you had a dashboard that had to do with maybe stocks, you could put in a URL here and then put your stock ticker symbol there so that you could have a URL that would then take you to a finance website that shows you your stock information. It can get pretty cool. Okay, but we want to link from this dashboard to one of our other dashboards, and you actually do that using a filter action. So we're going to name that action Go to Sales Dashboard. And we want it to happen when we click on our sales sheet. So you see right here it shows us the two sheets that are on this dashboard. When we click on the profits dashboard, we don't want this action to occur. This is our go to sales dashboard. Now you can have an action occur on hover or select. You've seen select happen. That's what our filter uses filter actions use. And on menu. So we're going to do it on menu. And the targeted sheets, it defaults to this dashboard saying, when I click on this, I want the rest of this dashboard to update. But instead, it's going to take us to our sales dashboard. So when we click on this, I want these sheets to update. Now, we're going to define what filters it's going to apply. By default, it's going to apply all of the filters based on what we click. So if we click here, it will filter to just 2013. Let's say if we click here. It will filter to just 2013, and it will filter to the region we selected. So, let's see what happens when we do that. Okay, it's just going to default. Okay, now when I click on this, it's going to filter to 2013 and west. Go to Sales Dashboard. This is where it pops up when you have it on Menu. It's taken us to our Sales Dashboard. It is filtered to 2013 and west. Just so you know, actions will not affect these filters here. You see that it thinks all of them are selected because it creates a separate filter. There is such thing as show only relevant values for these filters. So if we click this, it will filter this to only the ones that are relevant. So we can see that it's only 2013 that this dashboard is filtered down to. But if we click all values in the database, this filter doesn't have any, only one particularly selected. It does have them all selected right now. So we can get here for that information. And to get back, we just need to navigate back to overall. Great, so it works there. But when we click on this up here, go to sales dashboard, we get a blank dashboard. Now, that happens because... It's trying to pass region information to that dashboard, but this doesn't have any region detail on this line. It doesn't know what that is, so it's giving it a bad region value. So let's fix this. Go to our actions. We're going to edit our go to sales dashboard, and we're going to select what fields it'll filter on. We will filter on our order date year and let me go back to that we clicked order date year 
and it goes to the target data source. Sometimes your target data source will be a different data source than the one that you are using for your source data source. Now that gets a little bit complicated. Right now we're just using one data source, so that's not something you need to worry about in a simple visualization like this. Okay, and we're going to add one more. We're going to add region, and it automatically selects region over here, but you could select it yourself. Let's see what happens here. Okay, if um, one dashboard has region in it and the other dashboard doesn't have region in it or doesn't allow you to filter by region, then sometimes you'll get an error here that will say it's missing out of your target dashboards. So we don't have any errors, so let's see what happens. So we go to click here, go to sales dashboard. What if we take out region? Remove region, and we're just doing it based on year. Okay, okay. Click here, go to sales dashboard, and there everything is. So now it will filter to the year that you selected. So this is all 2013, but it will not filter to the region you selected. So even when we come here and we select west, it takes you to the dashboard, but it doesn't filter it to west. You have to do that yourself. So now we have links from sales to sales. Let's make one for profit to profit. Go to sales dashboard, add action, filter. We're going to call this go to profit dashboard. And we're only going to come from the profit table to make this happen. Let's go to profit and let's select our fields. We're going to do the same thing where it's only going to filter it to the year now you can see, oh, I started to type in. I didn't show you this before, but you can search text. So I started typing in year, and it shows you that under order date, you have all these different options. In this dashboard right now, if you remember, we're using the continuous one that is marked by the little calendar. So that's, it knows it's a calendar date instead of just treating it like a discrete field. Okay. Excellent. Go to Profit Dashboard. And there we go. This visualization, like we said, when it's filtered to just one year, isn't quite as useful. But one thing you can do is for West here, we can select both years. I'm, I'm going to do it by control clicking. Click. Click. Go to Profit Dashboard. And now we've got 2015 and 2016. So that's how you do linking between the two dashboards. If you wanted to be able to include region as well, you could um, put a note in the tooltip for this, that this doesn't work for region linking from this area doesn't work. Or perhaps you could not have this total line on the same visualization. You could have a separate visualization that shows the total or an area chart instead. And that will let you not have this problem of go to sales dashboard not linking appropriately. So now we're going to create our final dashboard, our segment dashboard, and it's going to use a parameter in it. So we'll get to take a look at parameters on dashboards. So let's rename this. We're going to call it profit and sales by segment. You don't have to name all of your dashboards a description of what they are, but it makes it really nice and easy. And it automatically puts it up here but if you wanted to change this, you can just come in here and name this whatever you like. And then it will just show up up here. So we could call this segment analysis. Click apply or OK. And there it goes. That means this and this does not have to be the same. If we go forward again, segment analysis and profit and sales by segment. That allows you to have some more useful names down here that make it easy when you're looking at them side by side, but have a name to match your dashboard up here. Great, so we're going to make a profit and sales. It's going to be a bars and circles chart, and we're going to bring in our segment that we haven't looked at yet. Consumer, corporate, and home office. And then we're going to look at it segment, and we're going to make a matrix with category. And we get to fill in this space with our visualization. So we're going to do sales and it's going to make these bar charts so we can see for technology, by consumer, by corporate, by home office. 
and that is a matrix of bar charts. But we also want to be able to see profit, and right now it's making two sets of visualizations, but we want just one, so let's dual axis. And it's automatically changed it to circles, also it is not synchronizing the axis now because profit is blue and these profit is not anywhere near the same amount as sales which makes sense you shouldn't have profit that's higher than sales so let's synchronize our axis and let's change our sales our marks card over here is associated with sales and it's nice and easy when the two marks cards are based on a different measure to let you know which one you're affecting and we'll change that to a bar and now we have a circle on a bar chart. Now, if we had profit in front of sales, you can see how it's behind. And you can fix that by taking it to the back of sales. Another way you can fix it, say you wanted the profit axis here, over here for some reason, you can right click on the axis and put mark type, or oh, move marks to front. Another way to change it. We don't need both of these, so let's not show that header and we don't need this to be labeled profit because it's for both of them so the way you get rid of that is actually you click edit axis and then you just erase the title oh and you don't hit reset you just erase the title and then you close it so now no title here but we still have the axis and we have three sets of bar charts across excellent the next chart we're going to build oh so right now they are it automatically added the colors based on measure names. Measure names is a dimension that is created by Tableau, and it's just what it sounds like. We're coloring it based on the different measure names. One of them's named profit, one of them's named sales. And we know that you can come here, click color, and hit edit colors, and it will open this dialog box. But you can also come here and double click on a color, pops open that dialog box. Let's pick a palette. Let's see, there's a lot of different ones of these. Tableau 20, let's pick colors from this palette. Profit can be, so you click here, make sure it's highlighted, click the color you want. Click here, make sure it's highlighted, click the color you want. Hit apply. And then you can come to color and make it a little more opaque, whatever. When you make it more opaque, you start to be able to see through your circles. There are benefits, but also drawbacks to doing that. Anyway, so stick with the Tableau orange and blue. Great, we have our first chart. Our next chart is going to be called Top Customers by Sales. And this is where we're going to use our parameter where we made our top end customers. So let's bring in our sum of sales, make a bar chart for that. And then we're also going to, we're bringing in our set. Now, so we have our in and our out. We're going to break up our set by our segment, as it's part of our segment analysis. And we'll bring in our customer names. And let's sort it. Excellent. Now you can see that when we sorted it, it didn't take this big guy and put it all the way at the top. It just sorted it each within its own section. Great, and so here we have our in and out, and that's not a super user-friendly title for our users of this dashboard. They're like in and out of top end customers by sales. Maybe we want this to say something a little bit more user-friendly. So let's make a calculated field, and we're going to call it the top end customers label. And we're going to go and say if, and we're going to use our set top end customers by sales. And since it's an in or out set, it treats this like if it's in top end customers by sales, then top, we're going to um, do a string. So it's going to be top, and then we want to use the number that's in our parameter. So we have to convert it from a number to a string, and we have to concatenate them together. In Tableau, you can use a plus sign. Top, and always make sure you have space between what you're concatenating together. That's something that I tend to forget. Top space customers. So if they pick 20, it'll say top 20 customers. So if it's in the set, then top blank customers. Else, if it's not in the set, we will just call it other. And in Tableau, you always need to end 
your if statement with an end. Here it tells us our calculation is valid. While we're here, I want to show you a little trick. There's this arrow button here that can give you all of the different functions that are available within Tableau. And it even sorts it out by different categories. So if we didn't know how to make this into a string, we could go to type conversion. We could click on string and it gives you an example. Also, when you click on a function in here, did you see how it's on date? And then I clicked on string and I'm like, what does this do? Click on it and it tells me. So this makes it really useful inside of Tableau. Also, in Tableau, you can make a comment in here. So if somebody's like, what's going on here? You can press dash dash or slash slash and type in, this is a more user-friendly title. Hit OK. And there we go. We have our more user-friendly title. We drag it here. We see our top 20 customers and other. And if we don't want to show this anymore, but we still want it in place, you can click, right click on it up here and click show header and it hides it. So that in out is still happening there. And let's drag it to our filters. And there we have it. We have our top blank customers. And it tells you right there how many. And we need to come here to parameter, right click and click show parameter control. And that's how we can control these changes. So let's set it to 10 at first. And we have it our um, top customers by sales, but it's interesting to know profit as well. So we have really big sales, but how is their profit doing? So let's drag profit onto color. And you can see this person has a negative amount of profit despite their big sales. So that's important for us to know. And we can change our color like we did previously to go from red to blue. And we can change our center to zero. And now we can see the negatives really quickly. Oh, they're not the only one either that have a negative profit, but some of our highest sales. That's great to know. Excellent. Those are our visualizations for the segment dashboard. So let's talk about filters really quick. We have this filter. We won't show the filter itself. We don't want to allow them to show in or out. We just are going to allow them to show how many. But we do want to be able to have them filter by category. So let's show that filter. And by segment, show that filter. And, and then we'll have our parameter. Great, let's make our dashboard um, automatic, as you probably read right there. The dashboard will resize to fit any screen it is displayed on. That can be really handy, especially if your visualization is really dynamic and can change. However, some visualizations, like this visualization for example, if it gets too squished, you stop being able to read things very well. So automatic has its definite pros and cons. So we're going to bring on our profit and sales by segment. And it already pops up with its legend and total customers by sale. And it pops up with its legends and filters and it pops up with its parameter. Now I'm going to close that and be like, if you don't see your parameter when you first bring it in, the parameter is affecting this sheet and you can go to parameters and find it. But parameters are workbook wide, meaning that it's going to exist over here too. Uh, it doesn't affect this sheet. However, it's still going to show up there because it could affect, it is available for any sheet. And it's the same. There is no determining what worksheets this affects. This will affect any sheet that it is on. So if I, I've changed it to 10. And if I come down here and go back to the other visualization that uses it. This is why I should name my sheets. Let's see if I can find it. Nope. Here we are, sheet 13. In sheet 13 we have our top 10. So I've got a 10 and I've got a 10 over there and if I change it to 20 and I go back to my segment dashboard, it is also changed to 20. So it will affect all sheets always. Very important to know. Great. So here's our visualization. Here are some of the more useful legends. So let's make this floating and put it over by the visualization it matters for. We can do the same thing here. Floating right up here. Floating does not work very well for if you were to make this an automatic dashboard so that the size changes all the time because floating could end up right on top of your visualization and keep you from being able to see what you need to see. 
And let's make these affect all the dashboards in the workbook. Again, we don't have to do this for our parameter. It will already affect all the dashboards in the whole workbook. And format these. Another thing you should know is that there are more formatting options for these, um, including edit title. So it's already named it category automatically, but if you had, like here, oh, this is a great example. Edit title, top end customers, and you could change it to select number of top customers, or something like that. Give it a little more space. And yeah, these floating ones do not shift when you shift things, so it's always good to double check your floating legends. And this is a little bit more user-friendly than the title we made for the developers. And that's using parameters in a dashboard. Today in this video we learned about an overview of business intelligence on Tableau. We talked about how to install Tableau Public and how to connect to a data source. We also talked about creating calculated fields, like this one. We talked about making sets and parameters. We learned how to make a donut chart and a 2D donut chart. We learned about making dashboards and adding filters to those dashboards. And we also learned about connecting between dashboards. Today we will be learning about the topics we discussed in part one, live versus extract data sources. We'll talk about joins and unions and we'll look at table calculations. We'll look at the rank functions and we'll look at actions, specifically URL actions. We'll talk about reference lines and bands. We'll look into some insights in the data such as delay analysis. Also, we'll learn how to build a waterfall chart. And then finally, we will learn about level of detail calculations while making two different visualizations. In part one of this Tableau training, we introduced Tableau basics and we learned how to create donut charts and two-dimensional donut charts, and we learned about linking between dashboards. If you missed part one, please check out the link in the description below. Now let's discuss the difference between a live connection and an extract connection. First, it's important to note that these different types of connections are not available in Tableau Public. It's always a live connection, and a live connection is where the data will update based on when the source of the data updates. So if any, if you're connected to a database and something in the database changes, then you'll pick up those changes when you open the report as it will query that database when the report is opened. Whereas an extract connection is extracted into, creates a subset of the data that improves performance. So when you're looking at it locally on your computer, you have an extract of that data set that subset of the data right on your computer or up in Tableau server depending on where you're looking at it. And it does not update when the database updates, it only updates when your refresh updates it. So without a refresh set for that extract, you won't get the new data. As an example of this, let's say that in our sample superstore, we have Kelly Williams associated with the central region, but that's changed. So let's go ahead and change that. We will change it to Sarah Smith, and we'll save it. Now let's go back to our Tableau workbooks, and you can see we can refresh it over here and see Sarah Smith come in. Over here in our extract, it Sarah Smith doesn't come in. If we click to refresh the extract, it doesn't refresh the extract until we navigate to sheet one. But when we go back to our data source, then we see Sarah Smith coming in. So that refresh can be scheduled and it could run once a day or once every several hours, but you would need to set up a refresh or else you would never get Sarah Smith's data coming in. Next, let's talk about joining data in Tableau. So. Here we have the people table, but let's say we want to join it to our orders information. So I'm going to start with our orders table, and then we're going to pull on people, and Tableau is going to create a join for us, and it's going to choose the column that we would like to join on based on the names in the two data sources. 
So if these two data sources didn't have a column that had the same name, then Tableau wouldn't be able to guess what two to join on. So we would have to come in and select out of the order side and the people side what we'd like to join on. And then we have the options to do an inner join, a left join, a right join, and a full outer join. Let's review quickly what these look like. So say we had two tables that we wanted to join together. One of them was the student table that had the student names and the key to their grade, and which we could use to look up their grade over here in the grade table, which had the key to their grade and the actual grade, A, B, C, D, F, and incomplete. We can see here that somebody has made a mistake and put in a letter grade instead of the key to the letter grade. Um, and we'll see how that affects what we're looking at. So if we were to do an inner join, that would only take the rows where the join could complete. So we have one that could join to one just fine, but we don't have two and we don't have three. A doesn't join to anything, so this row would be not included. And then four, five, and six would all join. So that would look something like this, where we would see Adam, um, when we grab student from this table and grade from this table, we can see Adam had an A, Beverly had an A, Dale had a D, Elizabeth had an F, and Frank is incomplete. And Charles is missing. Also, you don't see any B or C in this list of grades. For a left join, it's going to take everything from the left table and only the pieces from the right table that apply to the left table. So it looks pretty similar to our inner join only Charles shows up. So the join wasn't able to complete since A doesn't exist in grade, but we include Charles anyways, and grade becomes null for Charles. It won't put in the grade key because it's, we're not asking for the grade key, we're asking for grade from the grade table. So we try to look up A inside of the grade table, we can't find it, and it returns null. We look up A inside the grade key. Perfect. Right join is like a left join, only it takes everything from the right table instead of the left table. So it grabs all the grades, A, B, C, D, F, and incomplete, and only the rows from the left table that join appropriately. So since Charles doesn't join appropriately, he doesn't show up. We also have B and C showing up, even though it doesn't exist in the student table and it won't be tied to a student because that join wasn't able to complete as it didn't exist over there. And the last one is a full outer join, where it takes everything from both tables, whether or not the join is complete. So we have all of the people where the join completes. We also have Charles, where the join doesn't complete from the left to the right. And we have B and C, where the join doesn't complete from the right to the left. So those are our options in Tableau. Here in our sample superstore data set, you could look and see if there are any regions in the orders table that don't exist in the people table. And that's how you can know what kind of join you want. And so if you want those orders to still show up even though they don't have a region, or their region is not in the people table, that's when you would do a left join. For our purposes, we'll do an inner join. Now let's say we had a second Excel sheet here that had more orders, and you can do a union, which is just adding more orders, by dragging that second orders table right underneath the original orders table. You can see it says there, drag table to union. And that's helpful for if you have an Excel sheet for maybe different years. So say you had a separate Excel sheet for the orders in 2015 and then another one for the orders in 2016. You could pull on your 2015 orders and then drag your 2016 orders right there to union. And it would take these orders and then add the rows instead of the columns for the 2016 orders. For example, we've added people but as a join, and that will first put in all of our orders as columns and then add the columns for our person. But if we were adding more data that fell under the order columns, 
So it would have the same data, the same order ID, ship date, but we wanted to add more rows, then that would be a new union. Now we're going to take a look at calculations and which ones are calculated on the database side versus which are calculated on the table side. So here we have percentage of total sales split up by subcategory and category. We also have percentage of total sales along table down. So the difference between these two things are one of them is made using a calculated field which is where we do the sum of sales divided by the sum of fixed sum of sales. This part is called a level of detail calculation. And this calculation, the sum of sales and the sum of the level of detail of sales, which basically makes the database find the total sum of sales regardless of these dimensions we pulled on. So it gives us our total number. So this will be sum of sales for bookcases, and this will be sum of sales for everything. This calculation is done on the database side, whereas this one, percentage of total sales along table down, is what's called a table calculation. It's a quick table calculation of percent of total, and it is done in Tableau. It's processed locally right inside of the table after the aggregations have occurred. There are some pros and cons of doing it this way. So for this percent of total sales, I had to create the table calculation here. And it does the fixed sum of sales where it finds the sum of sales for the entire database. And since it is fixed, it will ignore filters. So for example, I took off both of the sales and I'm just going to put on the percent sum of sales. And let's say we wanted to see how office supplies and technology are as percentages of sum of sales and ignore furniture. So we can grab category and we'll control, click and drag. And we're going to unselect furniture and hit OK. Now it's still taking it out of the total sum of sales including furniture and so our grand total down here is only 67% instead of 100%. Whereas if we take sales and double click it and it adds it over here on the table then we right click and do a quick table calculation and click percent of total. This one is doing it out of 100 and these numbers don't match. And that's because it does take into account the filter of category. So let's pull the filter of category off. And we can see that they're both out of 100% now. And each of these take into account um, the same amount of data since we have no filters here. So if you want it to take into account the filters on the table, then you need to use a table calculation. However, when you push the information back to the database to do the calculation, it's doing it as part of the query to the data source and it can save you some time and so which one of these is faster sort of depends on what data is available already when the original query comes back. Next we're going to discuss ranking in Tableau. First let's add a second data source so we can do that by coming up to data and clicking new data source or you can just click this plus data source right here and click Microsoft Excel we're going to use this rank example worksheet. Perfect, and it's already pulled in the sheet we want because there's only one sheet. And we'll go to sheet two, pull on store, pull on sales, and we will rename sheet two as rank example. Great, so now we have, here's all of our stores and here are our sales. And if we wanted to rank them, based on who had the highest sales to the lowest sales, we could create a calculated field called rank by sales. And we're going to use our rank function and we're going to put in sales. Now we receive this error here, so when we hover, we see what that arrow says. Oh, you can click. And it says all fields must be aggregate or constant when using table calculation functions or fields from multiple data sources. So we learn something unique here that you might not know is that a rank is a table calculation and it requires it to be aggregated. So 
we can make sum and put the parentheses around sales and our error goes away. So now we know rank is a table calculation and we have our box here that expands out and can teach us about what we're using here. So when I click on rank, it will tell us that it returns the standard competition rank for the current row and it says identical values are assigned an identical rank. So let's see what that looks like. We'll hit OK. We'll double click on rank by sales and we can see our ranks. So E had the highest sales, so it's one. D is next and C and B are tied, 20 and 20. And so they both share the rank of three. And then because they are two of them that share the same rank, we skip four and the next one gets fifth place. But now this isn't the only way to rank. So let's make another one of these. We'll click duplicate and edit. Let's erase copy. And we're going to call this rank dense by sales. Double click on rank, start typing rank again, and we're going to click rank dense. Now the difference here is that rank dense returns the rank where identical values are assigned an identical rank, but no gaps are inserted in the numbers. So we'll click OK, double click rank dense, and you can see instead of going 1, 2, 3, 5, it goes 1, 2, 3, 4. So it doesn't include that gap. Now let's give them a little bit more space here. And maybe I want it to be in the order I created it. So these measure values are defining what's going to happen up here. So we can take sales and put it at the top. And that'll move sales to the front. And we put rank dense at the bottom. So now we can see sales. We can see rank by sales. We rank dense by sales. Now let's duplicate. And look at the next one. We have rank modified next and change the name here you notice that I receive an error and that's because that name already exists Tableau won't allow you to use the same name and it will give you that error so those errors can be pretty helpful in finding out what's going on hit apply and OK and then double click rank modified by sales and now we can see the difference here. Let's go back here and look at what it says here. Click on rank modified and it says it returns the modified competition rank where identical values are assigned an identical rank. But what happens instead is instead of both receiving three for third place, they both receive four, which is the lower of the options. So if we were going by rank and we just arbitrarily decided that this one's third place and this one's fourth place, then they both receive the same rank here, but they receive the higher of the two options, whereas this one receives the lower of the two options. And let's do one more. Duplicate. Edit. Erase copy. And we're going to do rank unique and let's change the name to rank unique perfect and now this is going to give it a unique ranking even when they share the same number so we'll hit apply okay double click rank unique and we have one two three four and five so what it's doing is, let's quickly look here. So rank by sales. We haven't talked about this yet, but you can choose to rank it ascending or descending. That means that do we want to rank it based on whether you see here it says ascending or descending, and that's how you will define so it defaults to descending, and it's saying the biggest is the best. So in the, for sales, that's accurate. So what it's doing is biggest down. Now here, it has to decide which one to give three and which one to do four. And it's doing that based on the ASCII values of the store. So it's looking at more information on the row. 
And since uppercase B comes before lowercase C, uppercase B is the, getting the 3, even though they both have 20 for sales. Let's go back now to our orders data, and we'll make a new sheet. And now we're going to talk about actions in Tableau. We've talked about actions briefly before in our Tableau training video for beginner. So if you want to see the introduction, you can go and look there. Also, if you want to follow along with our data sets, you can comment below and ask, and the Simply Learn team will get you that data set. So let's make a chart where we're going to look at category. So we'll drag category onto columns, and then we're going to look at sales. So we'll drag sales onto rows, and it will create three bar charts for us. And we're going to call this sales by category. Now let's make a second chart that we will use together and we'll bring category onto columns and we'll bring subcategory onto columns. And let's bring sales onto rows again. And let's take subcategory and bring it onto color. And that makes each subcategory its own color. And we'll call this sheet sales by subcategory. So now back to sales by category. Here you can make a worksheet action where we're going to move from the sales by category sheet to the sales by subcategory sheet and also filter down that sheet to only the category we want to see. So click filter and we can name this filter go to subcategory. And we're going to do this filter on select, so this name won't be seen except for in our actions list. And what sh sheets do we want to affect? We're going to have sales by category show up. One thing to note here, it is only showing the sheets for it to affect based on the ones that are using this data source at this point. So you can see we have four sheets down here, but it's only showing three sheets. And that's because rank example, if you recall, is using the rank example data source. So you can click here and you can see all the sheets or you can see the other data source. If we click rank example, it will show the rank example data source. So we just want sales by category to be the source sheet and the target sheet. We want it to be sales by subcategory. So on select, we want it to be sales by subcategory. We're going to use all the fields available to create this filter and hit OK. So now we have our go to subcategory on select. We'll hit OK again. And let's make this a little wider so we can see. And so when we click on furniture, it will take us to only furniture of the sales by subcategory. We go back to category and click on office supplies. Now we just see office supplies. And this is a way to make Tableau drill to a lower level. Great. So we have those. Now let's duplicate this sales by category sheet and let's see if we go to worksheet and we go to actions you can see that we have the action here go to subcategory that still exists on our duplicated sheet as well so you can see it's affecting both sheets sales by category and sales by category two. Let's say we don't want that and we can unselect sales by category two and hit OK and hit OK. Now when we go to Worksheet Actions, you can tell that it's not affecting that sheet. So if we come and click Technology, nothing should happen. But we go to Sales by Category and click Technology, it'll take you to the Technology subcategory. Great. So we have our Sales by Category 2. Let's bring it to the end. Rename it. We're going to call it sales by category stacked because we're going to take subcategory here and drag it onto color. And now we can see our different subcategories in the colors there. Now we can take a look here and sort by subcategory based on some of sales. And now you can see that it is the biggest sales at the bottom for each subcategory. That's just a way that I like to view it. So 
let's do a highlight action and we're going to do it on a dashboard. So let's take sales by subcategory and look at it over top of, or sales by category stacked over top of sales by subcategory. So we want both of those. Let's make our dashboard automatic for testing purposes. And we'll go to dashboard, we'll click create actions. So we're going to add an action, it's going to be a highlight action. Highlight sales by subcategory. And we are going to have the sales by category stacked be the source sheet, and the sales by subcategory be the target sheet for all fields. Okay, okay. And on select, you can highlight your chart there and see where it falls inside of the other visualization. Well, a cool thing you can do is you could select office supplies here and it will highlight all of office supplies or if you drag and select a couple of them it will show you those so you're just like I want to see all these small ones or I want to see this one and these small ones or whatever then it will highlight the ones that you drag and select. Now this is also true of our sales by subcategory and sales by category. So when we clicked on technology it filtered to just technology and we'll undo that and when we drag and click office supplies and technology we get office supplies and technology. Now if we go back to the dashboard we can see that this dashboard now filtered also to office supplies and technology and that's because we're using the same sheet and when you navigate away from that sheet it doesn't mean that your filter goes away. So when I clicked undo that's when it caused the filter to go away. So if you're going to have two things affect that sheet, just remember that just because you navigated away from what you selected doesn't mean that what you selected goes away. That filter will stay there. And it shows up right here. And if we pull it off, everything goes back to normal. However, the action is still there. So when you click on it, it comes back. Now let's take a look at the last kind of action, which is a URL action. So we're going to make a map based on state. So I'm going to double click state, and it's going to build out my map. Let's change it to a filled map by clicking map up here. And we're going to take sales and put it onto color. So now it's colored based on the darkest is the highest sales. We're going to put state onto label, so you can see the state name, and we're going to put sales onto label, so we can see the sales amount. Let's quickly change our default property for sales, so that it always shows up as currency. And we're going to lose the decimal places, so it'll by default show up with a dollar sign and so on. Great, so now we have our sales map, and we're going to create... A worksheet action. Now the difference between a worksheet action and a dashboard action is that a worksheet will only affect the worksheet and a dashboard will only affect the dashboard. And so when we created our worksheet action on sales by category, if we were to pull sales by category onto the dashboard, that action won't transfer over. You'll need to make a dashboard action. So we're going to make a go to URL action. We're going to have it on menu. We're going to call it wiki and it's going to only affect our new sheet, sheet six, which we should rename. And we're going to have a URL in here, so this will take us to Wikipedia, and then whatever you put at the end of the Wikipedia link, it will take you to that page on Wikipedia. So we're going to take state and add it to the end of that link. And now to test the link, you can just click test link, and it will take a random value and show you what it will look like. So now that's how we know that we have our link set up. OK, click OK. Let's rename our sheet to URL filter by state. And so when we click on Texas, OK, back to URL filter by state. Let's go to our worksheets and go to our actions. And on the go to subcategory, it is also affecting this URL filter by state because we didn't unselect it. Now to keep that from being a problem, we're going to just come here and sales by category be the only sheet, and that way it won't auto-select new sheets as you create them. So we'll no longer have that problem. You click on Texas and nothing happens except for it highlights that one only. 
that's how it should be. But when we hover on Texas and wait long enough, oh yeah, on click, sometimes you just have to hold still. It'll come up with our little link here. And we click on wiki and it will open up our browser with the Wikipedia page for Texas. This can become really handy in the event that you have data that maybe has an order ID and you can take that order ID and insert it into a URL in your system so that it can take you to your web interface page for that order. Here it's helpful for if we wanted to learn more about the state of California, which um, it can have information about the languages spoken and population, which can be helpful when we're looking into our sales information. Another way this can be useful is by showing the web page right inside of Tableau. So let's make a dashboard. Change our size to automatic and let's pull in URL filter by state. If we go to dashboard actions, you can see there are no actions for this dashboard yet. So we're going to add a go to URL action on select. And since it's on select, the name of this URL won't show up but it will show up in our list here, so it's nice to name it something unique. Let's put in our Wikipedia page, and it'll take us to state. So we'll hit OK, OK, and now when we click on Oklahoma, it'll open up a page for Oklahoma. But let's unselect Oklahoma. If we drag on web page from the objects here, you don't even have to enter anything for your URL. You just hit OK. And now we have the bottom half of the screen is a web page, and when we click on Oklahoma, instead of taking us to Oklahoma in a separate thing, it'll take us to Oklahoma right here in the visualization. So we'll change it to Texas, and this will change to Texas. If you unselect, it leaves the page there based on the one that you had just selected. Next we're going to take a look at reference bands and lines. So let's make a new sheet. And we're going to call it reference lines. And so a reference line is found on the analytics pane, and it is something that comes and draws a line on your visualization based on the data on the screen. So let's make um, our visualization. We'll do our category and subcategory again, and we'll double click on sales. And it brings it onto text, so that's not what I want. So let's do sales onto rows, and we have our bar charts. And we'll talk about the difference between a cell, a pane, and the table. So when we go to analytics, and we go to drag our reference line onto our visualization, it says you can add the reference line for the whole table, for a pane, or for a cell. So if we take our subcategory and drag it onto color, since the subcategory is our lowest level, it's going to define our cell. So each one of these, if we drag our reference line onto cell, each one of them gets a reference line. Do you see how it added those on? This is our dialog box. We will look at that in just a moment. So let's remove that. If we take reference line and put it onto pane, that's going to be similar to having category on the color. So each of these different colors is now a pane reference line onto pane and you see how we get reference lines based on each pane so let's undo that and now if we take category off and everything is all one color and we take reference line and put it onto table now we have our reference line for the whole table great so we're going to do find out the average for each section so I'm going to take category and put it back onto color and we'll take reference line and put it onto pane. Now we have our reference line. It's based on the computation of average, and it's using the value of sum of sales. So since it says sum of sales here, you might think that it is taking the cut reference line and putting it at the sum of the sales, but that's not what's happening. It's just using our aggregated version of sales to figure out the average. So instead of taking each individual sale that makes up the bookcase section, it's taking the sum of sales for the bookcase section and comparing it to the sum of sales for chairs. So it's taking an average across these added up sections. We could also have it be total, where it's adding all of these up and it makes that total line. The sum line is the same as total in this case, 
a constant, which is where you get to define the value. And so if we wanted it to be 200,000, there it is. Let's go back. There we are, back to where we were. Constant, minimum, which shows you the minimum for each section, the maximum for each section, or the average, or the median. So let's stick with average, and now you can see it's labeling the line as average. We could also have it label the line as the value, so now we can see that the average is this amount of dollars. Or you can choose custom, and then you can put something in here. Like maybe we wanted the computation, a colon, and then the value, average, this amount. You can also have show recalculated line for highlighted or selected data points. That means when you click on a section, it will recalculate the average just for what you've selected. We'll hit OK. And so in that case, when we click on tables, you can see our recalculated average line. So the average for tables, for just tables, is the sum divided by the number. So the sum of tables is 206,966 divided by 1 is still 206,966. So selecting just tables isn't really helpful. But if we wanted to know the average of tables and we'll control click appliances and we'll control click binders, oh, there we go. All three of those are selected and we can see the average of those three, which is this line. You could also select like this and see your new average. Oh, and it's doing the average independently. So select these guys and now we see the average of just those five categories. And those are reference lines. Now let's duplicate this sheet and I'll show you how to delete a reference line. So we'll rename this to reference bands. Click on this reference line, right click and click remove and it takes it off. We have the same thing for reference bands as we had with reference lines where you can have it be for the whole table, per pane or per cell. So let's do a reference band for the whole table. So it's doing entire table, and it's taking from the minimum to the maximum. Now we could change the minimum to be the average to the maximum, and now that will highlight the whole table. Everything that's above the average becomes highlighted. And if you wanted to change it, you could do the minimum to the average. But let's go to average to maximum. And then you can change things like you can add lines, so we have a line for the average or the maximum. You can make it thinner, you can make it dotted. You can change your fill, so maybe if you don't want it to be quite that dark, you can change it to be a little bit of a lighter color of gray. And you can have show recalculated band for highlighted, or you can remove that, and that way when we highlight stuff, everything just stays where it belongs for the entire table. And that's how you create a reference band. Reference bands and reference lines can be really handy in making several different kinds of visualizations such as bullet charts. If you have any questions about that, please comment below and the Simply Learn team will get back to you. Now let's do another analysis on average days to ship. And for this one, we're going to look at it by state. And we're going to look at it by ship mode. And so we'll take average days to ship and put it on columns. And now we can see the average days to ship by first class, same day, second class, or standard class. And you can see how they differ. So let's change the order of these really quick. If we come up here to ship mode and we click sort, and we click manual, we can have same day above first class. So that it kind of goes in order of priority. So same day, first class, second class, standard class. There we go. And now we have it in order of what you might expect and priority. And now we're going to create a calculated field that we will use to do a sort of conditional formatting. And we will name it delay analysis. Great. So let's do if the average days to ship is less than or equal to 2, then we'll have it return the words shipment early. 
So if we want to press enter there, that won't cause any problems to our calculation. So you can press enter, or you could have extra spaces, and it won't, uh, Tableau will ignore those. So this allows us to format our calculated field in a way that's easy to read. So if it's less than two, then they're going to call it an early shipment. Else if average days to ship is greater than or equal to five, then shipment late. And else if, let's get the rest of them. And average days to ship is not less than two. Greater than two and less than five, then on time. Two words, on time. And now you can see we have an error here. It says expected end to match if, and that means that we don't have an end at the end of our if statement. If statements always have to have an end. Okay, let's hit apply. And let's grab our delay analysis and put it onto color. And it has on time as blue, early shipment as orange, and shipment late as red. We can double click on the color and we can change shipment early to green. And now we can see the best ones, the on time ones, and the ones that stand out as late. And standard class happens late a lot. It's interesting to see that, on average, the District of Columbia has second class as a sh late shipment. You can see that all of these share the same axis size, so they all go from 0 to 6, even though this one never gets that close to 6. If we click Edit Axis, you can choose if you want that to be the case. So it's like right now, all of them use uniform axis range for all rows and columns, and that's really nice because it's easy to compare Colorado to Colorado to Colorado. If you change it to independent axis for each rows, you can see now this one only goes from 0 to not even 1, whereas this one goes from 0 to 6. And you can compare it with color, but you can no longer compare it with size across all of these different categories. So uniform axis range is the default in this case. And we will keep it that way. So now we have a quick analysis of our delays. We're now going to build a waterfall chart based on profit. So we'll call this our profit waterfall. And um, we'll take a look at what a waterfall looks like at the end and talk about how it works. So after we build it, we'll talk about some of the benefits of having a waterfall chart. So what we're going to do is build it over time. For this visualization, we're just going to look at the year of 2014. So I'm going to filter it to the order dates for 2014. And then we're going to take our order date and bring it onto columns. And we're going to look at it by month, but we're going to look at it by our discrete month. So you can see that I chose the one that has month and year. And then when I chose discrete. And then we're going to take profit and put it onto rows. And we're going to change it from profit to our running total of profit. So you can see that it takes January and then it adds February to it. And so it's always getting bigger when we undid it. Sometimes there's up and down. So back to where we have our running total where it will sum January and February for the February mark and then sum January, February, and March for the March mark. If I take profit and put it here, you can see January is negative 3,000 and February is positive 2,000. But here, it's the sum of those, which is negative 467. Take that back off. We're going to change our marks to a Gaunt bar. And now we're going to duplicate profit and edit what we have. We're going to call this negative profit and it's going to be just profit with the negative sign in front. Oh, it looks like I've done this before. So now we have a new name because I added a space at the end. So hit apply and let's um, delete the old one. Okay, 
So now we have our negative profit, just to look at it, it's just minus profit. And we're going to use that to determine the size of the Gaunt bar. So what it does is it takes where the line was and it adds the size of it to be the size of profit. But because the line was at the top and we didn't want to build the profit up, we had to change it to negative profit, so it would build it down. So here, the line was down here because it was so low negative and we added negative profit. And then let's take profit and put it on color. And so you can see where profit is negative, it turns it orange. And where profit is positive, it turns it blue. So what's happening here? What we can do now is we can see our total sales at the end and how we got there. So for the first month, we were at zero when we started and we went down to negative 3,000. The next month, we were at negative 3,000 when we started, and it grew up to be almost back to zero. And then we can see that from there on out, we grew up each month. And you can see how much each month contributed. Our biggest contributors are November and March, November being a little bit bigger. And you can see where we started at the beginning of that month and where we ended. And that's how a waterfall chart works. So it lets you go through over time and see exactly where our problems were and exactly which months helped the most, where we started and where we ended for each month. Next we're going to talk about level of detail calculation and we'll talk about those first by showing an example. So I'm going to bring all my customers on by name and then I'm going to bring on order ID and it's going to add all members but then I'm going to change order ID from a dimension to a measure and we have a count distinct. So now we can see each customer and how many orders they have. So let's sort it and we can see one person has 17 orders and we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 people have 13 orders and it goes on from there. Uh, so what if we wanted to make a visualization that would show how many customers had how many orders and what number of orders was the most popular? We would need to do a level of detail calculation. So let's clear the workbook. A level of detail calculation allows you to build a visualization and bring on metrics that are at a level that is different from what's shown on the visualization. So. In order to do this, we need to create a calculated field that will show us the number of orders per customer, even though we're not going to have our visualization be per customer. So let's call this orders per customer. And we'll come here, and we're going to use a level of detail calculation called fixed. Now there are two other level of detail calculations and they are called include and exclude and you can learn more about those in some of our simply learn classes and if you have any questions please comment below and we can answer them so we're going to do it fixed and you can choose dimensions and it computes an aggregation using only the specified dimensions so it will ignore all the other dimensions, and we're going to have it based on customer name. So we're going to have fixed customer name, and we're going to call get account distinct of order ID. And make sure you close it with your curly bracket, and we have no errors, and we'll hit OK. And this allows us to see number of orders per customer, so let's pull it out. First, let's make it a dimension, and then pull it out onto our columns. And now we can see 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, up to 17. So that means we had some customers just order 1, and some customers order 17, and we had them order everything in between. So if we never had a customer that had 9 orders, then 9 wouldn't appear in this list. Now we're going to take customer ID, or name, Let's do ID because it should be unique. And we'll pull it onto rows. And we're going to change it to a measure. And it's going to be account distinct. And so now we can see 
how many customers ordered how many items. So we have our number of orders per customer, which is at the per customer level, even though this visualization is not at the per customer level. There's nowhere in this visualization where we pull on a customer item as a dimension. So let's sort it, biggest to smallest. And we can see that 134 of our customers ordered five items or had five orders. And so it just five is the most popular, seven is the next most popular, 17 is the least popular, one is relatively unpopular, which is interesting to know. And so you can use this to analyze how many items your customers generally order. And maybe if they have four items, that they are going to order, that perhaps if you made good suggestions, you could get them to go up to five. And that's an introduction to level of detail. So let's name this sheet. Level of detail, LOD, orders per customer. Perfect. Now let's make a new sheet and we are going to do an analysis about new customers. So we'll get, call this level of detail, new customer analysis. So this visualization is going to be about customer acquisition over time. So when we do things over time, we grab our date and pull it up here. And for a line chart or anything over time, we're going to use these so that it makes an axis instead of just change to line instead of dimensions or something that is not continuous. And then we're going to take our customer ID, pull it onto rows, but let's change it to count distinct customer ID. And now we can see our count of customers on every day. I think day is too low of a level. Let's go at month. So now we can see how many customers made an order during what month. Let's take region and split it out by region. When we click on central, we can see central. Now this is including all customers, but say we only wanted to include a customer when they're making their very first order. So we're only going to include their first order, so we need to create a calculated field, and we want to compare, we'll call it new or existing, and we want to compare their order date per customer to their first order date, the min order date. Nope, order date. And we're going to get this error. It says cannot mix aggregate, which is min, and non-aggregate functions. And what it's saying here is that this order date is at a per row level since we don't have any aggregation on it and this order date is at a per visualization level so it's only going to split up based on the visualization and it won't let you put those two things together so we're going to use our level of detail calculation again and we're going to make this fixed per customer ID and then we'll do our min order date so now, instead of trying to return something different based on the visualization, it will always return the min for each customer ID. So if the order date on the visualization is equal to this order date, if the order date on the visualization is equal to the first order date for that customer, then new else existing end so when the order date equals the very first order date that means that it's a new customer making their first order otherwise it's an existing customer because it's no longer their earliest date apply okay and now we can take our new field which is new or existing drag it onto filters and we only want new We'll hit apply, and we can see that we have new customers, but less over time. So, so now we're going to change this count distinct 
to be a running total and we can see over time how our new customers are adding up so it's taking the prior value and adding our new customers and then at the end we get our total customers for each region and we can now make this a more the lowest level which is day and you can see places where it like levels out so we can see we have a lot of new customers and it's increasing but then here for the region of east there kind of is a level spot where we're not getting new orders and that seems to be the same for each of them so for february of 2014 why were we not getting any new orders and how come the west region is getting new customers how come the west region is getting new customers faster here while it's leveling out in the red it looks like the west region leveled out as well but picked up sooner and started getting new customers so this type of analysis will help you view new customers over time and it's only possible because we were able to do a level of detail calculation here on new or existing that would compare this data at only aggregating the data for the specified dimension so we were able to grab their minimum order date here so those are a couple of ways that level of detail calculations can be very helpful. In summary, today we learned about live versus extract Tableau data sources. We learned about joins and unions in the data sources. We also looked at table versus database calculations. We looked at how the different ranks compare. We built some actions into our dashboards, filter actions and highlighting actions. We also looked at URL actions. We built dashboards that used reference lines and ones that used reference bands. We did analyzing of average days to ship and delay analysis. We built a waterfall chart and we also looked into some level of detail calculations. And that brings us to the end of this video tutorial on business intelligence full course. I hope you liked it. If you have any questions, then please feel free to put them in the comment section of the video. We'll be happy to answer them. Thank you and keep learning. Hi there. If you like this video, subscribe to the Simply Learn YouTube channel and click here to watch similar videos. To nerd up and get certified, click here.